Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. Welcome to the first international virtual conference on the Society of Bangladesh, titled Contextualizing Research in Challenging Times. I'm Dipti Rahman, lecturer in English, Daffodil International University. I will be your anchor throughout the conference. We also have Nusratara Oishi, student, MA in TESOL, IML, University of Dhaka, as my co anchor. This month of December is directly related with a lot of Bangladeshis. Bangladesh achieved its victory uh, on this month. This December is even more precious as we are celebrating the 100th birth anniversary of our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. We are delighted to arrange our first international conference at this auspicious time. It is a great achievement for TESOL Society of Bangladesh. And without further ado, now I'd like to request the president of TESOL Society of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman, to deliver his welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman. Uh, thank you, Dipti. I'm a little bit excited and nervous because this is our first international event. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As the president of TISO Society of Bangladesh, I would like to welcome all of you to our launching international virtual conference, Contextualizing Research in Challenging Time. Thank you all for coming and joining us here today. This is uh, the first international virtual conference arranged by the society. And I feel honored that this year, we are also celebrating the 100th birth anniversary of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman. It is also the month of victory for Bangladesh. And today, our achievement is also a victory over many challenges that we had to overcome as an organization. Here, I'd like to take a moment to briefly talk about the journey of TISO. TISO also Society of Bangladesh is a registered equal opportunity platform for ELT professionals, prospective practitioners, researchers, scholars, and enthusiasts from all levels of education, promoting the culture of collaboration, research, and professional support. The local chapter of the Global TISOL community started its journey on the 18th December 2014. From then, the association has been working to build up a community of English language teachers in order to establish a more sustainable professional network across the country and devoted itself to sustainably improve the quality of English education in Bangladesh. The community uh, has grown much bigger and now it has about 3,000 members on its electronic platforms. We are a community of English language teachers from all levels of education who is trying to bring the Bangladeshi ELT professionals and the prospective practitioner of ELT under one roof by establishing a network that encourages diversity and respectful professional discussion among educators by organizing programs with national and international collaboration. The association has a website, YouTube channel, Facebook page, LinkedIn, and is very active on every social media in order to ensure the highest engagement and interaction among its members, the local and the global audience. A newsletter is also published to promote the local research and developmental works and the association contribution to the pedagogical area of the country on a regular interval. The Society of Bangladesh envisages to nurture and flourish as an organization to help TESOL teachers, educators, and the policy maker nationally from each level of primary to tertiary was also being updated and compatible with other TESOL organizations worldwide to contribute globally. Since the onset of pandemic, when the entire world came to a standstill, we took it as an opportunity to help Bangladeshi English language teachers from primary to tertiary level to acquire the indispensable skills for operating in the academia in future. Side by side, we are also collaborating with globally recognized experts in the field to exchange knowledge and implement the best pedagogical practice in the field of ELT in Bangladesh. We have been arranging series 
of webinars, others, virtual workshops and training for building capacity and support among ELT professionals in this distressful time. This conference is the result of culmination of relentless endeavor of the members of the organization. I am delighted that world-renowned ELT expert, Dr. Richard Smith, reader, Center for Applied Linguistics, University of Warwick, and Professor Ravinder Gerges, President Asia Teffel, and the head of the department has joined us as keynote speaker. We have Professor Dr. M.D. Sajjad Hussain, Honorable Member, University Grand Commission of Bangladesh, and the Director, Bangladesh Satellite Company Limited, as the chief guest of the conference. The conference is also graced by the presence of a group of recognized academicians, scholars, and enthusiastic students. Further details of the conference will be provided by our convener of this conference, Dr. Tasneem Akhtar. Thank you all and welcome again. Deep Thank deep. you so much, Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman for your wonderful address. We are honored to have with us Professor Dr. Mohammad Sajjad Hossein, member, University Grant Commission of Bangladesh and director, Bangladesh Satellite Company Limited as our chief guest of the conference. Professor Dr. Mohammad Sajjad Hussain is an honorable member of the University Grant Commission of Bangladesh and Director Bangladesh Satellite Company Limited from 2019. Before this, he taught at different universities in Bangladesh, including University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh and International Islamic University, Chittagong. He did his PhD on electrical and computer engineering from Portland State University, Oregon, United States of America. He is a qualified senior professor, researcher, academic teaching advisor with extensive experience in developing and conducting tertiary courses in quantum computing technology, BLSI design, AI, machine learning, big data, data analytics, digital signal and image processing and more relevant. He is an innovative and driven leader focused on achieving exceptional results in highly competitive environment that demands continuous improvement. He is a person of high integrity and is known for ability to envision and implement with expertise. Now, I would like to cordially invite Professor Dr. Muhammad Sajjad Hussain to del deliver his inaugural speech. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Dr. Muhammad Sajjad Hussain. Thank you for a good introduction. Uh, though it's not for me, uh, I'm a very simple uh, professor from a uh, private sector. Uh, I teach engineering, technology, and science and technology, and I learn. I'm a student of uh, quantum computing. This, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, good day. Uh, I can say it's a good, more, uh, good day and uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to congratulate TESOL, Society of Bangladesh for taking the initiative uh, to arrange a conference titled Contextualizing Research in Challenging Times. The topic of this conference is so befitting uh, to the time we are living in, the time we are passing at the phase of the corona pandemic is indeed challenging. The pandemic transformed our re regular pattern uh, of activity overnight in studios of all types, political, economic, uh, and social, all were forced to rethink the way they operated. The education sector also underwent a drastic shift from physical classes to online teaching. All of these are happening at such rapid speed that many people are still struggling to cope up with it. Uh, actually, uh, I'm a student of quantum computing and uh, the father of the quantum computing, Professor Feynman, uh, uh, delivered his lectures in, in his classes. Usually he says nobody understands quantum mechanics and neither I. I also uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes um, say this word, the corona, unseen, it is uh, unthinkable and ununderstandable. But, Nobody understand this uh, pandemic situation. That is the uh, reality and technology is, I'm a technology guy. So technology is a really different angle, but the main context of this uh, uh, conference is very 
uh, uh, very praiseworthy contextualizing the research, which is very uh, important, uh, which will play an important role for our societies and for our education sector. So it has become crucial more than ever now to collaborate with brilliant minds and understand the changing moods of education and come up with ways to implement the best practices in education. We are undergoing such a reform which will determine the course of our new world. So I already mentioned that it is a new paradigm shift and a shift of understanding, shift of new mindset, shift of uh, technology. So uh, it's, it is uh, unknown and uh, it's really uh, nobody understands, but we have to work on it uh, on this way. So on, the, on one of the things I really appreciate about TISO, Society of Bangladesh, is that they have taken this pandemic as a window of opportunity. This is one of the things I appreciate the organizer. They focused on continuously supporting the teachers in this great time by arranging webinars on online education, skills, training for teachers, research, the changing modes of research and also mental health for coping with this challenging situation. I'm happy to know TISO Society of Bangladesh has been working to build up a community of English language teachers in order to establish a more sustainable professional networks uh, across the country dedicated to the advancement of English language teaching in Bangladesh since its inception. It is also the first of its kind. So the um, I, I, again, I'm uh, looking forward for more conferences in futures. The government of Bangladesh has declared the year 2020-2021 as the Mujib year of the Centennial Bath University of the country's founding leader, father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. He recognized the importance of quality higher education towards building a knowledge-based economy in Bangladesh. A year after his 100th birth anniversary, Bangladesh will celebrate the golden jubilee of independence of, on March 26, 2021. <clears throat> I'm glad to learn the TISO Society of Bangladesh has organized such an important event in Mujib year. Also, this is the month of victory. We are celebrating our uh, victorious uh, celebration a uh, uh, couple of days back, 16 December. But uh, one thing we also celebrated the uh, long aspiring Padda Bridge. We, uh, it is also seen that it is established on this month already uh, uh, last span is established. So altogether, this is a, a breakthrough for Bangladeshi community and Bangladesh. That is a new era, new development, and new, new thinking is coming up. So in, in the context of University Grants Commission has always been focusing on sharing our thoughts on research, emerging sciences and engineering aspects, as well as social sciences. This contributes to the goal of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's technologically enlightened digital Bangladesh vision 2021. I am delighted to be part of this first international conference and I am delighted to know that renowned ELT experts, Dr. Richard Smith from University Warwick, UK and Dr. Raminder Gargesh from the Samarkand State University, Uzbekistan, has joined this conference as the keynote speakers. And also brilliant minds from all over the globe is here today to share their views. As a member of University Grants Commission, I applaud such in initiative. In future, we want more events like this. University Grants Commission will be glad to support such initiatives in the future. Wishing all of you a wonderful and fruitful conference. Again, it's a wonderful time and a very sunny day in Dhaka, but actually we are, we will be very happy to see the uh, conference will take place in physical mode. However, due to the uh, pandemic situation, it is now webinar. We are looking into it in future to have a physical uh, presence, which is undoubtedly the best way to have conference, physical uh, uh, online or technology can only support
to be uh, in different uh, to uh, facilitate for for time being but uh, real world is uh, uh, really we would like to see the conference will be in uh, future in a physical mode thank you all thank you the organizer especially professor saidur rahman who is the president of tso uh, who invited uh, uh, who invited me i am grateful to other professors also organizers and moderator who uh, told about me very uh, bright words though i am a simple professor and other professors renowned person i am very thankful to have delivered my speech uh, i hope you will have a good health and you will save your uh, you will be in safe stay safe Uh, thank you all joy bangla joy bangabandhu long live bangladesh thank you all thank you so much sir for your wonderful speech and uh, it is indeed a month of achievements for us and i wish your wish comes becomes true and we can shortly hold our conference in, in bangladesh and people can join us physically here thank you so much sir and now for delivering the conference speech I am going to call our convener of this conference, who has worked relentlessly for materializing materializing this event today, uh, Dr. Tasneema Akhtar, Associate Professor, Kumilla University, and she will deliver the conference brief. Dr. Tasneema Akhtar, thank you very much, Dipti, for your kind words. Just a few months back, we couldn't even imagine. such a huge crowd online it is the time the context that made it real today so good morning good afternoon good evening as it suits you given the global time zones i am tasnima akhtar it is a great privilege to convene this first international research conference 2020 organized by tsol society of bangladesh ELT practitioners and researchers of a developing country of global south have a very limited access to research resources including international books and journals or even high profile conferences with the hope to create a window to talk to learn and to experience some fundamental as well as specialized research knowledge and practices the plan for this research conference is conceived I'm also pleased to inform you that Kiso Society of Bangladesh is going to introduce its three initial special interest groups soon. And research in a uh, sake is one of them. One of the key objectives is to create and foster a research culture among Bangladeshi ELT practitioners and researchers. We have got a very time-befitting theme for this conference: contextualizing research in difficult times, where the context and time can be anything from pandemic and beyond. I'm very grateful to our chief guest, Professor Dr. Muhammad Sajjad Hussain, UGC member and director of BC, uh, BSCL, for inaugurating our conference. Thank you, sir. On 16 we had a successful pre-conference event now the two day conference features two keynote speakers world renowned ELT experts the first keynote speaker today is Dr Richard Smith University of Warwick and our second keynote speaker is Dr Ravinder Gargesh president elect Asia TEFL the conference offers three plenary sessions of a wonderful lineup of speakers from around the globe two plenary sessions are today and the third one is tomorrow alongside we have a workshop on systematic review today well there is a dedicated round table discussion session on the conference theme tomorrow apart from all these scholarly talks one of the key attractions of our conference is a 5 minute tso quick fire presentation competition it will showcase three phd thesis presentations and three ma dissertation presentations selected based on their synopsis submissions earlier in this exciting competition tomorrow 
one from each group will receive the best presenter award. I'm not going to tell you what's that, the secret for tomorrow. I'm very much hope the conference provides a forum for ELT practitioners and researchers to exchange cutting edge research ideas as well as examine the nexus between research and education. My tremendous gratitude to all who agreed to help us by sharing their scholarly works and ideas and all who agreed to join us to make the conference happen and successful. Here is to acknowledge that the conference is planned in a short time. So there, uh, if there is anything wrong, your kind cooperation and con constructive feedback will be highly appreciated. I hope you enjoy your participation and the conference be a useful one as we go together. Thank you very much. Happy Victory Month to all Bangladeshis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tasnima Akhtar, for providing our detailed guidelines about today's conference. We will now begin our conference with the keynote session on research for super difficult circumstances, where to start and how to go on. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Richard Smith, and the keynote session will be moderated by Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman, University of Dhaka. My, my. Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman, sir. Unmute yourself. Sir, you need to unmute your mic. I'm doing it. Sir, unmute. Sir, your mic is still muted. Is it okay now? Okay now. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me welcome uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Smith. Uh, Richard Smith studied for his PhD with APR Howard in Edinburgh and is known for his historical research within applied linguistics. 12 years ago, he set up the unique ELT archive at the University of Warwick, where he has been teaching for the last 20 years. And he founded and is joint coordinator of the International Association of Applied Linguistics Research Network on the history of language learning and teaching. Apart from his pioneering historical research, he is equally known for his innovative work in the field of learner autonomy, teaching English in difficult circumstances and teacher research. In his today's talk, he will be referring to his experience working with teachers in South Asia, and Latin America and the approaches he has developed with them, namely an enhancement approach and exploratory action research as ways for teachers to address difficulties in their classroom situation. Uh, Richard Smith will be delivering a one hour keynote speech, will be taking question and answer session after his speech. Let me again welcome Professor uh, Dr. Richard Smith Reader Center for Applied Linguistics, University of Warwick, UK. Over to Richard. Thank you very much, to Dr. Rahman, and um, welcome, uh, everybody. H hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. And um, thank you very much indeed to TESOL Society of Bangladesh for inviting me. It's a great honor to to be um, starting your, your conference, your first virtual conference. On, and um, I'd like to congratulate the, uh, the TESOL Society of Bangladesh on your recent um, official recognition. And um, I, uh, I think that the TESOL Society of Bangladesh, I'd just like to begin with a, a few words about the context for my, my talk before I get into it. Um, I, I understand that the TESOL Society of Bangladesh is a relatively new um, association, which brings together teachers, ELT professionals uh, of other kinds, and um, researchers at university. And this is very good news that I've just heard from Dr. Akhtar, um, whom, whom I also thank for, for the invitation, um, and also for the great organization, I think, so far of your, of your conference. It's been really well, well organized, everything. Um, and um, she, she just said that, um, Dr. Akhtar just said that you're going to have some special interest groups, 
within the Tesla Society of Bangladesh and mentioned the research special interest group. This is very, this is music to my ears because um, for about four years, I was the coordinator of the IATFL um, uh, research special interest group. So it's very nice to hear that. And it, I'm sure that I'm still on the committee actually as the publications officer. So we can, I'm sure we can make some good um, links and a good relationship and discuss together um, from association to association what the function of such a special interest group might be. And as coordinator myself, I, I was often thinking about this issue. It seemed to me, seemed to me that within a teacher, so within an association which is mainly um, focusing on, on practice, on TESOL professionals and, and practitioners, um, something where we are, we are, of course, reading research that has been done by academics, uh, but it's with a special focus on research which seems to be relevant to practitioners, because we must say that there is a lot of research which seems very far from the concerns of practitioners themselves, and there is a recognised gap, and some, some people call it a dysfunctional gap between the kind of research that academics may do and the, sort, the sorts of concerns that teachers may have in the classroom. So we need to think, and I, I want to think today, about what sorts of research might be of particular relevance to practitioners. But also, um, strongly, I started to think as the coordinator that we need to support teachers themselves to engage in research, not only to engage with research, but to actually um, develop their own abilities to investigate their, their classrooms. And I've, I've worked on in this area uh, more and more since about um, 2011, when I became the coordinator of the research thing. So I believe that this might be a, partic a possible role for your, for your SIG as well. Um, but I'm, I'm going to share today some ideas based on my own experience of my own engagements with research and particularly research um, with teachers in uh, developing countries and um, research that is, I think, you know, relevant to the concerns of teachers in those, in those contexts. So hopefully it's going to be interesting for you as, as ELT professionals in Bangladesh. Which brings me to, um, to Bangladesh and the way that I was going to be coming to Bangladesh back in March as a keynote, keynote speaker at the Belter conference. And um, it's quite nice in a way that I can be here with you today, um, although it's not Belter, it's, it's a sister organization. I know you have good relations together um, because the conference had to be postponed and that was right at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, this terrible pandemic, when they actually the numbers of cases of COVID were very low in Bangladesh. There were only three at, at that time, and um, there are, it was numbers in their hundreds in in the UK. And of course, today there are maybe a thousand five hundred cases. Yesterday, I think in Bangladesh there are over um, twenty five thousand cases in the UK. So we we still haven't um, we definitely haven't come to the end of this crisis. Although there is, there is hope, I, we are hope, hoping about the vaccine, vaccine for, as we come to the end of this year, for next year, of course. But we have to recognise this is the context for the conference and um, that um, it's a, these, have been, these have been very challenging times. And this is, in, this is in the title of your conference. So in the title of your conference is um, contextualising research. So, um, and I'm going to hope, hopefully address that issue of what that might mean. Also in the title is the, the issue of challenging times. And of course, we're thinking of the pandemic and challenge, challenges for educators. But also, I think, um, I think Dr. Hossein mentioned just now opportunities or achievements. So I'd like to focus also on the positives that have come out of this, this crisis. My previous visit to Bangladesh um, was 20 years ago. The only time I have visited your country 20 years ago, and I was invited to the University of Taka. And I had great uh, uh, discussions with people like Dr. Fakhrul Alam um, and his colleagues at the university there. And I just wanted to, as uh, Dr. Rahman mentioned, I'm, I have a strong interest in the history of language teaching, and I don't intend to give a lecture about the history of language teaching. But I just wanted to mention that it was a great um, opportunity for me to find out a bit more about somebody who's very important in the history of English language teaching, and that is um, Dr. Michael West. And Michael West was um, a British uh, colonial educator. Of course, it was in the time of the British British Empire. Uh, but I think he 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 was not an he was not an arrogant man. I think he he worked very cl closely with 
Bang um, Bengali edu educators, and it's, I, still, I think was is still respected in in Bengal Bangladesh. Um, in fact, this is what I found in my last visit, in my visit twenty years ago. From the, I visited the teacher training college TTC, and I was helped very much with by um, Tasmina Ahmad and um, um, uh, and Shahela Hamid and Fakrul himself, who gave me an introduction. And I, I, I had the great pleasure of talking with um, um, Dr. F uh, Muhammad Fadus Khan, who was the director of public instruction in Bangladesh, and Dr. Muhammad Nur, um, Nurul Haq, who was the former principal of the teacher training college. And I managed to, they gave me a copy of this, um, which was the 60th anniversary, 1969. So I was able to find out a bit more about Michael West and um, read his, uh, his own um, message on that occasion. And um, I just wanted to read the last part of it. He, he, was, he was very much engaged in experimentation with um, writing materials, making materials which he felt would meet the needs of, uh, of students and of teachers in the, Bang Bangladesh, the, the Bang Bengal context. For example, um, he said, we made a book for teaching the reading of Bengali by building up the letters, as he had done in, in as he had done in books that he was producing for for English language learning, which later became uh, well known across the world as the new method readers. And this was an approach that he developed in uh, in Bengal, thinking that um, actually for children who are maybe going to have to leave school after one or two years and withdraw from school it would be much more appropriate to focus on their reading abilities than teaching them to speak English. Because if they could learn to read, they could then perhaps go on to learn for themselves after leaving school. Um, and he had a strong, strong a sort of um, contextually oriented approach in his way of thinking about the difficult circumstances which he saw in the schools where students would often have to leave school after one or two years to be withdrawn from school by their parents to go and work. He, he also saw that it was important um, to teach pupils to read Sanskrit without the burden of too much grammar. And there was a course for primary schools he was experimenting with, which would enable one class to be occupied in learning while the teacher taught the other class, because in most primary schools at that time, this was in the 1920s uh, and 30s, the teacher had to deal with two classes um, simultaneously so he was very much um, somebody who was oriented towards the the difficult circumstances of teaching in primary schools and secondary schools um, as, a, as a teacher educator. And this is what I want to talk about today. The phrase difficult circumstances was his phrase. He wrote a book in 1960, many years after he left Bengal, um, called Teaching English in Difficult Circumstances. So this is where the my title comes from today. Um, and his last words, his, his message, I mean, this, I, I have a picture of him here when he was, um, which was given to me by his son um, in his retirement. So he died in about 1973 uh, with his roses in his garden. And um, his last words to the teacher tra training college in Taka was, um, if there is a message which I would like to leave with you, it is that you should keep on experimenting and that a school is a place in which the pupils learn and the greatest handicap to learning is an excess of teaching and i find that very moving um, message in the sense of a message to teachers and to teacher educators that you are um, change or innovation transformation is in your hands it's a place that you can experiment uh, the classroom is a place that you can experiment in of course, now we we are thinking not of classrooms, but maybe um, other contexts as well. But also that um, this message of being very learner-centered, before we started to talk about being learner-centered, I'd just like to first, firstly just share um, something with you where you might like to go if you'd like to find out more about Michael West. Um, we have, um, as Dr. Rahman mentioned, a, I've developed an archive of materials at my university, Warwick, were um, based on um, the contributions of, of some figures from the past, especially in the mainstream of UK, UK ELT, which of course may be very different from the history of uh, teaching in Bangladesh. But at least uh, Michael West has a very strong connection with, with, with Bangladesh. 
As I said, he was the director of TTC from 1920 to 1933. You can find out more about his life if you'd like to here and um, some of his works, but well-known works like bilingualism. These, uh, these readers he produced for Longmans. This was actually the, beginning, the beginnings, really, for Longmans, now Pearson, of their global exports of, of materials, of textbooks, back in the 30s. Um, but it's interesting that he developed these books originally for, for Bangladesh. And um, the book, finally here, down at the bottom, which I'm going to be referring to quite a lot today, called Teaching English in Difficult Circumstances, which he produced in 1960. Because in 1960 he realised that in the UK there wasn't enough consideration of the problems, the kind of problems that were faced by the teachers that he'd been working with. There's, there's far too much consideration of just language teaching in small classrooms in British language schools and uh, not enough about the problems faced by teachers, not enough research about the problems faced by teachers in large, relatively large classes in secondary schools, in, in um, public education um, around the world. That's just finally to share with you here. Um, there are some... Uh, um, so this is the archive uh, that, that Dr. Rahman was mentioning, and we have uh, information about many figures from the past of, of, uh, of ELT including um, Michael West. So um, I wanted to just introduce Michael West to you because I'm going to be referring to his work and quoting from his work. Um, so I was, I was looking forward to doing a bit more research and visiting the TTC again uh, this uh, in March, but unfortunately couldn't make it. But I am hoping that I can make it again to Bangladesh. As Dr. Hussain said, it's much, much more ideal if we can actually meet together. Anyway, I'd like to... Um, express my hope that we can collaborate um, with um, together the TESOL Society of Bangladesh into the future and that I can see you in, in Bangladesh or, um, hopefully one of these days. So I'm going to share my PowerPoints, my talk uh, PowerPoints today. This is my title, Research for Super Difficult Circumstances, Where to Start and How to Go On. Um, so I, that was my prologue. Um, now, this is my plan for today. So, um, um, we, this conf conference title, Contextualizing uh, Research in Challenging Times, I want to reflect a little bit on what that might mean, what contextualized TESOL research might mean from my perspective of the kinds of things that I've been involved with over the years. And I'm going to refer, refer specifically to um, what I call difficult, well, what Michael West called difficult circumstances and define that from Michael West's perspective, but also think about the time we are in now, which we might think of as super, diff super difficult circumstances. Mainly, I hope to share with you some possible ways forward for yourselves as practitioners, as researchers, uh, based on work that I've been doing in countries like uh, India and Nepal. Um, so contextualized T-cell research, um, what, to, what, what might we mean by that? As I said, not all research in the field of applied linguistics is particularly relevant, perhaps, to practitioners, particularly practitioners in large classes in difficult circumstances. Um, I was involved with the British Council uh, a few years ago in trying to map what kind of research was going on in British universities, uh, not just universities, but in language schools and testing agencies in relation to ELT. The British Council itself was concerned that a lot of research wasn't necessarily relevant to practitioners. But they wanted to see actually what kind of research was, was going on. So over, over some, some years, so over some years, I, could we mute maybe that participant, sorry. After some years, we, um, uh, over a period of some years, we looked into this and made directories of the kinds of research that were going on. And we found actually more, perhaps, relevant research than we expected. We defined research as in this way. I think it's important just to begin with a simple definition of research. This is how we, re how we defined it for that investigation. Um, and we defined ELT or, or TESOL research as any research whose data or findings relate directly to the teaching, learning or assessment of English as a foreign second or additional language. So this excluded quite a lot of applied linguistic research, 
but we discovered there was more going on than we we expected actually but very little in the uk anyway um about um about classrooms in the global south and very little about in general about primary teaching or about secondary teaching there was far more research going on about university level teaching but specifically and particularly about university teaching in in britain itself so there's a kind of gap that we identified and also there was rather little research being done by practitioners themselves or in collaboration with teachers themselves um i then at the british council invited me to do something similar in india and over over a period of 3 years i was very happy to collaborate with um with colleagues at the efl university in hyderabad uh in doing a kind of survey of elt research in india we kind of found that um in some ways it was it was similar that there wasn't perhaps enough research going on and this is this was not just my perception this was the perception of those colleagues indian colleagues themselves perhaps not enough research which was addressing the concerns of practitioners and certainly relatively little research being done by practitioners or or with practitioners themselves so this leads into um suggestions in india that we develop research and the british council has taken a lead in in doing that it's got certain programs to encourage practitioner research for example which i was happy to be involved with there's something called the action research and, and mentoring scheme and also to encourage um relevant research by university academics and that's still going on but um but amul padwad who who i was happy to collaborate with who is the secretary of the inet association i'm sure a good potential partner for tsol society of bangladesh um amul said this very recently in a in a review he wrote for the elt journal about a book of research uh, by indian researchers saying that um that still predominantly he sees um um research as research by by indian researchers as adopting too much a western frame of thinking with little effort to develop indigenous rep- approaches and frameworks so we're thinking well we need to contextualize research not only in the focus on the needs of practitioners but um in a particular context but also the way that we conceptualize what's what's important or what kind of theoretical frameworks we we use so i have some propositions for you which are of course debatable propositions and just like with Mar- michael west you um have to uh, i suggest take a critical perspective um on my own my words my perspective as somebody who has only visited bangladesh once i'm sure that you will take a critical perspective uh, a way of uh, thinking about this from your own perspective whether it is uh, whether it rings true or not just as with michael west we we need to of course always situate his work but in the fact that he was a um, a colonialist a, a colonial educator employed within the colonial education system however much i think he was um attuned attuned and interested in the needs of teachers locally but this is what i think these are my beliefs and i'm stating these as my own um perspectives that um in research we need to get away from a kind of applicationism which does exist in the field of applied linguistics where researchers may say to teachers this is what uh research shows and so therefore this is how you should be teaching this there has been this tradition of of applied linguistics of what henry widdison has called uh, linguistics applied where just because some research um has been done by academics and it's theoretically seems to be um uh well founded that they then say that teachers should be should be teaching in a particular way i think we need to get away from that sort of applicationism away from universalist top down solutions i won't go into this more because but there is a whole um critical turn within the field of tsol and elt over the last uh, 30 years um you know with people like robert philipson writing linguistic imperialism or alistair pennycook's books um where um and then therefore um writers like uh, kumara valdivelu for example and his post method pedagogy moving away from uh global uh, universalist top down solutions towards a more uh, more of a focus on uh on context in in fact 
and a proposition that TESOL research should be useful in addressing problems faced by teachers and learners in a particular context. So when we think about contextualizing research, perhaps we should bear these, po these points in mind, at least I think so. Um, contextualizing research might mean that we, there, are needs for, there are needs for practical research. And this is the sort of research which I've been involved with um, myself, which involves identifying, understanding and sharing um, teachers' own practices. Because I think there's a big gap, a big need for us to look at what teachers actually do in classrooms, in particular practices which they themselves and which others in the context, including students and parents, feel are successful. Rather than going from theory into practice, from practice, we can theorize from practice. There's a big um, gap here, I think. Um, and problems and possible, so looking at problems that teachers say they have and possible solutions that perhaps they can develop themselves um, together with academics. Um, so contextualized research for me would be that we emphasize strongly that research, the the questions for research, the the goals of research are coming out of a particular context and then are going to feed back into uh, that context and maybe similar contexts, contextualizing research. Just finally on this, this first point about contextualizing research, we need to think who researches. We, don't, we shouldn't assume it's just academics, university academics. And I think your association, your society is bringing together practitioners and researchers. And ideally it's also it's practitioners are involved uh, maybe in doing the research together with university teachers or um, also one form of research we, I'd like us to think about is practitioner inquiry. It's a systematic intentional study by educators themselves of their own professional practices. That, that is going to contextualize research in a very good way, especially if we believe that it's only teachers who can really be the experts about their own situations. So the second part of the uh, title of, of the conference is Challenging Times, and my title is Super Difficult Circumstances. Let's go back to Michael West and this book uh, he, he wrote in 1960. He defined difficult circumstances or unfavorable circumstances as um, this. And I believe that we still may have this kind of situation. Well, I know we have this kind of situation in many countries around the world. But he felt that this was being neglected uh, in 1960 the needs of such teachers, and we can still say, I think, in 2020, that the needs of such teachers uh, of in such situations are not necessarily being very well addressed by research. In 1960, he said, the problem has lately become worse um, because of rapid spread of education, uh, too rapid for um, the supply of buildings and teachers to catch up with the number of pupils and owing to the spread of education over a larger proportion of the population. So classes were becoming larger and larger in terms of numbers with not enough facilities. And um, it's quite ironic in a sense that I think the same thing has been happening in the first two decades of, of this century, um, par paradoxically because of success in meeting the development goals, the um, United Nations goals, one, one of which was to bring more children into primary education, but the pace of change has been, uh, the numbers have been increasing so much without a similar uh, uh, amount of training. So large classes have actually been increasing over those years, class size. Of course, difficult circumstances doesn't just mean large classes, but that is one aspect. And uh, with um, Amal Padward and my, my student and colleague, uh, Jason Anderson, we recently tried to define what difficult circumstances might mean, not just large classes, but um, a lack of basic resources, um, low school readiness of learners, um, inadequate pre-service and in-service training, excessive workload. And I'm sure many of you may be nodding your heads, thinking, yes, this, this, this corresponds to a reality that I face as a teacher. Um, we could think of alternative labels. I think um, difficult circumstances maybe is not ideal as a as a as a title for this field of research, because um, it seems to make these situ this, these situations um, seem abnormal. Or as somebody told me, 
pathologize this situation, make it seem like a uh, something wrong, whereas in fact it's normal, as I'll say later. These are normal circumstances for most teachers in the world. But um, there isn't an ideal label, but we could think of teaching in low-resource classrooms, teaching in large classes, teaching in challenging contexts, that's what you've chosen for the title of your conference. Or what I like to think is a more objective uh, way of writing, teaching in public education systems in relatively low-income countries. The point here I'm trying to make is that these are normal circumstances in most in around the world for most teachers in the world, but they have been neglected, and I could say dysfunctionally neglected, in the research that gets published in journals. So it's basically classrooms like these, and these are just different countries in South Asia. So the problem, uh, as I see it, is that the majority of English teachers worldwide work in what we might call difficult circumstances. And these are normal circumstances in global, global ELT. But they've tended, and they still tend to be dysfunctionally neglected in um, mainstream language teaching discourse and research. And there are unfilled needs for developing appropriate methodology, post-method approaches for teaching in difficult circumstances with research in a supporting role. And um, I'd like to show that um, some things I've been involved with in, well, I haven't been, I wasn't involved with this one, but in the UK, um, there was a project to investigate large classes back in the late 80s, based on questionnaires. And we, I revived this uh, network idea with Fawzi Shamim from Pakistan in 2008. And we developed a kind of network devoting ourselves to this, these issues, to this kind of research. I'm going to hurry up a little bit because I think I'm going to run out of time. Um, but these are places that you could go to see some of the research that we've done since 2008 for teachers in, in difficult circumstances. Although the network is called Teaching in Large Classes, it's not only about that, it's about um, teaching in difficult circumstances generally. We have certain principles within Telknet um, to leave behind small class teaching as norm and teaching difficult circumstances as problem, and to start instead, start with descriptions of practice, in particular good practice, as perceived by participants. I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that these might be principles that you might like to consider if you are thinking what to research and um, who to research with or who to support to research. These are, I think, um, needs that still exist that we need to focus on issues which are uh, of practical concern to teachers themselves. And by involving teachers, by asking teachers what's of concern for them, and we can get away from just quantitative uh, questionnaires to look at case studies and narrative approaches. So these were things I suggested back in 2011. I think now, uh, of course, many of us are not teaching in classrooms, but we could still say, well, let's leave behind the idea that using technology is the norm, because in for many teachers in the Global South, the issues of connectivity are very, very uh, large. So we, we mustn't think, oh, everybody is teaching online, because it's not the case. Uh, that's these days. And we want to, in Telknet, contribute to teacher education, teacher training, and build on the experiences that teachers bring and the experiences that they can share. Um, I believe that you're making a recording of, of the talk. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to put the references and the links, as I mentioned, onto a website which um, maybe you could share together with the uh, the recording. At least I could, we could we could get make the resources available to everybody who is at the conference. Um, so um, I'm going to go a little bit quickly. But nowadays, what do we face now? Um, in in Western countries, in developed countries, so-called developed countries, um, people have started to ask me to give talks for them about difficult circumstances because they're starting to think that they are teaching in difficult circumstances. So that there is a picture of a teacher in a maybe a UK UK classroom with his uh, his Zoom and uh, his mask on. And so maybe emergency remote teaching is a kind of difficult circumstance. Well, in that case, though, the teachers I was talking about are teaching in super difficult circumstances because there are issues of uh, connectivity. This is just a, a picture that symbolizes that for me. A, a student in India sitting on the roof in order to get connection with her, with the, the network. 
And of course, we know also there are many, many children who don't have a mobile phone at home or don't have access to a mobile phone because their parents need it or they don't have connect connectivity. So um, I want to borrow the word um, super difficult circumstances from uh, my friend and colleague Prem Payak in Nepal, who is now at the University of Hong Kong, at the um, Institute of Education in Hong Kong. Because when the earthquake hit in Bangla in um, in Nepal in uh, I think 2015, um, this is what happened with children who already teachers who are already teaching difficult circumstances, having to cope with situations, and in different ways being very resourceful to cope, just as we have seen teachers these days coping very resourcefully. So, as Prem said in a special issue of a, a, a journal that he brought out. Um, he, the teacher's res responses to the earthquake, which she called um, teaching in super difficult circumstances, um, it, the, the teachers themselves were creating a kind of pedagogy of disaster to help their students recover from the traumatic experience that they had been facing. And he started to document what teachers had been doing. I think I have about 10 minutes left. Is that okay, Dr. Rahman? Ten minutes, okay. Yes, ten minutes. So, based on this idea that actually teachers in Bangladesh who have been teaching in large classes, teaching in with low resource context, with maybe not enough resources, not enough materials, for example, may now find themselves in super difficult circumstances. So, I'd like to. Um, what I'm going to do is um, talk about work that I've been doing uh, with teachers in those difficult circumstances, and just reflect on whether how that might take us forward nowadays in the current situation. Um, and the first area I'd like to highlight is this area of identifying, understanding and sharing successful practice, which I've been calling an, enhan an enhancement approach. The other ones were we may not have time for, but um, we'll see. So um, one thing I've been doing is, um, is interviewing some very remarkable teachers like Zakia Sawa in Pakistan and in large classes and seeing what they have been doing. And, um, people also like Harry Kucha in um, in Cameroon before he became famous as now the, 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 the president of IATF. Well, he was a teacher in a very large class of 200 children and we've written about this together. Basically, both both Zakia and, um, and uh, Harry discovered that the only way they could cope was to take the students into groups, put the students into groups and have a kind of project-oriented pedagogy, uh, which we've, we've written about as a kind of pedagogy of autonomy as a rescue strategy for difficult circumstances based on their experiences. As I said, I'll share these references later. This just goes back to Michael West saying, a language is learnt rather than taught, and too much teaching can be an obstacle to, to, to learning. And Michael West, in fact, said, the larger the class and the more difficult the circumstances, the more important it is to stress learning as the objective. And the higher the dropout, the more necessary it is to do so. If a pupil has learned how to learn, he or she can go on learning afterwards. And it struck me recently that how, how true this is, and that if, um, if teachers had been engaging in trying to develop their students' ability to learn for themselves, how much in, in a better situation we would be now in the pandemic, where we could rely more on the students' abilities, because we, we see now how important it is that students have this, have this ability. Michael West also said um, that was they are quite remarkable teachers, um, Harry and, and Zakia, but we also need to look just at ordinary teachers, try and identify and understand and share their practices. Michael West said, we have to find I'll let you read this yourselves. We have to find not the best that can be done, but what can best be done. And I think this is very neglected as an area of research. Simply um, finding out what teachers, what good teachers, as defined by their colleagues, by their students, are doing. Not necessarily following the most fashionable methods, but seeing what they can do and then sharing, understanding it and sharing with other teachers. I've been engaged in this kind of activity as workshops in workshops. Something that you could do maybe within the association as well, within the TESOL Society of Bangladesh. Um, and 
um, as a workshop activity. Particularly important recently you know, to think of all those achievements that we have gained, that teachers have succeeded resourcefully in, in, in coping with their situations. Um, this is it can be done as a workshop activity, sharing stories, telling stories. In fact, we did that, and we shared these stories online uh, on a British Council website as video and as a book. And uh, this came out of a workshop I did with Amal Padwad in Nepal. We tried to do something out of uh, crisis with Prem Payak, and I wish that we had done more. Um, I wish that we had done more around this. Um, but we did start to develop some activities based on stories like Chetan Kumar Timilisena's experience of earthquake. And we were thinking we could use these materials in teacher training to prepare teachers for crisis in case, in case it happens. I wish that we had actually done more of that. It might have been more uh, useful for this current situation. So we haven't done everything that we wanted to do, but at least there are some indications here of, of possible ways forward. I'd suggest that documenting teaching in, in pandemic circumstances could be something that you might consider as a research activity. And uh, as a starting point within the TELC network, we did, do have, we did have discussions with teachers and um, we documented those discussions. This was right at the beginning in April and May. Um, but these are things that, that can definitely be built on. Another area I've been work working in quite a lot is the area of practitioner research. And um, starting with teacher, teacher associations doing research. Again, I wrote about this with, with Harry Kucha. Um, we, with Kamelta in Cameroon, at the conference, we asked all the teachers there, perhaps this is something um, a research thing could do within the TESOL Society of Bangladesh. We, we At the conference itself, we asked the participants, what questions would you like research to answer? We gathered many, many questions. For example, these questions, and these reflected those teachers' own priorities. These are all very important questions, which, um, met, which are not necessarily addressed by academics, but which should be. These come from teachers' own perspectives. Multi-grade classes are very important for teachers, where you have students of different ages in one classroom. I believe it might be true in some cases in Bangladesh. It's certainly true in some parts of India and Nepal. And um, that might be an interesting question to answer, to ask oneself. So it's quite a simple thing that a, a teacher association can, can do, is to ask its members, what questions do you think should be researched? It's rather like what's called participatory research, getting teachers involved from the very beginning. Um, with the research SIG in Kamelta also uh, just distributed a very simple questionnaire with three questions. And these were the three questions, and this can be this can be replicated in many contexts. So that the teacher association gains a big data bank really of from teachers, from them from their members, of priorities and um, uh, and of, of solutions, of possible successes which can be shared with other teachers. This, since 2013, Kamelta Research has been working with just with these questions and with these uh, stories. There's a lot that can be done with them. But we also need to move beyond problems and um, working with teachers who themselves, who can research their practice themselves. Um, here is Miriam, for example, from Pakistan. Uh, we've helped teachers like Miriam to turn problems into questions. It's quite a powerful thing to try to do to mentor teachers to turn problems into questions. And that's a starting point for research. It's a starting point for asking other colleagues for answers to questions in a workshop activity, for example. You can, you can put the questions on the wall and have other teachers come and say, I can find us, I have a solution for that issue. You can share findings in a workshop. Uh, again, in this book, um, we, 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 sh we share little stories about that. But also, um, um, with teachers, you, we can um, consider action research. That's probably what I want to end up with today, just briefly saying that um, action research by teachers is um, something maybe a teacher association can encourage teachers to do, can mentor teachers to do. These are teachers in Chile. It was the starting point for 
a uh, exercise of fi again finding out what what questions are important for teachers themselves. Again, that would have been a really important question. Um, this was back in two thousand and thirteen, but if we had if we'd done more, maybe in this area, if there'd been more research in this area, maybe teachers would be coping better with this very important issue of involving parents in the English learning of their children nowadays. So I wanted to highlight that uh, Rama Matthew, of course, with the English in Action project that um, um, Beth Erling will talk about later, I think, um, has brought out a book of teachers' uh, action research projects, Rama Matthew from India. Uh, with, with teachers in Chile and India and Nepal, I've been developing a, an approach I call exploratory action research. So today I don't have time to talk a lot about this, but it involves exploring the situation carefully before you engage in a lot of action research. And um, moving from how can I to exploratory questions, exploring a situation for it like this, like my students speak in English only to me, but not to each other. Um, ex um, helping teachers to come up with questions which are going to help them to understand a situation better before they jump into actions which may or may not be appropriate. And we've, we've, we've engaged in this quite successfully with teachers in India and in Nepal. Uh, a teacher here, for example, in Nepal, Shiva, um, who found that the students were being noisy. And just by exploring the situation more, she found that it was actually the students sitting at the windows who were looking out of the windows. And um, she hadn't realised that before. And she managed to solve the situation then because she understood it better by moving closer to those students and by giving them extra work, basically. So these are two places that you could go to um, to find out more. And as I said, I will share these share these links. Uh, this is the area of teacher research. I'd also share that if you are interested in this, there is um, something going to happen which is very useful for teachers, very free, written, run by TESOL um, from January to February. And I'll share, the, I'll share the link uh, with you all for that as well. So um, also there is a book here that's come out recently that I produced for the British Council based on our project in India. Uh, hopefully a very simple, easy to understand book for you if you are interested in mentoring teachers to research their classrooms. Because I just wanted to end by saying that that is um, um, what I see as a very promising way forward in terms of contextualising research, that teachers themselves become engaged in researching their classrooms. And um, I believe it's still it's still valid and important in these challenging times. Research itself, the, the kind of research that we are advocating, is um, hopefully a kind of teacher-friendly form of action research through this process of exploring gradually first. And um, what I've been trying to say is that um, uh, I've been trying to address the conference team theme by talking about what contextualized research might involve and that it, it involves um, helping teachers in difficult, now in super difficult circumstances, research which is coming out of their concerns, which is then feeding back into their practice and um, that we can do this by, for example, identifying cases of successful practice, but also by, um, by gaining teachers' own perceptions of the issues that they're facing, but by then by engaging teachers in a process of finding out from other teachers uh, what they might do. That's actually uh, uh, 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, I think. Um, so um, probably quite good timing, I hope, to end with this. So I've, I hope I've shared some possible, at least starting points, so that kind of, if you like, a frame of thought, a frame of thinking about what contextualizing research might mean. Um, and some ways forward, which obviously these are just starting points. Um, so I hope that's been uh, useful for you for the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard, uh, for your such a wonderful and informative session. Research for super difficult circumstances and where to stand and how to go on. Uh, I personally liked uh, when you mentioned about Michael West. This book was so useful during my PhD, and Professor Hamid Rahman also mentioned about that. Uh, you also highlighted the gap where some of the uh, our attendant and the participants were asking about the, the, the gap that you are talking about, research by the practitioners. So one question that I can see from 
uh, in that how the secondary teacher can engage themselves in research. So uh, we'll take the question from the participants and I'll request participants to unmute and ask the question. Imdad, can you um, please ask your question? Yes. Um, hello, hello, Richards. Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, yes, I'm also in search of good bandwidth, actually. So, uh, okay. So my question is to you that uh, how can we, I'm a secondary level uh, school teacher, so how can uh, we get involved in research work? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you for your question, uh, um, MW. Thank you. Um, and, uh, it looks like you're in a great place there, uh, outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice, nice, nice view. Uh, but I, I, so I didn't really manage to share with you today how a teacher can become engaged in in teacher research, but. I, what I can share with you, and I can put into the chat box as well, are some resources which I hope will help you, because they're just what there simply isn't really time in in a forty minute talk to um, to show. Uh, I would have to focus just on that, and I I wanted to focus on more things today, but I think if you look at if you wanted to see how it is possible, uh, I'd recommend going to these play these two books which are freely available. The first book on the left is a book of stories of teachers from Chile in Latin America uh, who um, we have helped to... These are, these are teachers who are very busy, just like yourself, I, I'm sure, have many classes. They have up to, up to 40 hours of classes, not real hours, but 45-minute classes every week. And they often have to move from school to school. And they have classes of 40 students or more. How many, te how many students do you teach yourself? Uh, 130 per class. Yeah, so this is what um, Michael West would call difficult, difficult circumstances. So we did, we did try to develop an approach which would be suitable for teachers like you, um, which would be helpful for teachers like you. Um, for example, I, I'm sure you have many, many problems in your situation uh, which and we know that there are many problems. Like, what what would you say is a major problem for you? To manage uh, the whole class and to uh, get feedback uh, from each and every students is yeah. the uh, most challenging thing for me. Yeah. So this is within within the Telknet uh, group that I mentioned. Um, we have we have some ideas for how to do that. Um, some solutions from other teachers. So that's another place maybe I could recommend that you go just just for just for some possible solutions. It was right at the right near the beginning here, um, and I, I will share the link with you. I think it, again. Um, okay. But um, so this place, the Telkner website. Um, just one second. Yeah. Um, so this one. So this one on the top, at the top, you might find uh, quite useful um, for finding solutions. However, your cl your classroom is your classroom. Your classroom is different from other people's classrooms. So when we talk about contextualizing research, that's the, what we mean, that your classroom and your students are, are different from other teachers. So even if you find some good ideas here, <clears throat> um, it's probably best for you to do it yourself, just like that teacher I showed later, the, the one in Nepal. Now she was also very busy, she had a very large class. And let me explain very briefly, because I think it's a very important question, I, I didn't have enough time to to explain it. She, so you can you can look at the stories there, um, this is from Latin America. I'll also send a link from, of stories from Nepal, so you can have an idea. They're very simple research. Um, she she, at first, she thought, what's my main problem? So you have to narrow down to one problem. So you say, you can't get, uh, you can't get an idea from students how they are feeling, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. <coughs> so she turns that into a question. <clears throat> That's a problem. I can't get enough feedback. Turn it into a question. Okay, how can I get more feedback from students? That's the first step. Focus on one thing. That's 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 the first step. Second step is turn pro one problem that problem into a question. How can I get more feedback? 
before you try to solve the problem, try to explore the current situation. So, um, um, let's say, for example, uh, we could help to think, um, uh, we, maybe we could say, well, I could go and ask other teachers, for example, uh, to find, to find, to explore that more. Or, well, maybe I can just ask the students uh, what they think about this problem. And so I'm, and then we think, well, what method might we use? Um, and simple methods, not, not methods which are going to create a lot more work for you. So not, I would recommend not making a big questionnaire because that takes a lot of time. Instead of that, I'd recommend just go and chat to five teachers, ask them your question, see what they say. How can I, what do other teachers think I can do? The other question, what do students say? Uh, ask them to write uh, their suggestions on a piece of paper, five minutes at the end of a class. How can I, okay, you can ask them, um, how, do you th how do you think I could understand better <laughs> what you are thinking? You can get some interesting ideas from students and you can do it in, you can do it in, uh, in Bangla. It doesn't have to be in, in English. Uh, get all of their feedback and you've done research, you've done the research, you've explored the situation. You see what they say, you see if they say common things. And then you can do some action to make a change. And you can see if it changes or not. You could also ask somebody to observe your class, for example, to see if there's some change. That's just a simple explanation of exploratory action research. I hope that's, that's useful for you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Our but next I would, question. I would also just say one more thing. Ideally, you ideally you have a supportive network that is going to support you uh, doing your research. So you you have a mentor, somebody who can give you advice. Like I've just tried to give you advice very too quickly, really, but somebody that you can talk about. And that, I think that's what uh, an association, a teacher association, research stick, for example, can do. I think. Yes. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we'll be taking. We'll uh, hello, more. sir. Can I have a question, sir? We'll be taking hello. two more questions. Foreign, just wait. I'm sir, I have a question, you. sir. Foreign, I'm yeah. giving you the floor. Just a minute, please. Mr. Okay. Amin Rahman, he is waiting in the queue. Mr. Amin Rahman, he was asking questions, please. Yes. Uh, I, anyway, I'm, I'm, my video is off. Uh, no my name is Amin. I'm from Melbourne in Australia right at this moment. Okay. Uh, I remember about five, six years ago, an online course by you and the British Council for Teachers. Uh, is it that one based uh, on the ch your Chilean and Indian experience, right? Yes. And is it still available? Is it still available? I think I, I looked at it at that time. I found it very useful and I recommend it to some uh, teachers in Bangladesh. And if it is still available, upgrade it. Uh, because it was six years old, uh, yeah. I think uh, it will be good. Thank you very much for thank you for saying that. Uh, <coughs> thank thank you for saying that, Dr. Rahman. Thank you. Um, this um, <clears throat> the one I showed just now uh, is going to start in January and February, and it's free for anybody to join. So um, the, te the, the teacher who just uh, asked me a question, it would be good for you to, to join this. It's online and I've, I'm not involved now, but they still follow the procedure that I set up, I think, with, uh, with Paola. <coughs> they still follow the uh, exploratory action research model. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Hack, who, who asked me the question as a teacher, it would be good for you to register for this. Um, I've just found the uh, I've, I've found the link there, which I can put into the chat. Um, is it something? Certainly, I would recommend. Uh, it's a series of five weeks, and all all of these people here are volunteering volunteering to be mentors. As I said just now, to Mr. Hack is important to have support, and they can support you for five five weeks at least. Um, thank you for your comment, Dr. Rahman. Thank you, Mr. Porin Chandra. Please, a few questions. Uh, hello, Dr. Hello, Dr. Richard. Hello. Good afternoon. This is afternoon here. 
hello uh, hello yeah uh, i was expecting uh, another dimension in your presentation which is uh, uh, you know the uh, backwash impact of exam chale uh, uh, my point is uh, in bangladesh <laughs> am, am i clear am i clear mr mr yes, yeah yes thank you yeah okay yeah. My, my point is uh, let let me tell you in in bangladesh what happens when a teacher, teacher when a teacher enters consulting classroom uh, for teaching uh, for teaching english language uh, um, the teachers cannot teach what is needed to be taught in the classroom they have to worry about whether their students will pass in the exam or not and the exam the system of exam determines the teaching and learning content in the classroom particularly in bangladesh <clears throat> okay i am talking about bangladesh okay. and particularly in primary level and the secondary level the teaching and learning is determined by the content of the system of the exam so the examination, so thank you yeah examination okay, foreign, foreign we got the question thank you so much richard please so um thanks for your comments uh, is a comment and um i think um i well uh, that is a important uh, very important aspect of context may, may i just finish uh, my point um yeah, that is extremely important aspect of the context not only in bangladesh but in many countries in public schools in uh, in secondary education in particular that um there are important examinations that uh, the teachers needs to and parents expect them to uh, and children want them to uh teach towards exams so any any teacher who tries to innovate too much may receive some criticism from uh from uh, those people um and it's certainly something which in many contexts um means that innovation is is difficult so i think i think that's exactly why we need to look at what teachers are doing in their contexts rather than rather than saying teachers should teach in all of these innovative ways which are coming from other contexts which may not be appropriate in such a such a situation that's exactly why we need to look at what good teachers as seen as i said who are who are defined by the children themselves by by the head teachers by the parents and um successful teaching not from some ex exterior outside perspective but from within seen defined as successful within remember um amal padwad made that point about research in india that it doesn't it 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 adopts too too much western perspectives so i think this is very much to do with um decolonization or decentering uh you know tisol and decentering research and i think that was in what i was saying that we therefore because uh, i'm agreeing with you that's a very important factor so we therefore need to look at what teachers can do uh, ordinary teachers can do who are good teachers and documenting that looking at that and that could be a starting point for research because then that can help to other teachers to teach in similar contexts where exams are very important i i i'm sure you agree, I'm, well, I, do you agree that yeah. there there are good teachers and not so good teachers who are helping their students to pass exams at the same time as being good good te good teachers in other in other ways of course we need to define what we mean by good and successful but it should be locally defined is what i'm is what i'm saying okay i i think we have crossed the one hour session thank you richard thank you such a, a wonderful and informative session so we are closing the keynote speed thank you so much thank yeah. you very much Thank you, Dr. Richard. We have a certificate for you on behalf of the Society of Bangladesh, and I guess you'd be very glad to know that uh, we in the Society of Bangladesh really care about supporting teachers and. It, as a step towards supporting teachers we have collaborated with light of hope a local uh, ngo who work with school teachers and we are training them so they can fruitfully apply the knowledge and i totally agree with you that contextualization is necessary being an english teacher i know that class to class varies so no two classes are similar localization and contextualization is necessary thank you so much you see the certificates did you share the certificates Uh, yes, uh, the certificate. Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to request Asim Atikur Rahman to share the certificate, please. 
Okay. He's sharing, sir. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, he has shared, I guess, sir. He has already okay. shown. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. And now we're going to move on to our next session. And I'm glad to announce we're beginning our first plenary session of our first virtual conference. And uh, the first uh, speaker is Dr. Asifa Sultana, and her session topic is Writing a Literature Review, Going Beyond Summarizing. And this session will be moderated by Afroza Akhtar Tina, Senior Lecturer, Department of English, Daffodil International University. Now I'm handing the floor over to Afroza Akhtar Tina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepthi Rahman. Thank you so much. Well, uh, as you know that this is the first plenary talk today, I welcome you all to this plenary talk and we have Dr. Asifa Sultana with us today. Now, before starting this session, I'd like to remind you some specific things. We have 30 minutes in total and uh, I would request the audience to please write down their questions in the talk chat box and uh, definitely we'll try to reach you at the end. Now, uh, let me start with Dr. Asifa Sultana's short bio. Well, Dr. Asifa Sultana is an associate professor at the Department of English and Humanities, Brack University. Dr. Sultana is an applied linguist working on different aspects of language acquisition that include typical language development, language disorders, and literacy development. She completed her PhD from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand in 2015. In the PhD project, she examined the nature of morphosyntactic development among Bangla speaking, typically and atypically developing children. She is currently part of several international research collaborations that examine language development, language loss, language policies, and the relationship between language and gender. Now, let me welcome Dr. Asifa Sultana. Ma'am, are you here? The time is yours. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Dr. Afroza. Uh, thanks for um, uh, thanks for inviting me to this session. I would like to thank uh, the Tissol Society of Bangladesh for allowing me to speak at the first international virtual research conference. Um, um, I am Asifa Zultana. I teach uh, at the Department of English and Humanities, Brack University. Um, I'll just need a few seconds to share my screen. Um, can you sh can you see can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. And you can hear me also, right? Yes, ma'am. Clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about something that uh, we are all we, uh, uh, all of us are uh, um, we are engaged in um, uh, uh, since we are all engaged in uh, doing research. Uh, we all at some point have written a literature review, or we are probably um, uh, writing one at this moment. So I'm going to talk about uh, writing a literature review, but I'm going to focus on uh, some specific components of writing a literature review because I am assuming that uh, uh, at this platform, everyone is familiar with the basic components of literature review. So I thought this would be a useful discussion to have because um, since, I mean, although this is a very challenging time for all of us, we are clearly having to continue our uh, research. Um, so this, I think, is relevant. The talk discussion is relevant as, as always. So I'm going to talk about um, some components of writing a literature review and how we can uh, refine the literature review so that it does not end up becoming just a summary of the previous um, findings of the previous studies. So just so that uh, we are all on the same page, uh, I would like to just tell you uh, what I'm not going to discuss. So, um, so we don't have uh, any, um, so we don't have, um, so our expectations are not different. So I'm not going to talk, introduce you to uh, literature review as a concept. I'm also not going to talk about um, the general guidelines about how to write a literature review. The talk is also not about uh, how you can use technology to gather information and how you can manage data. And definitely the, the talk is not about research design. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I, have this, I, I have actually picked three components of writing literature review, which I think um, help us refine the literature review. And um, I'll talk about these briefly in a bit. 
but the motivation behind choosing these three components was uh, basically my experience as a reviewer and also as a thesis supervisor. So what I often receive as a reviewer or as a supervisor is that um, uh, I, I get to see a lot of literature, literature review where some, some thing, where, I mean, the, the, the authors or the researchers do a very um, um, thorough, you know, thorough investigation of the previous studies, but they find it challenging to put it together in a more coherent manner. So that was basically the motivation behind choosing these three points, which um, um, which I think are very important for writing a good literature review. So I'm going to talk about how to uh, formulate sentences when you're citing um, references within the text. I'm also going to talk about how to co connect various ideas within the literature review. And uh, finally, I'm also going to talk about how to interpret the, how to add your interpretation to the literature review. So I'll try to be, um, quick because um, I think I have about 20 minutes now left. So the first part, uh, before I talk about uh, citing, uh, before I talk about citation and how to cite, um, let me uh, just ask, raise this question. So when do we need to cite a source in a literature review? Do we have to give references for all, set, all sentences that we write? We don't because uh, for example, a sentence like this, English is an Indo-European language. So do we need a reference for this? We don't because uh, it is considered to be part of common knowledge, especially um, uh, in the academia. Um, I mean, this is not a specific research finding or the, the, the information is not very specific. So we do not necessarily have to uh, give citation for this. Um, however, if you look at... Um, if you look at this uh, sentence, English is an Indo-European language with approximately 1.27 billion speakers, you have a specific information. And for something like this, you have to give a reference. So uh, just wanted to highlight this before I uh, begin. So when the information is specific, you need to give citation. Now, um, how do we cite? Now uh, on the screen, what you can see is a very basic citation technique. So according to author A, according to researcher A and B, and then you have the year within bracket, and then you have the findings. A very similar thing is, um, so the second example also does a very, it serves, the, serves a very similar purpose. Um, so you have the author's names in the beginning and the, you just move the um, year to the end of the sentence. Now, what happens is I'll talk about um, um, uh, this in um, a little more in a while. Now, a better uh, way of doing it is to actually not mention the authors in the body of the text and put all the publication details in the bracket. So you, you continue your discussion, you talk about the different findings, you connect them. So you keep your arguments going while all the publication details remain within brackets. So this is a better, the third, the last uh, sentence that you can see is a better example of uh, citing sources because what happens is that when you start your sentence with something like according to authors A and B, or when you say that authors A and B suggested that, what happens is that it indicates that you are going to tell me exactly what they have done. So it is going to be a reproduction of what, um, what uh, they have done. So there is, uh, so as a researcher, I'm not doing uh, I'm not adding any adding any value to um, what has been said in that uh, paper. What also happens when you give explicit details regarding the publication in the body of the text is the weaving of the sentence becomes loose. So for a journal article, excuse me. So for a journal article or a thesis, that's not a very uh, you know um, that's not a very good way of writing. Also, when you write down the, when, when you say according to authors A and B, what happens is that the focus shifts from the main argument to the authors, which is not, uh, in most cases, which is not recommended because you would like the reader to follow your argument in a, you know, they, the arguments should, um, you know, uh, follow each other in a uh, coherent manner. However, when you're making an oral presentation, um, often it is uh, recommended that you uh, your sentences are you know often it is recommend that recommended that you do not give um, a lot of information uh, you know 
you do not you know say a lot of information in real time because your audience needs time to process this so in those situations it is okay to say you know tell it like a story that according to um, authors a and b and um, according to this study there's a study conducted in this year so then in those situations it's okay to have a narrative like this whereas when you're writing a journal article or a thesis um, a better way is to put the publication details within the bracket so that 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 um, makes the um, makes your writing compact okay the second one is that in your literature review you want to tell one story and you do not want to give a lot of different ideas you can have a lot of different arguments within your literature review of course there will be various um, there will be very different views regarding um, the issue that you are raising um, but and also you have multiple research questions in your uh, thesis or a journal article but you will have to build us one story around all those so you will have to make sure that all your arguments are connected very well so i have uh, tried to uh, uh, i have tried to bring some examples and these are all examples that i have received from uh, these are real life examples i mean I, the examples that i received from the different manuscripts that i received as a reviewer or as a supervisor so if you look at this sentence um i will actually not be able to um, allow you time to read it carefully but i would actually like to um, highlight what is happening here so in this example this is the actual example that was there in the manuscript so you see that um, here the the paper was about uh, errors second language learners errors and error correction so you see that the uh, in the beginning the researcher is talking about crashan's views regarding learner errors then the researcher researcher is saying that global errors are um, um, you know citing another source the researcher is saying that global errors are considered to be um, more important in terms of giving error giving feedback and then the researcher comes back to uh, comes back to you know giving another view regarding errors and then again um it is followed by another view regarding error correction so you see a lot of different arguments are being mixed up so if you so i've just tried to put the different arguments uh, separate the different arguments so all the green sentences that you can see are regarding the different views um of second language learners errors whereas the purple ones are regarding um the recommendations regarding how to uh, how to which errors to choose when you give error corrections so there are two major things two major arguments that are going on so so once you highlight these of course a better way would be to rewrite it where these arguments stick to where these arguments are together so i've tried to in example 2 i've tried to rewrite the whole so this example um where i've tried to uh, you know like put them in um, in clusters also i have done uh, something else here i have added a few sentences um um to you know create a body of the um body for you know create a structure for the argument so instead of saying instead of starting uh, with what crashan thinks or what bird said i'm saying that views regarding errors in the course of learning a second language vary among the researchers of different theoretical theoretical beliefs some researchers consider an error to be a serious mistake now i have crashan's information within bracket and a, as an example of course there are more researchers who look uh, who thought that errors can be a se serious mistake so i'm saying that some feel that it is a serious mistake and crashan is one of them so he is an example similarly i have done the same with the other view as well um then before going on to talk about um error corrections i've added another sentence i'm saying that since correcting all errors in learners performances can be impractical and ineffective so of course we are choosing to give feedback to some errors because we cannot give feedback to all errors and if, even if we manage to give feedback it is not going to be effective so because they're impractical and ineffective researchers recommend that errors need to be prioritized so this is where i am citing um, penny er so that citation was there in the original paragraph then i'm continuing with the different views regarding which errors are to be prioritized and i have paraphrased it um, you know i think minimally so um 
Yeah, so you see that the yellow sentences here are my sentences uh, that I have added to connect the different ideas. And um, the blue green ones are um, just to highlight that what other things that I have done in terms of citations. Um, so what I have generally done, so what I'm generally suggesting is, is that when you have, of course, after reading a lot of literature, you gather a lot of different ideas. So what you do is um, identify the, all the different ideas, then put them in clusters, like how I have used different colors. You can find your own techniques of doing that. So put them in clusters, and then you put them in actual sentences. So formulate sentences. Um, for expressing these ideas, put them, uh, you know, use the recommendation, uh, recommended citation techniques that I said, you know, um, you know, put them, put the publication details in bracket um, so that they do not interfere with the main arguments. And then finally add your bridging sentences, you know, like the yellow sentences that I added in the previous slide. Um, so often uh, when uh, we supervise students, they often, um, ask that literature review is supposed to be some, you know, the other, it is supposed to be others work. Um, so why do I have to add my sentences? Now literature review is supposed to be about others work, but it is, it has to be your language. So, um, so the body of the language or the main writing will have to be done by you. But of course you will talk about, um, you will talk about, um, I mean, you'll put information that you have gathered from other, you know, studies conducted by others, but the language will have to be yours. Okay. So, um, so yes, the, the thing that I wanted to highlight was that you will have to build one story in your literature. And to do that, what you have to do is that you identify the ideas, put them in an organized manner. And very important point is to add your bridging sentences so that they become one, um, so that they become one story. Okay, the final one is that you do not, uh, you do not um, stop by um, creating one story, you also need to add your voice so that as a researcher, so the, so the reader gets to know where you stand um, in terms of your um, views regarding uh, what you have gathered or what you have collected from other sources. So you interpret the findings that others have, um, you know, the, the other, you know, findings that you're gathering from other research. Um, so this is the paragraph that I have, um, I'm using, or the previous paragraph that I had rewritten. So this is the basic paragraph without my interpretation, without the researcher's interpretation. Now, this is incomplete because, um, Again, this does not this does not take us beyond just a summary. It is still a summary, but maybe it's a good story because it's um, organized well. Um, okay, so I'll finish in two minutes. Um, so here I am adding my voice. So if you look at this, um, so the summary in the summary it signaled that um, it is better to pro, uh, you know. Um, focus on the global errors than local errors. Now, what is my view about it? So I think as a researcher, I mean, assuming that this is my um, uh, writing. So as a researcher, I feel that we don't have to readily accept these recommendations. We can test it. For example, as a researcher, I feel that learners' beliefs also have an impact on um, deciding, um, deciding the kind of uh, errors that are effective. So learners might have their own preferences. They might want certain errors to be corrected. So we'll have to test it out. So this is what I'm adding in the final sentence. And when the readers uh, come across this, they know that, okay, this is where I am. Um, this is where I stand. And this actually connects, uh, connects the, this, connect, th these, this sentence connects this paragraph to the following section where I will probably talk about learner beliefs a little more. So this is also a good connecting sentence. So when you add these sentences, um, your thesis or your um, journal article is synthesized. So they are they, so through these, you are telling one story. 
So I'm so just to summarize, I have talked about um, how to put the citations, um, how to formulate the sentences, how to add your sentences to create one story, and how to connect different ideas, and how to add your view regarding um, the issues that you are raising. Uh, raising. So. Um, your views does not mean your opinions, they will have to be lodged, they will have to be supported by evidence. So my personal opinions do not really matter, but uh, my opinions regarding, um, my opinion as a researcher based on, you know, based on different findings um, will be considered as um, um, you know, good uh, information to support what I'm saying. Okay, so this, with this, I would like to end my talk. Uh, I have a few references for you here. Um, of course, there are a lot, uh, you know, um, a lot of other different sources online and offline regarding how to do academic writing, um, how to do synthesis in your literature review. So I just uh, identified some that um, that you might find useful. So uh, thank you. Um, I would, I can take some questions if there are any. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from Saeedu Rahman, sir. Sir, would you like to ask the question? Uh, you, you can ask. No problem, Tina. Yeah, please. Okay. Ma'am, uh, Saeedu, sir, wants to, uh, has a question, and uh, he asked, mm -hmm. what techniques should we follow to add our own voice to the stories, the stories that you have been talking so far? What yeah, techniques yes, should we follow? Yeah. Yes. Yes, um, I think uh, it will uh, depend on what you are, um, what we are trying to interpret. For example, um, the in this case, the original paragraph did not have uh, any, um, you know, um, any uh, view. So the, the way uh, the paragraph ended, I uh, thought that this could be uh, something that can be added. So it can be based on um, it. It, for example, when you um, one one um, good technique to uh, add your voice is to when you're reading a reading a reading a research article, you can um, question whether you agree with this or not, whether the methodology of the study is correct or not, whether the study you, whether you feel that the study is complete or not, whether the study is relevant in a different context or not. So, for example, we often come across different uh, articles, con you know, sorry, different studies conducted in, you know, in other parts of parts of the world where, you know, where the contexts are very different. Um, so, when we are uh, citing those or when we are um, talking about these in our uh, studies, we can always, we always will have to have a criti critical, um, uh, we have to have a, a critical mind regarding, um, um, regarding receive, you know, like uh, adopting it. So we'll uh, have to see that, okay, this is what has been found, but do I think that I will get a similar finding in my um, context as well? So uh, when we ask these questions, we will find certain things that we can talk about. Yes, ma'am. And uh, also I have a question, if you allow me to ask. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh, you have, uh, I mean, beautifully mentioned several points regarding literature review, actually, how to add our own voice. Now, a researcher like me actually is, is often confused, you know, I usually try to cite from here and there, I try to add actually other voices so much in literature review that somehow, somehow I feel that I, I miss my voice actually in literature review. So what is the basic thing or strategy you would suggest me to follow or maintain? I mean, regarding this problem, how to add my own voice actually along with the other voices while thinking of literature review? Um, I think, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, very similar techniques. I mean, I, I think I would be repeating myself uh, here that uh, um, so um, when you come across an article, uh, you'll have to uh, see whether um, I mean, basically, uh, when uh, when we talk about critical thinking, we say that we do not have to accept, uh, we ha do not have to readily accept um, what is um, given to us in writing um, uh, by different researchers. So uh, when you ask these questions, when you ask those critical questions that, okay, uh, whether it applies to my situation or not, whether um, I agree to how the data has been interpreted or not, because, uh, for example, when you read a a particular article carefully and when they in the finding sections when the researchers give you the give you the data 
and in a later section they interpret the data in the discussion right so you see that they have interpreted that data in a particular manner but you may not agree to agree with this you may feel that okay this data could have been looked at from a different point of view as well so method looking at the methodology is always um, um, i mean i feel that's a very that's a very crucial area to um, you know question the studies that you look at thank you so oh. much ma'am and uh, we'll we'll be taking the last question and this question is from sarmat karin does the type of research for example qualitative or quantitative affect how to write the literature review i mean uh, does the type of research affect a uh, qualitative or quantitative type of research whatever we choose actually sorry um the question so is whether the question it, is uh, does the type of research qualitative or quantitative effect actually oh, in terms of writing the literature review in terms of um, writing the review yes i think there is a, a major difference in terms of uh, in terms of how you are uh, formulating the um, uh, qualitative research but these techniques i uh, i mean i actually uh, i actually chose another reason why i chose these things where that these three techniques were where that these would be i these would be um, applicable in uh, different research methods and these would also be applicable in whatever um you know uh, citation techniques you are going to use so they are uh, they are i think these these belong to the basic uh, basics of conducting research so even when you are conducting qualitative research you will have to add your view even when you are um doing a qualitative research um i mean i i do more quantitative research but i'm saying that um, even when you do qualitative research um you'll have to find a way to connect the idea so i mean so there is no um even in even people who are working outside tsol will have to apply these methods as well so they, these are i think um constant um these are uh, very basic requirements but they are often missing in the uh, manuscripts that um i receive which is why i decided to highlight it Thank you so much ma'am thank you we can't actually take any more questions and uh, now well i would like to share uh, the certificate with you ma'am if you please uh, stop sharing your screen i would like to share the certificate with you and everyone uh, that this is a uh, token of appreciation from tisol society of bangladesh uh, okay i yes ma'am uh, yes i'm i'm stopping yes yeah, yes thank you I think we we could not show the Richards one as well. So yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me the platform to share the ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being with us today. And due to some technical glitch, actually, we couldn't show Richard's certificate. And uh, now we would like to request Richard to please accept this token of appreciation from us. <laughs> yes, Tasnima, would you like to say something? No, 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 no. Thank you. Okay. Sh share the screen. Yes, sir. I'm. I'm trying to share. I don't know why the certificate actually is taking too much time. So oh, this is Asif as well. Yes. Uh... Nusrat, mute, mute yourself, Nusrat. Nusrat, I'm muting. Um, uh, due to some technical glitch, we could not uh, somehow it shared the uh, certificate of Dr. Richard Smith. it was not visible so we're sharing it again uh, ismatik rahman i will request you to share the certificate again i think now it is is it visible now yes i think we can see the certificate now yes finally yes, finally <laughs> don't worry this is the technical glitches will happen this is the new normal don't worry okay yes. uh, so thank you richard thank you asifa ma'am thank you so much
thanks to Dr. Asifa Sultana for a very important informative talk on presenting argument in a coherent manner and incorporating critical ideas in a literature review. I think this will be really helpful for uh, the novice researchers especially. And also thanks to the moderator of this talk, Afroza Tina, for smoothly conducting the session. Now we are moving on to our second plenary speech on researching ways to research during the pandemic, methods, types, and execution. I would like to invite our second plenary speaker, Dr. Sandesha Rayapa Garbiel, and this session will be moderated by Lisa Sharmin, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, Daffodil International University. All right, uh, thank you so much. Well, I'll request everybody to kindly mute themselves uh, since I will be the one speaking. Uh, thank you to the moderator, uh, Nushrat, uh, for introducing me. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Hopefully it'll be visible. Yes, here we go. So, uh, Dr. Rahman, is it visible? Sandesha is visible now. All right, thank you so much. So as the topic states, researching ways to research during a pandemic, methods, types, and execution. Uh, I would like to cover more or less everything, but because of the paucity of time, it might not be possible, but let's try our best. Now, researching during a pandemic. Let me give you the bad news first, because I'm gonna be a harbinger of both the bad news as well as the good news. The COVID-19 pandemic still isn't over. But the good news is that we are most likely at the fag end of the entire pandemic. And somehow, even within uh, our individual circumstances, both we and our research have kind of made it till now. And as you know, research was never going to be easy. The day you decided to do any kind of research, you know you were headed towards a difficult path. So the current situation just made it more difficult. So research too is not going to be the same, whether we like it or not. Because even after the pandemic is over, there is going to be a change as far as research is concerned. We are going to see research getting into a blended kind of a mode, wherein what we were doing earlier, along with the current switch over that most of us have started doing with the online kind of research, we are expecting that to continue on too. So yes, there are pros and cons to it. Let's not even forget the issues and challenges. So the objective of my presentation will be to aid you in actually researching any possible scenario by which you can begin or maybe even restart or continue or even end your current ongoing research, which might be at a pause right now. Though it's been quite a while in India, it's, it's going to be nearly nine months since the start of this entire pandemic, wherein we began with the lockdowns and the partial lockdowns and then with the slowly the opening of the lockdowns. So do you think online research is possible? That is a question I'm to ask all of you. I was intending to actually give all of you a Google form link, which I shared with people uh, just two days back. And I got a couple of responses, which I will be sharing now in the next few slides. So your answers when I asked you this question, do you think online research is possible? You might have said yes. You might have said no. Or you might have thought of maybe, maybe to a certain extent, all right? So when I asked this question, uh, this is how it looked like. I did not get into the details much of the people and everything because I wanted to make it very short and simple. So when I asked people to choose the option as to what they were doing, whether they were faculties, whether they were students, as you can see, majority of them were faculty who answered the questionnaire, but we had people who were undergraduates, we had people who were uh, doing their PhD or the MPhil, who were research scholars. And the subjects and areas of research that they were covering ranged from journalism to linguistics to molecular medicine. So, you know, I had people from all over, from uh, science background, as well as from the arts and humanities. And you can see languages also pretty much was there. And the current location, so the location of the people was varied. Um, it was people from, let's say, West Bengal. Uh, we had people from Bihar, from Punjab. We had uh, people from uh, UK, uh, from Thailand, and uh, somebody from Republica Dominica. So we had a pretty good a mixed bunch, I would say. Um, so the first question which I had asked was, do you think online research is possible? 
And if you look at this, um, 26.8% both ways. It went yes, 26.8% yes, and 26.8% no. But if you look at the maybe, the maybe surprisingly is 46.3, which, which basically tries to show you that most of the people are inclined towards working towards an online research. So I would actually count that with the yes. So I also ask people, are you currently pursuing any research work? And again, if you look at this, 41.5% of the people are saying yes, that they are pursuing. Whether they are pursuing through a blended mode because people have now started going and moving, traveling from one place to the other, and people have started continuing on with their research that they were doing. Though at the same time, because of ethical concerns, most people who are doing field work, especially where they're having to interact with people from the community, they would try to keep that community safe. And keeping that thought in mind, they might not have wanted to go to that particular community, even if they were allowed to travel. So we're looking at all possibilities out here. And again, as you can see, no is what I had at 34.1%. And then 24.4% again was, no, this is not applicable to me because these are the people who didn't need to travel anywhere for any kind of research work maybe, or they were not pursuing any research work. And another interesting thing to note is when you're looking at science students, as I told you, there were science people out here. And uh, I'll show you the results of what they said of the kind of issues and challenges. People think that, oh, science students, they, they, they have laboratory work. So interestingly, for science students, there is something known as a wet lab and a dry lab. Are we okay with the sound? Uh, sir, we cannot hear, ma'am. He's frozen. Uh, I think uh, this is frozen. Sandesha. Maybe her internet. Yes, okay. maybe her internet is the issue. Just a second. Let, let, let us check. Yes, sir. Dipti. Anyone can inform her through message. Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay. Sir? That's fine. I'm just check with her. Please be with us. Let us just check with the speaker. Maybe, uh, can you share the bio now? Before yes, I, uh, uh, I was thinking the same thing, sir. So. Uh, let me check so we can take some time from Okay, uh, uh, we were supposed to introduce her before, but uh, she's very enthusiastic, we can understand, and she has started. Uh, uh, so I'm going to share her bio at this moment. Uh, Dr. Sandesha Raipa Garbiel is an assistant professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University's Linguistic Empowerment Cell, uh, specializes, and she specializes in the area of English language teaching, um, with a PhD focusing on syllabus design for communication skills. She aims to use her experience for running positive and focused and energized classes. She is also the project investigator of the first project between uh, JNU and uh, ONG, uh, GC. Dr. Raipak has been a co convener of a two day workshop series every month known as WETOM that has been having over 2,000 university faculty participating uh, in it every two months. Uh, 
Due to her ELT experience, uh, ELTAI and RELO India nominated her as one of the faculty to represent Indian teachers at the TESOL 2020 virtual convention and language expo. Dr. Raipa has been a regular resource person for English language training to the ASO, assistant section officers in the various ministries of the Indian government and has now also been appointed as an English language expert for, uh, for testing the English language skills of air traffic control officers and pilots of the airport, the authority of India's northern region. So we see that she's quite a sound academician and also she works with the administrative body. Thank I think she's here. Uh, I, I think Sandesh is yeah, back. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, no, the I internet, know, internet went off. Yes. yes that uh, gave us some time to introduce you which is really no good. thank you so much thank you so much yes, uh, i appreciate okay. that uh i'm sorry about that uh like uh, it's one of those things which happen i guess just to show us that there can always be a technical issue and we have to be prepared for everything and anything and i'm glad that uh Tissol bangladesh was ready for such a glitch um <laughs> so continuing on with where i was left off uh thank you dipti um uh, you're right. welcome. I'll just give one information. Uh, the, uh, the session um, question and answer session will be conducted by Lisa Sharmin, Madam, and she was she's the moderator. She'll just get, uh, after you finish the talk, she will join you. So you can and, start. So you can start. So this we just started with the first slide, so it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. It was the first slide. Okay. Thank you. First and second, I think. Uh, yeah. Yes. No, did Nine. you? Did you? Did you see these slides? Mm, can you go back? This one, yes. I, I think this one, right? This one, this one, yeah. yeah. This was the yeah. last from, slide we saw. Yes. yes. Start yeah. from this. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. So basically, I asked the people about the issues or challenges and the kind of issues and challenges that people were talking about was that how they had problem with actually, uh, you know, going, not being able to have access to the library, how they were not able to meet the people, how they were not able to talk to the respondents. So there were these similar issues which more or less everybody was facing. And I also asked people to talk about how people who are conducting online research, how are they doing it? So most of them are using using Google Forms, they were actually using WhatsApp, there were lots of other ways. So I'll be showing a couple of other things towards the end. So quickly looking at the time, please state the location of your research area was one of the question I had asked. So, so you can imagine people in Delhi were working uh, on a research area which was in a location in Northeast maybe or in Punjab or in Uttarakhand and there was somebody who was doing research in Thailand. So. Uh, in the month of July with the VTOM series, which just now uh, Dipti Rahman was talking about, it was on the topic of going online, classroom fieldwork and research, where we had um, such you know, MRE speakers uh, as Professor Rama Matthew, who was talked about earlier uh, by Pro Dr. Smith, as well as uh, Professor Julia Salabank, who actually talked about the same kind of topic that I will be talking about. She was talking about alternative data collection strategies in language related research. So that was the point in time where a lot of people, you know, it was just three months into the lockdown. People are worried, would they be able to do it or not? So I really commend Tisol Bangladesh for taking this up further because even now the situation is the same. Even after nine months of the lockdown, we still have people who are worried whether they can continue on with their online research or any kind of research. So I would like to tell you one thing your answer would depend more or less on what stage you are at right now of your research. Is it the preliminary stages? Is it the beginning? Is it the point where you had just started talking about it with your guide, all right? Or is it in the middle where you have already established your contacts? And then, or is it towards the end wherein you've already done more or less everything, you've collected your data, you're analyzing it, but you need to get work from the library and all those things, all right? So as far as methods are concerned, now for this particular slide and the next two slides, I'll be thanking uh, Dr. Julia Salabank, who actually was gracious enough and she was very kind of, she said, go ahead and do talk about whatever I had also at, during my particular uh, you know, uh, talk. So when you talk about methods, what kind of methods are we talking about? We're looking at field work, wherein you could have something like ethnography, elicitation, uh, like the participants observation interviews, 
And then in discourse analysis, you could have things like discourses, ideologies, policies, media, traditional and new, tweets on language engagement, political speeches. So this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of method by which you could actually collect the kind of data. The corpus analysis of existing texts or literary works. What do you, what are you able to access right now? The descriptive analysis, the type or token analysis, the language variations, uh, archival and desk research. We're talking about literature review, language archives, secondary data, historical linguistics, policy documents, and then questionnaires. Questionnaires is... Uh, can I request everybody to kindly mute themselves or uh, can the host kindly mute them? Thank you so much. So uh, question is, now question is, is something that more or less everyone, whether we would be more or less in the arts and humanities, uh, we would be having these questionnaires wherein we were doing them even before. The only thing what we need to now do is adapt and tweak it so that we are able to actually get across to the people, to the respondents. If we are able to connect through them, I'll talk about it a bit later, how we could connect to them uh, when you're in the starting and you don't exactly know the people. So in questionnaires, you have, for example, I'm looking at this from the linguistic point of view, where you have language vitality, or you have social linguistic surveys, elicitation, grammaticality judgments, matched guys experiments. And then you have analysis, where you have the quantitative, the qualitative, and the mixed kind of analysis, the, which require fieldbook outputs, which need to be transcribed, analyzed, curated, or archived. They can lead to creation of materials such as dictionaries, grammars, and videos. So right now, if you have that kind of a data, you could actually be working on the next phase. You could actually you know, move around your timeline of whatever that you were planning for your research work. All of these can be done online or at a distance to an extent. So for example, you might have, a, you, you might have had a time plan that, you know, okay, I'll do this in the starting, I'll do this in the middle, and I'll do this in the end. But because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, because of the current situation, you might like to do something which you had planned at the end, right now, towards the first half. How you can go about it can easily be done you, when you talk to your guys, when you talk to your seniors and professors, because they will be the ones who will help you to adapt to the change. You have to learn to adapt. And if your plan A doesn't work, you go for plan B. Now, how do you adapt? You for example, when I was talking about interviews, now, if you've already started the first stage where you were interviewing people, where you were interacting people, interacting with people, you're continuing the interviews online with people you are already working with. Uh, for example, somebody was conducting ethnographic interviews. They were semi-structured or they were unstructured online or by phone. Um, somebody is expanding their network of contacts using the friend of a friend kind of a method. Then becoming a language mentor for participants as a kind of payment, all right? And then you have observing events via video link or YouTube. So there are a lot of people right now, for example, um, who you would not have had access to. But because now they're getting networks, they're getting mobiles, they are able to connect. They themselves are recording. They themselves are uploading. You can see all these TikTok videos. You can see all these YouTube videos. Though I know TikTok is currently banned in a lot of countries, but they are still available to a lot of people. This course, content or thematic analysis, example of comments on social media, news items, etc. There are a lot of people, in fact, um, when we're looking at um, linguistically, we are finding a lot of work is getting uploaded by the people themselves. Um, I'll just quickly go. Online questionnaires, you have things like Google Forms, SurveyMonkey, and many others. And you can check out the wide range of question types they can ask. Uh, you can ask participants to fill in language diaries or to record themselves going about their daily lives. And this has been used by many researchers with considerable success. And uh, I would suggest you to get to know the participants before asking them to record themselves. See, there is one thing that you need to understand. Even if you think that the participant would not be able to comprehend the entire thing and you would like somebody to explain to them, you could always get somebody in the middle, somebody from the community who you could explain and you could ask them to go about with asking and explaining the questions of the questionnaire. And the other thing you need to understand is because of ethical concerns, you will have to get them a participant you know, information uh, consent form, which people would actually sign and approve that they agree to giving the entire, you know, filling up the questionnaire. Uh, you also need to get consent from the family members. 
few solutions. You recruit participants without meeting them face to face, as I just now mentioned. You build the trust with them, a local helper, which I was just talking about. And one thing is there is that when you are having online interviews, there might be an inability to read the body language, and the body language of your participants are extremely important. They could help you to kind of, you know, assess whether they are understanding what you are trying to ask them. Now, uh, it is not possible to have, you know, Zoom interactions or Google Meet interactions with everyone in remote areas. One idea which I could give you is WhatsApp, which I had told to one of my students because she said, "Ma'am, it's not easy. You know, WhatsApp might be possible. Then I'll try that." And she tried that, and naturally worked out for her. So she actually recorded her questions and sent it through WhatsApp video. so that even if that person whenever they were able to get the connectivity <clears throat> they were able to record their answers and send them back <clears throat> you have to choose your platforms very carefully you have to be in consultation with each participant you have to keep a record of each one's preferred platform in metadata and some may only want to use the phone there are people who don't have laptops and computers they only have a smartphone which they can work with no recording facility in a facebook messenger for example all right but you have chats for example if you ask them a question through chat if they're able to answer through that that is also a way by which you could collect your data technical problems for example right now you just saw we had a technical issue but it, for example you could have a situation where there's no sound it's not limited to online research unfortunately you can have it in many other platforms bandwidth is a major issue quality of sound now this is for people who are focusing on phonological analysis of any data this could be a major problem so i would suggest that make sure that you try to get somebody from within the community maybe you could courier them or you could get send them money to you know purchase a recorder and get them to record the people and send it back to you in online conferences make sure that your text is large enough to be read on a small screen now i'm going to quickly go to a case study uh, could someone please tell me from the host or the moderator how much time do i have you have roughly 2 minutes okay quickly then thank you uh, dipti so the case study is this is a class of linguistic empowerment cell uh, which dipti was talking about i teach and over here i teach them basic communication skills in english for academic writing so the students are from all over they are from science they are from uh, humanities arts languages everything so it's a mixed bag and now, right now i have students joining from nepal as well as from usa who are there because of uh, their you know such a current situation so one of my students she actually had to present something for a conference and i'm just sharing this how she collected uh, her kind of uh, you know research for her research work what she did the topic that she had was mapping covid five geography mental mapping of experiences of the covid 19 among the youth of north india and then she went about by uh, you know what is a mental map she was talking about a person's visualization of an image and she wanted people to kind of talk about covid so her methodology was that she started asking people she shared it through google form she asked people to share it with others and she got these kind of uh, mental maps which she presented and in the conference she actually was applauded for being one of the best uh, presenters and uh, in the end i would like to end with this slide which talks about 21st century life skills which i would show i would request all of you to google both as faculty as well as researchers as well as students these are the kind of life skills which are required for you to become a better researcher and And obviously, adapting and thinking out of the box is exactly what we need to do. So, with this, I thank all of you, and I'm ready to take in your questions. Thank you so much. Okay, as we don't have time constraints, we are only going to take three questions. So, you may unmute your mic to ask the questions, or you also may write on the in the chat box. Does anybody have any question? Any question? uh they might not just in case there are no questions one thing i would like to share is just to give an idea with the kind of way by which i kind of collected the data for regarding the questions that i asked and they share i have a question yes this time go ahead yeah yeah it, it is really very informative session uh, thank you doing uh, some research on pandemic so i was just struggling with uh, consent i mean participants consent how do you manage it 
Okay, thank you. That's an excellent question. Now, uh, looking at the situation, uh, you have to deal with it. For example, if you are in a situation where you're able to send out the participation consent form via email and you can get somebody to print it out and give it out, that is one possible way. Another possible way is that you could courier it or send it across via post. That is also a possibility that you can look at. So everybody, please try to understand your issues and challenges are going to vary from person to person. For example, Dr. Akhtar's uh, situation will be different from Dr. Rehman's when he's collecting or she's collecting data. You have to think accordingly and adapt. And this is the best time to interact, interact with people. Such kind of platforms are extremely important, like which this all Bangladesh is providing you because here is where you're listening to the ideas. I could have made it very technical. I could have specifically talked about what is research, what are research methods. But I realized when I heard, uh, even when Dr. Richard Smith was talking, he was talking about the same thing. He was thinking this is the time. This is where we have to adapt mm -hmm. as faculty yeah. as Dr. Akhtar has to prepare her students that be ready. If, yours to, if your people cannot connect for getting the participant uh, consent form, there are other ways that are possibly there. For example, WhatsApping them the consent form, getting them to you know kind of sign it somewhere and then send it across via WhatsApp. This is also a possibility that we've already been seeing people doing. Thank you so much, Taslima, for the okay, question. I have a question for you. you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have to contextualize my research design because of this, actually. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Akhtar, actually, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Everyone who's listening, and I'm sure you already know this, we all have to tweak the tweaking of our entire proposals. And I'm not talking about just working on our thesis, on our dissertations. I'm talking about simple thing. If you want to come out with an article which you want to publish in your local paper, for that, if you want to get the kind of data and you can't get out of your city, you need to use your primary, secondary sources accordingly. This is the time when mm -hmm. our primary and secondary sources yeah, matter. Any type yes. of data. Thank you. Okay, I exactly. have a question. And, uh, and I yes. I guess this is going to be the last question because we don't have yeah, enough okay. time. Uh, yeah, you sure. were talking about discourse analysis of different kinds of Facebook and online maybe comments and others. So would we face any kind of ethical issues? Suppose I have taken some comments from YouTube or Facebook in order to judge. Okay. So how should I deal with that? Okay, so thank you so much for that, uh, Dipti, uh, because that's extremely important. I was also mentioning about ethical concerns. I was talking about plagiarism and everything. This is the reason why even when I was using the slides, where I was sharing the slides uh, by uh, Dr. Julia Salabank, I was mentioning about her. So this is extremely important. If you are taking the help of anyone or if you're using YouTube or Facebook, you need to mention your source, at least at the end or towards at the end of the slide. So this is extremely important your source of reference which Dipti has uh, rightly pointed out it is it is not a problem see everybody please try to understand we are researchers we are researching remember so we know things are there you know unless you're just doing something which is completely brand new and it's your brand name that's a different story but we all know we are getting help this is now the time for if there was any a time when humanity had to share its knowledge this is the time and we all know about it so we just need to kind of mention the people who source they are using and that's extremely important otherwise i don't think sharing is caring i think yes okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sandesha. Oh, and I would now request SM Atikur Rahman to show uh, your your certificate. And this certificate is on behalf of Tissal Society of Bangladesh. And I really enjoyed your very, very energetic session. And it is so helpful, I guess, because you have given us direction on how, could, how can we conduct research and continue our investigation. Uh, so, so thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dipti. I would also like to mention this was a wonderful opportunity to meet Dr. Smith again, though it was virtually. And I remember meeting him, meeting him in February in the month of Kathmandu. Just after that, the pandemic thing happened. But I remember meeting him and it was wonderful. And I'm really glad that Dr. Rahman and all of you invited me for this opportunity again. I'm really glad Thank and we'll so continue much. talking with you in the breakout rooms, definitely. Yes. Now it's uh, time for our next plenary session. And I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman, sir, uh, to begin the plenary session. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dipti. Uh, I, I can see the Beth is waiting. We're just uh, five minutes late. Um, uh, the, the discussion leads to another serious issue about ethicality, and this is the next session on ethical issues in uh, TESOL research. 
consideration for research in Bangladesh and Burma. Let me just introduce <coughs> my friend Elizabeth Darling. PhD currently uh, teaches in the Department of English American Studies at the University of Vienna from 2017 to 2020. She was a professor of English language teaching, methodology, and research at the University of Graz. Previous to that, she was at the Open University UK and worked for a number of years on the English in Action project in Bangladesh. Her research explores issues of equity in English language education, particularly with regard to multilingual students with lower socioeconomic status. She is interested in the nexus between language policy ideology. So over to Beth, Professor Elizabeth Arling. Can you hear me, Beth? I could see her, Beth. Um, Beth, can you hear us? Uh, Beth, the sound, please. Can you check your microphone, Beth? We can hear you. Something happened with your microphone. The microphone. Uh, we can hear you. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's okay. Okay, great. Great. Sorry <laughs> okay. about that. I don't know what. No, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, Donabad, thank you for having me here today. Uh, and um, as Sayadur said, my, my story and my connection uh, to Bangladesh goes back to the English in Action project, which I think I started working around, on in around 2008, right at the beginning. I, was, I worked on the early phases of the project on the, the secondary materials. Uh, at that time, I was, uh, I was working in, in English language uh, teaching and teacher education at the Open University UK. And, and I had the privilege of working on this project, which, which really changed my life. My research trajectory not only introduced me to wonderful people that I'm still in contact with today, like Saidur, uh, Kumra uh, Chowdhury, um, Obaid, um, and but um, and it and it really changed my perceptions on English language teaching and um, and you know the the, the I'm not going to really talk about the project today, uh, but the project really took me in a new direction in my thinking because. The, the aim of the project was to contribute uh, in the project policy documents. They talked about contributing to the e economic growth of Bangladesh by teaching English. And I had never really thought about English as a tool for econ um, economic development before. And I hadn't worked on a big project like this before. And in the first phases, we did a lot of classroom observations and I went out to a lot of villages and and I and I I would became acquainted with the challenges of education in some of uh, these contexts, and I I I really did begin to wonder: Was English the solution here? Was this really the thing that we should be spending fifty million pounds on? Uh, and 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 that thought kind of drove me. Um, to, to start working on some independent, some research that ran independently um, to uh, English in Action. And that's really where I got to start working with Saidur and Kumral and the British Council uh, funded a few projects in which we, we looked at um, people's attitudes to English um, in rural areas and what they thought about the language as a, as a language um, for development. And I, I, I got to see more closely these ideologies of, develop, of, of English and how strongly it was related to this idea of economic uh, development and, and progress. And so uh, just to mention here, these two projects and the reports for which um, then and Saidur worked with me on both of them, they're both freely available online uh, for you. And, um, <clears throat> And you know, just to say here again that 
we couldn't have done these projects without the participants and with all of the people in the team, um, uh, like Kamrol, Philip Sargent, Mike Sully, um, and the, the support of the OU and the support of the, the, the British Council and the AI project, which was funded by the Department for International Development in, in the UK. Um, and when, without these people, these projects, these experiences, I wouldn't be talking to you about these things today. And what I really wanted to focus on today in this talk is, is ethics and this, this idea of ethics. And, and I got to watch um, the, the, the first talk um, two days ago um, by Maboub, where who and he talked about credible projects. And I noticed that the E at the end of credible is for ethics and ethical. And so what do we mean by ethics and why do they matter for our research? And why do they particularly matter in research in, with, with participants who might be vulnerable in contexts where resources are scarce? Now, the first thing to say about ethics is there, there are official guidelines about them that are that our institutions put out, that our universities require. There's a there's a form we need to fill out. There are boxes we need to tick. Um, and also, a lot of times now, and this is important for you who are thinking about publishing internationally. Increasingly, we are required to talk about our ethical protocols in our research, to fill out forms to get things published that we have gotten um, permission from our universities and from our boards of education and that sort of things to undertake the research that we're doing. So it's increasingly required for publication that we need informed consent of our participants, that I, they have to volunteer, that they're anonymous and protected. I remember in, in Obaid's research, it, it, it impressed me that he even protected the village that he was researching in, that, that, that that's even anonymized. And that's something I learned from him and have been doing since. And we also have these kind of guidelines, um, codes. The British Association of Applied Linguistics has a, um, a very thorough guideline about working ethically. Um, the Global Challenges Research Framework has also come up with an ethical framework. And I find I, I go back to these over and over in all of my projects to, to consider things. Um, and, and, and in fact, we've worked about, we've written about some of the ethical challenges that we've faced in, in teams of research that have people in the global north and the global south, different um, contexts, different experiences coming together. And this is often also the case between teachers and, and academics working together. We have different needs, we have different demands on us. And we need the research to fulfill all of our needs. Um, and so I don't see ethics as a checklist. The checklist is part of it perhaps, but it's a process and it's, uh, it's a form of, re of reflection and, and it's a way of thinking about our responsibilities to, the, um, to our institutions and to each other and to the people we're researching on or for or with. Uh, all the stakeholders in, involved. And it's this constant process of checking yourself, trying to do whatever the right thing is in, in that moment. Um, so yeah, something that needs to be consistently addressed at each stage of the research program uh, process. And um, you know, some authors have talked about being ethically literate, literate, that we need to train our researchers to be literate and ethical um, matters um, and to engage with uh, discussions around ethical issues. Um, and as um, I just wanted to show you this and to point out this um, toolkit because I think it's a really great resource and they've said there's been over 200 people working on it and researchers in really different contexts but it it gives you an idea of, of, of where ethics comes into play. And it's really at every stage from conception to team development, to recruiting participants all the way up into the end point that uh, ethical issues um, come into play. And, and I have to say as well that it's, it's never finished either. The, the, 
that things can come up long after a project has finished um, a new ethical challenge or dilemma. And so I wanted to um, talk about some of the dilemmas we faced in doing these, these collaborative projects together and some of the solutions we've, we've sought together and to point out that this, these are also uh, reported in a, in a publication from 2016, some of them. And I also um, found a, a, an excellent new article <clears throat> about uh, ethical dilemmas in, in doing research in fragile contexts. So I'm going to talk about these three areas, project aims versus constraints, the participants' expectations, um, power dynamics, and issue of informed consent and reporting. So the first one, aims versus constraints or restraints. First of all, when, when we wrote the proposal, when we had um, this whole idea that we wanted a gender balance, that we wanted this project to be to um, also investigate particular issues for female participants in Bangladesh around English language learning. And, and so when we started recruit, recruiting researchers, um, we, we worked together with two researchers in Bangladesh who were gonna go out into the field and collect the data. In the end, we only had a budget for two researchers to do these extended field route work uh, trips. And we found that the way the whole thing had been conceptualized wasn't particularly uh, easy to uh, enact for female researchers to, to go away for 10 days, to travel with a man. Um, and so in the end, because of budget and time constraints, and um, we, we wound up uh, with two male researchers, um, excellent researchers. Um, but that also then had the effect of, of, of how we could recruit participants. It meant that they were more likely to get into contact with male participants and to be able to have uh, uh, discussions with them. It didn't mean that we couldn't recruit um, female participants. It was just more of a challenge. And in fact, we had to integrate a second follow-up field visit in one of the projects to specifically target um, female participants. And even then, uh, uh, regularly, uh, there was a male present for the interview. And that meant that maybe we didn't really capture the, the voices of the female participants. So if you see in this very short ex extra, uh, Kumrul pointed out to me where he's asking this um, direct question to the, the, the woman, this is a Fia, and this is, a, a, this is a, of course, anonymized. Um, her husband answers for her. And so in, in much of the interview, she's constrained by the presence of her husband and um, who it was felt to be contextually appropriate for him to be there but this, this didn't always allow her to speak. Another one was around expectations. Um, so a, a guiding principle in research is that we don't want to do harm. And this is a, something we don't want to do harm to our participants, to ourselves, to our colleagues. Uh, and ideally, we would even like our research um, to lead to a positive impact on people's lives. Um, through these projects, I became increasingly skeptical or critical about whether, you know, how, how much we were able to promise a potential positive impact of the research. And, and it was difficult in explaining to participants why should people who were on very low wages, why should they give up time to talk to us? Maybe some of them were on a break or things weren't particularly busy and, um, and they were curious. Uh, and, and so they donated their time to us. But um, this, this was a challenge uh, for me in thinking about the research. And we didn't want to raise anyone's expectations. Um, this is also why we didn't send the researchers, or part of the reasons, from the Global North 
into the field because we thought they would obscure the research context too much. That if people saw me, us walking around, they, they might have different kind of expectations about what uh, taking part in the research would mean for them, whether, um, whether there was some promise of, of development or people kept thinking, well, maybe, maybe through this contact, I'll have some opportunity for a job or for migration, or maybe this is some kind of donor. And, um, and so this was a challenge for us in, in, in the research that we had to con um, continually deal with. And even when we explained um, what are, what, what they were doing there, um, there was always this in the back of people's minds, this kind of hope that maybe something good would happen out of this, this contact. And um, also we, we wanted to um, compensate people for the time that they, they spent with us um, telling our stories or give them some kind of token of our appreciation. And it was, a, it was very challenging to think about what was an appropriate token something that didn't obscure the research or distort the research environment too much, but that was somehow valuable. We didn't want to give anyone money. We didn't want to give them anything sort of too uh, Western. Uh, and so we wound up, um, uh, I think, giving people um, local, locally popular food items. Um, uh, but that was also difficult. And it was a it was a challenge that we hadn't expected at the outset. And then there were these sort of power dynamics in the, the project and competing agendas. Some of them uh, starting from the funders really. So, so the funding we got, it was, it was British Council funding. It had to go directly to a, a higher, an institute of higher education in the UK. So it had to be used in a UK based university. But part of the funding, the requirement was that there was supposed to be some kind of international partnership. So you had to have these kind of partnerships. The data, the project was owned by the UK uh, Higher Education Institute. Uh, the people, you know, in the UK, we needed the research for our, for our professional development, for our publication uh, requirements. Um, and, and the Bangladeshi partners were interested in being part to, to um, be part of international uh, projects, to collaborate. And we relied on their expertise of, of the local context, of, of the local languages. The, the project wouldn't have been possible without uh, this kind of collaboration. And, and it was interesting when we went to the official documents about who owns what and who did what, the guidance said that people who were researchers and just collecting data, just collecting data, they weren't owners of the research. And, and we began to then struggle with this guidance and this idea, but how can they, how can it not also belong to them when their knowledge is essential for the, um, for the, um for for doing the project altogether so so that was a big challenge for us and so we we decided to just try and be as open and honest about our situations and our demands as as we could be and to constantly explore different opportunities for co-publication together and then there were the imbalances within the researchers and the research so um even though we had bangladeshi researchers they were people who were working at universities. They were based in the capital. Um, and, and of course, they were then outsiders in the rural contexts. And so there was this kind of dilemma as well. And, um, and, and they, uh, they had to work to gain the trust and rapport. And as, uh, uh, as uh, who, uh, the presenter just before me was saying, they were, they, they were well, rela uh, wound up using a mediator, someone in the uh, local community to help them um, kind of gain access to, to other people. Um, and they found that this kind of put them, I think, in, in interesting positions sometimes that, um, where they had to reflect on their own preconceptions and biases to be able to um, really have, um, 
yeah, to, 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 have, uh, to have good conversations with the uh, participants. And finally, around this, inf this, this issue of in uh, informed consent, we found it particularly difficult to follow the official guidelines here. And I drew on this, this article by Shamim and Qureshi who, who say, you know, look, these, these informed consent guidelines that were, they were, they were developed in the West, they're not appropriate in these kind of contexts. Um, there was a lot of suspicion about research. There was a lot of suspicion about signing a form among this um, participants. And so, um, so we wound up um, doing this orally and finding ways to communicate um, informed consent orally um, and, and kind of um, roughly interpreting these formal guidelines um, for this context. And so I do think that um, while it is important to get people's consent and trying to explain what we're trying to do with research, uh, I do think we need some more contextually appropriate accommodations uh, for, for um, criteria like these. When it came to publication and, and dissemination, there were other conflicts that came up, everyone wanted to be um, part of publications. We did um, find ways of co-authoring different types of, of publications together. Um, but again, um, and, and then there were the whole challenges of, of transferring our participants' voices to uh, written formal academic texts in English and the struggle to kind of uphold their dignity and to to, to tell their stories appropriately in a way. And, and what happened, particularly in the second project, is when we were trying to find out what was the role of English in people's stories of migration, they told us a lot more stories and very um, complex stories about migration. Uh, women told about being beaten or having a hot iron held to their skin for not following the directions. And so I felt a responsibility of sharing these stories. Um, I felt that people had trusted us with stories and that we had a responsibility to tell these stories. And although our data didn't wind up, it, they told, it told us a lot more than we initially sought out to find. And so um, we've tried to think of ways to share these studies, these stories more widely through blog pieces or um, uh, whatever. And here, here's a link to one um, that Kamaral and I wrote. Um, so that was another ethical challenge. Um, finally, I just would want to say, I think ideally one would do more participatory research in these, these contexts and not research on or research for, but research fit with, like Richard was talking about at the beginning. And, um, but, and, and we would have liked to go more in that direction, but we found it difficult. Um, it requires a time commitment. You would have to go back. Um, in the second field trip, um, there was the, one of the researchers found out that some of the people they had in, interviewed before had gone back to the Gulf or were no longer around anymore, moved on somewhere else. And so it wasn't always easy to um, have more than, than this one interview with somebody. Um, I think in, the, con in, in, in the, the research that we did for that project would be extremely challenging in this context of online in, in, during Corona. Um, but I do know people who have been talking about um, moving participatory research online and the particular challenges of that. My colleague, um, Gracia Imperiale, uh, in particular, has been working on that. If you're interested in that, that, that's in the references. And finally, I just kind of wanted to leave you with this researcher's pledge and these, these um, our commitments as researchers, as ethical researchers, to do no harm, to enable flourishing if we can. And sometimes I felt that just people telling their stories, having, ha having had somebody listen to them, can be a positive experience for them if they have 
uh, if they have um, an empathetic listener, um, it, it, it can be, and, and somebody really wants to tell a, sh a story, it can be, even that psychologically can be a good experience. And that our research is really about connection and, and that people and, and the planet come first, that, that people are more important than our data. Um, we have to put each other first, our, our relationships with our colleagues, our peers, our, our respect for each other, our respect for our participants. They have to be at the heart of what we're doing. And we um, I like this idea that we should be, be aware, be brave, and be, but be safe. We have to take care of ourselves. We can't put ourselves in, in situations that are too tough psychologically or physically or in dangerous. Um, and that research is really about learning. It's investing in our own learning and sharing this learning with other people. Um, prior prioritizing context and compassion and ma maintaining commitment, com being committed to, to also being reflected to, uh, reflective to changing your mind, to, um, to make different decisions if you're faced with a challenge. Um, and so again, these, these, Guidelines are in this toolkit, which is, is extremely useful. Finally, another research, resource that's open and free for you to access is this book that I, I edited in 2017. And there's several uh, studies in there of people doing research in difficult contexts. One uh, was uh, Grazia Imperiale, who did this, who's, who's done participatory research at a distance. Uh, she and I did a webinar about that um, also in this Corona time that is also free and available online. I'll leave that link with you. Yeah, finally, here's some of the resources I've referred to. I'm more than happy to pass these on. I'm sure, I hope that, you know, I'm happy for you to share the slides. Um, and I haven't looked at the time, but I think I'm within my my time and I'm happy to take questions now or in form of email. And yes, thank you again for the invitation and for giving me this time to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. We, are, we have just finished it within the time frame, actually. Um, so uh, we can take a few questions. Um, do you have any questions, please? Hello, sir. Can I have a question, sir? I have a question. Yeah, okay, just a second. Foreign, uh, very brief questions, foreign, relevant to the topic. Please. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Beth. Uh, I was wondering when you were talking about uh, participants' expectation, like uh, uh, there was a point of dis discussion. You said taking part uh, in the interview meant a potential loss of income for many participants. Uh, could you explain a little bit? Um, was it from the, uh, 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 from the, from the background of Bangladesh? Uh, 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 so in this, about really? in this, in, in our projects, so our projects were not about schools. They were about um, ideologies of, or I attitudes to English more widely in society. So um, in all, um, and the, the researchers had, traveled out to more rural areas to talk to people about the role of English in their lives. And, um, and uh, I mean, Saidur can also tell you about it, but they were interviewing rickshaw drivers, fishermen, cleaners, um, you know, hourly wage workers who, um, who, um, you know, donated their time and um, took time out of what they would be normally doing. And we were just aware of the fact that that their time in, meant a lot. I mean, everyone's time is valuable. And we okay. have to treat it like a rare resource in any research project. But in these particular contexts, you know, Maybe it meant a meal for this guy's children that evening. 
Okay, but but did you achieve your objectives of of your project, English in Actions? Uh, I um, this these this research was not part of English in Action. Okay. Um, Beth, can I just share some experience? Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the same place I visited yesterday. The place that we started working is a talk in Kapashia. So number of uh, ethical issues that Beth mentioned, uh, the, the challenges that we face. Somewhere we are the uh, researcher, we, we collected the data. So we face number of challenges that I can actually uh, tell you, like for example, uh, time invested. For example, uh, in two places, we hired two guides because, you know, they, the guide had, the local guide had better influence. And they were with us for almost like um, five days, morning to uh, evening. And some of them, like one of them were rickshaw pullers. So imagine that every day he is earning and then he's with us. Now, the ethical guideline that was given by Open University UK it was a little bit uh, different the way we thought in our local context. Uh, the thing that we can mention about their bit possibly hinted out the token of appreciation that we tried to compensate. But anyway, that was not enough for them. For example, Eric Shapular, who earned possibly uh, more than a thousand Bangladeshi taka a day and spending with us. So same thing goes to the participants because Many of the participants were like marginal uh, people. And uh, to be very honest, they're looking for token of appreciation in, in return to their participation. So this was one challenge that, of course, we overcome by the second project where we mentioned token of appreciation. Basically, we tried to give them some support for their children, like schools, supports, books, somewhere, uh, food, of course. Uh, this is one. And uh, another issue that uh, Porin, you mentioned, it was not part of Open University, uh, English in Action, actually. It was not English in Action. It was an independent research uh, sponsor possible by British Council. We are hired as a local researchers. So the experiences that uh, Beth mentioned, it was uh, the Bangladeshi researcher when we collected the data. Second one was very interesting where Beth mentioned. I was collecting data, especially with female participants. It was a serious challenge because we had to take it outside of the room, you understand, outside of the house, in the open field. So every time I was asking question, either the husband or the father is standing beside the person is answering. So the female voices were never heard. So suppose, for example, I asking, what's your age? And she was looking at husband. So husband could uh, give a manufactured date, you know, uh, please write down, it could be 30, 40, something like that. And she agreed, okay. So most of the time it was really difficult, but Part of the uh, creating report that Elizabeth mentioned, we, we had number of uh, uh, number of series or discussion with our lead team, uh, the bit. Uh, so we actually discuss all this thing how we can create a report. Uh, the first one that uh, um, attitude towards English that mentioned the first place was talk in Kapashia. Some of you saw every day I give a posting. So this is the place I got connected because of that project. Actually, we have a old home there. I still go back, I get connected to them. But the another one was in Lokhipur. Some of you know Lokhipur. It was really, really challenging. I, I believe still if we visit, it will be a challenge because people are so suspicious about our intention. And when we told that we are from Dhaka University, we just merely came to collect data. They couldn't believe us that these people came all the way from Dhaka just to collect data because uh, they were suspicious about NGOs involvement in the local area. They didn't trust the NGOs and we had to tell them we are not the NGO actually, we are independent researcher. So uh, uh, in our, uh, the, the report that uh, Elizabeth mentioned, which is available on the uh, UK uh, British Council public, uh, publication sites, you could see that we actually mentioned about all these challenges, how we overcome. So- uh, I just want to say, cause I've had a couple of questions about it. The, the goal of EIA that I put at the beginning of, of the, the project I, uh, at the presentation, I put that there because it was something that really got me thinking. 
um, in terms of the, the research that was conducted for EIA, all of that has been uh, published openly on their websites. Um, they had uh, formal criteria that they had to meet um, about reaching a certain number of schools and teachers um, that I think um, they will have reported about in those, um, uh, in those documents. Um, and I think in, in terms of, you know, the, the criteria and the way that these projects are framed within this context of, of DFID, the project was considered a success. Um, uh, uh, how it has changed the culture of English language teaching, is, I think is a bigger, a bigger question, but um, it certainly changed the, the landscape of ELT in Bangladesh, I think, and, um, and allowed a lot of us to connect and find each other. One question that I don't know whether uh, Beth, you'll be uh, giving the answer. Many people are asking, did the EIA project meet the goal of raising the standard that's of what English I just, in Bangladesh? I just tried to answer that. Yeah, that's the error. OK, yeah. right. OK. Any, any more questions, please? I just want to ask. Yeah, Hamid I asked Rahman. a question. Oh, Hamid Rahman, sorry. Then we'll I, give it to you. Well, as, it's in my experience, I was a consultant for LT. And one of the things yeah. that LTE and EIA yeah. I think thing to do is to address the question of examination system, which Porin referred to, and that has spoiled everything. Yeah. Yes, and unfortunately, we knew that when the project started. Um, but um, the idea was always, well, perhaps we can change assessment if, if it becomes clear that these approaches are successful. But often is so often the case that um, when, when teaching and assessment uh, strategies are not changed together, that the, 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 the interventions will not be wholly successful or as successful as they, they could be. Last question, Tasnima. Okay, okay, okay. Very briefly, so it's about uh, consent. So I was just thinking, uh, because I was doing a research on uh, online forum discussion. So it's a huge uh, online forum. So I cannot ask each of the teachers uh, well, for their consent. So I just plan to uh, leave a comment, uh, I mean, a post, Facebook post on that page that if you do not like to attend, uh, I mean, if you do not like me to use your data, please let me know. And I found very uh, low rate of response. So do I uh, need to say that they are fine with the consent so I can go with it? Because they didn't say they don't have any problem. I don't know. I mean, at our university, we have ethical, ethical advisors who I can phone and ask them things like this. You know, they and I think it, it's contextually different and what can be different, yeah. what can be accepted yeah. mm -hmm. can be different in different contexts. Okay. Um, I'll be I, and I think um, I, I, I don't know. I would hesitate to ad advise you uh, because I don't know the whole kind of data protection yeah, context situation. and all of that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, new All I can say is that I would, I mean, the principle that would guide me is to just try and do my best to be, be clear in my aims and, and to not trick anybody and to, um, to be as, I mean, maybe Sandisha, you, you know, something better that can, you can answer this. Well, actually, she already asked this question earlier with regards to the, uh, you know, when she was talking about the consent and everything. And I said the same thing that uh, even if you would take, I mean, even if you use the source, you have to actually, you know, mention the source and you tell them that, yes, it, I got this from there. So you have given them the kind of, you know, recognition of their work. 
So that no, I, it was about whether they can oh, opt out. Crazy. So you wanted yeah. to see that, you know, if you're not happy to be a part of my study, then please let me know. I think, I think a lot of us do that these days, also with photos at schools that, that, you know, at my children's school, they say, if you don't want your children to be photographed, then sign this form. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we assume that you're okay with it. Well, We've actually, done everything in our power to tell you what the situation is. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want but, to opt out, we respect that, but you have to then do you know, opt out. But, but mm -hmm. Elizabeth, then that is not, that is, I would not agree with that kind of a mode of working because honestly speaking, if as a parent, if I'm told that if you want to opt out, you need to sign this. And if I don't sign it, so you're taking a photograph of my child, for all you know, I might not have received that form. So right. that is right, correct. So the actual correct ethical way is you take the permission for taking the photograph. So technically, Tasneema should take the permission for doing that thing rather than taking permission for not doing it. So that would be my personal way of working, I would yeah, say. Yeah, the you. wording was a bit different. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We have to be very careful because there are possibilities where the person might not have understood. This is the reason why when I talked about online research, I made it very clear that you need to get somebody to explain to the other person what exactly is that what the person is going in for you know yeah, we just can't expect. I'm also planning to show them my total writing once it's ready so they can see and they can say okay no you want to use my data there is no mention of the names although just the forum the discussion in the forum uh, Dr. Akhtar don't ask people to opt out Ask people for their permission. That would be my personal suggestion. Uh, I don't know what Dr. Erling would agree to, but that. What do you think, Dr. Erling? It's always no. I mean, I think it's best. I think it's best. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Okay. I guess yeah. we can. Uh, sir, are we having breakout rooms at this moment, or uh, we have yes, taken we are having breakout room? rooms? Explain the breakout rooms to our participants. Okay. Thank you, sir. And, and I can do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, for a wonderful and engaging session. And we're going to show you your certificate. Esimatiku Rahman, I'm requesting you to show the certificate. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to talk about the breakout rooms. Uh, we are creating individual rooms where we can talk, uh, the participants can individually talk with the panelists, the speakers, and keynote speakers as well. So it will be a wonderful opportunity to converse with them, share our ideas with them, and also networking. So, and I know that tea is due. Uh, so in the next conference, when you come, we're going to serve tea twice, when we can arrange it physically. <laughs> okay. So, sir. Uh, we are having oh, another thing for time. I'll, I'll need some time. Um, I'm doing it manually, so give me okay. five minutes' time. Yes, and uh, we are going to need five minutes' time, and I'm going to cut short. We had 20 minutes' time allocated to breakout rooms, but I think it will be 15 because we have taken some extra time. Uh, so, thank you. So, it's like networking in breakout rooms. So. It just the, yes, we have five minutes, we can discuss. It's just the order and kind of discussion and then sharing your ideas. That's the way we can use the breakout rooms, actually. So Dr. Rahman and I are from, I'm from, from the same university. So it's the Dhaba yeah. kind of a mode. In JNU, we have this. It's a kind of, yeah. you know, hangout area <laughs> like Dhaba. A digital hangout areas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or chit chat. I think we, as sir, we'll need five minutes. We can chit chat. We can start the chit chat from here. <laughs> Why not? You can. You can. Yes. Yeah. And so, after, yes. Uh, Dipti, I would like to just kind of give a human touch to the entire uh, today's session because everybody is talking about everything to do with all these things of the topic. But I would like to share this with everybody in Bangladesh that not only are you getting the sun today, even in Delhi right now in we also got the sun today. So I was just thinking, oh, it's such a nice day. It's nice and sunny. So I'm glad that uh, I think initially uh, somebody had mentioned that Dhaka also had sun today because I believe it must be nice and wintry out there. How is it there in Do Dr. Smith? How is it there where you are? And Dr. Erling, how is it where you are? <laughs> well, you, you brought the sun to, to here because we need it because we, it's not very sunny here. But you, your presentation enlivened everything. So <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> at all of your presentations. Yeah. yeah, it's mostly cloudy, 12 degree in London. All right, we're going to send out all our positive vibes and make sure that it's nice and sunny tomorrow. So when you see the sun tomorrow, remember to solve Bangladesh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all right. you. Uh, yeah. Dr. Erling, how is it out there? Uh, terrible, terrible. It's cold. We haven't had sun in a long time. It's very cold. All right, so sending out sun to you too. Thank lots you. and lots of it. Thank you. So, Sandesa, you have got many sons, no? Many sons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many yeah. Sons. My, my name begins with, I in, I remember people would say, is it Sandesha? So, it's sun. <laughs> so, it's sun out there. <laughs> you have got multiple sons to distribute across the globe. Huh? That's yes. you, know, you know, Sandesha is a kind of Bengali sweet. Yes, sir. All the Bengalis, whenever they meet me, they say "san." It's "sandesha" means Sandesh. sweet. And when you when you meet the when you meet the non Bengalis, they will say "sandesha" means message because "sandesh" yeah. means message, and "sandesh" "sandesh" is the yeah. sweet. Yeah. So let us combine it and make it sweet message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I hope that we all have enjoyed all the talks of today uh, so far and the breakout room has been fun for all. I hope that too. I welcome you all to the second plenary session now. I would like to invite the session moderator Kuntala Shobnon Poroma, Assistant Professor, American International University, Bangladesh, for moderating the next session. Uh, sir, should we begin a little bit later because uh, people are coming back after the... Yes. Oh, okay. one thing I wanted to say, sir, I, I have learned so much. I, I, I know I have been part of the organizing team, but I did not expect that I will learn so much from the three sessions, uh, four sessions we have already attended. So thank you, sir, for organizing such a wonderful thank you, event. For, uh, Shukun, 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 maybe uh, we can start, uh, we can start. Sir is running out of time, uh, being late because of his Shukun, time. Shukun, please. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Okay. Thank yes, you. Okay. So, um, welcome to the uh, plenary session two with our uh, first speaker, Dr. Rakib Choudhury. Uh, Dr. Rakib Choudhury is an academic in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. He taught in the Department of English, University of Dhaka from 1997 to 2004, and then joined the Monash Faculty of Education in 2009, upon completing his PhD in 2008. Dr. Rakib has published extensively in the areas of TESOL and ELT, culture and pedagogy, international education, social justice, and identity. His current research focuses on social justice issues in education, family language policies, as well as higher education policy reforms. His upcoming book is entitled The Privatization of Higher Education in Post-Colonial Bangladesh, The Politics of Intervention and uh, sorry, uh, Control. Politics of Intervention and Control um, will be published by Routledge in 2021. Originally from Dhaka, Dr. Rakib has been living in Australia with his family for more than 20 years. So uh, I invite Dr. Rakib Choudhury with his um, talk uh, titled Knowing Thyself, the Pandemic as an Optimized Space for Metacognitive Learning for Graduate Researchers. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Parama. I just wanted to make sure about two things. Are we meant to take a five-minute break before the presentation, or do I start now? I think, uh, Rakib Bhai, you can continue. Uh, but I need okay. to see you, Saeed. I can't see you. Where are you? Oh, you want to see me? Okay, I'm here. Yes, of course. All right. Very good to see you. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so uh, thanks, everyone. I'd like to start by uh, reminding everyone that I'm speaking from Melbourne, Australia, and it's... Uh, it's 10.30 at night. Uh, it's very close to my bedtime. So if I, if I yawn, please forgive me. I've got a very good excuse. It's uh, 10.30. It's quite late at night, uh, but no excuse for you guys. If, if you um, yawn, I would take that as an, a response that registers your, <clears throat> your boredom. So uh, yeah, better keep that in mind. 
<laughs> I'd like to start by saying, uh, by acknowledging and thanking uh, the president of the TESOL Society of Bangladesh, uh, Professor Saidur Rahman, for inviting me uh, to present at the very first uh, um, International Virtual Research Conference uh, from the TESOL Society of Bangladesh. Uh, the convener of the conference, uh, Dr. Tasnima Akhtar, who of course uh, was the person behind the scenes making all of this happen, keeping uh, track of the correspondence and everything. So thank you very much, Tasnima. Great to see you here. Uh, Mr. Hamidul Haq, the vice uh, president of TISOL Society of Bangladesh and Poroma, of course, who uh, introduced me. And the last time I saw Poroma was in my class at Dhaka University. That must have been 15 years ago. You were in your first year then. Was it? Must have Rakib been. Uh, Rakib Bhai, Paroma is like, she opted to moderate. She has a request oh. that I want to moderate yeah. my teacher session. So I'm yeah. very glad we both are here. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Paroma. I'm, I'm really glad to know that. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Richard Smith. Uh, and it's, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to be here. So thank you very much for having me. Um, Saeed and uh, Tasnima and, and Poroma. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, just before moving on, I'd like to draw your attention to the cover page itself. Uh, on the left, you can probably see the virus, the ubiquitous image of the coronavirus uh, superimposed on the calendar. Yes. Uh, the hope is that in the coming months, the virus disappears gradually, fades away in the background, and the calendar becomes a bit more conspicuous. Um, so that wishing everyone at the beginning uh, a better 2021, a better next year. Uh, but the, the virus, the pandemic, is actually the context uh, against which the presentation is located. Uh, the presentation is about metacognitive learning or metacognition, and I know that uh, Tasnima herself has done some research uh, on uh, metacognition, and if I'm not wrong, her PhD is actually on metacognition. So it's not a new topic. Uh, there's plenty of research on metacognitive learning, metacognition itself, theoretically empirical studies, all of that. Uh, perhaps what is new about the presentation is the juxtaposition and the contextualization of metacognition and metacognitive learning uh, in the situatedness of this global pandemic. So kind of metacognitive awareness uh, and the role of the pandemic uh, as one that can actually optimize and enhance metacognitive learning. That is what the pre presentation is about. And just to put up a little bit of context, the presentation would focus on graduate researchers. And I believe most of you here are doing your master's or you've finished your master's. Some of you are probably doing your PhD. Others may have finished your PhD. Some of you certainly have. Uh, done that and bring in a lot of experience. I'll start with a quote, and this is from my colleague, uh, Professor Neil Selwyn from the Faculty of Education at Monash uh, <coughs> University. I'm just moving around the video on one side. I'll just read out just a little bit of this uh, quote from, uh, he, uh, is, Neil is the, um, the author of uh, the book very interestingly titled, Should Robots Replace Teachers? Uh, AI, that's artificial intelligence, the future of education. So he says, I hope that one of the educational legacies of COVID-19 uh, is uh, more, I need to move this. Um, I'm sorry about this. I'll just move the video pod. Um, All right, here we are. Uh, is a more realistic conversation about the limits of digital technology and education. And the past few years have seen growing enthusiasms for online education, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, these technologies definitely have their place. But now that everyone has firsthand experience of a mass shift to online learning, we should all be aware of the many practical problems that lie behind what he calls this hype of over-reliance on technology in the context of the pandemic. So the fact that we're using Zoom right now is fantastic. Where would we be without Zoom, right? Uh, but there are problems with that, and that's what I'll talk about. Uh, he continues saying there is something irreplaceable about students and teachers coming together to learn in person, you know, the physicality of the classroom. 
And who doesn't know that? Don't we miss the real classroom? I don't know how it is at the moment in Bangladesh, but the last time I had uh, a lesson in a real classroom was in February, and that was in Brunei, at a university in Brunei. And, you know, it's been a, an entire year that I haven't been in a classroom. So uh, Neil is really talking about technology and the need for it, but also kind of that skeptical, cautious uh, kind of approach to uh, technology. So uh, these are two uh, images that uh, you'd probably be familiar with, unless if you were born in the last 10, 15 years, uh, like my children. So uh, these are the technologies that no longer have a place in our life. You know, we have a cassette tape, we have a floppy disk. When I was doing my uh, studies in the Department of English at uh, Dhaka University, uh, I used to have a Walkman. I still have it. I don't play it. I don't need to play it. We didn't have floppy disks. Uh, we didn't need floppy disks. Uh, we went to Nilketh or we went to the photocopier at the front of the arts building. Uh, we, we would borrow books from the seminar library and Wahid Bhai would, would allow us to have them out of the library for no more than two hours because, you know, we just had to return them. So you photocopy, you return, and that's all you have. Uh, no computers, no mobile phones. We never heard of floppy disks. When I came to study for my second master's at Monash University 2000, floppy disks were amazing. 1.4 megabytes of space where you can save anything and you can just carry it with you in your pocket. By the time I went back to Monash for my master's, four years later, 2004, you know, floppy disks were gone. Um, we had USB sticks. <clears throat> Fast forward another four or five years, <clears throat> Uh, now, no one use USB disks either. Uh, I mean, you don't have to because you have cloud storage, Google Drive, you know, Dropbox, whatever you call it. So this is all fantastic. And uh, it just makes uh, learning easier. It makes teaching easier. It makes doing research easier. Um, but, you know, th there is a problem here because easier, does that really mean better? Easier or more comfortable, but does that actually make things more optimal uh, for our learning? Uh, and to explain what's happening here, uh, I'll just show you this image of four classrooms. Um, so we have classrooms where there is a high challenge or you know, the tasks are difficult and low challenge. And then we have classrooms where the teacher has high support or scaffolding, if I use Brunner's term, and then low support. So if you look at the class on the bottom right, a classroom with low challenge and low support this would be a boring class. Uh, there is no push to learn and there is little support from the teacher. So zone of boredom. <laughs> this classroom here on the left, bottom left, low challenge, high support. It would be a zone of comfort because the teacher is giving you a lot more support than you actually need. Top right, high challenge, low support, zone of frustration. So we have zone of comfort, zone of uh, boredom, zone of frustration. And then we have the fourth class, which is high support and high challenge. Tasks are very difficult, but you're also getting a lot of support from the teacher. This is the zone of proximal development, uh, if I use Vygotsky. So the point I'm trying to make here is that technology is good. Don't take me wrong. We do need technology. Um, I didn't realize we needed floppy disks when I was doing my master's. I only realized that when I was doing my second master's and then a USB when I was doing my PhD. But uh, people before that, uh, they did PhDs, they did masters, they didn't need the technology. So technology is good, but there is something of an issue when things become too easy. Because what happens is when you lower the challenge and when we become more comfortable, that is when we don't learn as much as we could when the challenge is high. In other words, if I just want to summarize this part of the conversation, if there is little challenge, if we are too comfortable, we don't learn as much as we can when there is high challenge. So technology is good, but in some ways technology makes us feel comfortable. Technology makes us feel complacent. We don't have to memorize things. We don't have to remember things because everything is just one click away. <coughs> and that is a problem. Uh, and the, the, from my anecdotal observation of research that has been done in the last seven, eight, nine months uh, since the pandemic started and, you know, the, st the world started locking down all over, all over continents and across countries, 
uh, is that most of these were focusing, most of the research uh, that was published during this time was focused on technology, optimizing technology, better use of technology. I've seen at least five articles written on Zoom itself, just the technology of Zoom and how to use it better and to integrate classes and to make them more inclusive and all of that. So there's too much emphasis on technology. Um, and, and at the other end, we have, you know, it's, it's really about looking inside. Is technology really all? Of course <coughs> it is. And you know that. There's nothing new about that. But the, what I'll be showing you is that in some ways, um, the, if anything, uh, the pandemic has shown us is that, you know, uh, there is a lot of value in trying to learn about ourselves in ways that, uh, are only possible during uh, unprecedented times such as the pandemic. I have an entire paper written on the theories uh, of metacognitive learning in the context of COVID-19, which is coming up in the next couple of months. Um, but I will not go through a lot uh, of the theories in this presentation. Uh, instead, I will focus on two studies and talk about some of the experiences from my own PhD students. Uh, three of them actually at Monash University. So today we are looking at looking inside, not outside. So in other words, looking at how we learn, which is metacognition, rather than outside, which is technology. And what I call HOTS for HOTS, uh, I'll come to that in a few slides. Uh, the less is more approach. And by more, I mean, you know, being overwhelmed by technology and by less means kind of being a bit off grid, looking inside, you know, introspection, which is really what uh, metacognition is about. So that is what I'll be discussing about. Um, so I'll go through the next couple of slides rather quickly because these are more theories and you can just read about them. And uh, I will be sure to send Tasnima a copy of my published paper uh, where all these theories uh, are discussed. So metacognition literally means beyond cognition. So thinking about thinking, cognition about cognition, knowing about knowing. So it's kind of, it is reflective in some way. It is, it is kind of looking inside. It is kind of self-critique, uh, but it is also a study of memory monitoring. It's about looking at how your own memory works. Uh, and that ties um, us to the other uh, dimension of metacognition, which is metacognitive regulation, uh, regulation. So you have metacognitive knowledge, which is to know how you learn. Um, but the second is metacognitive regulation, which is about what you do about your knowledge of how you learn. And between this knowing and this doing, there is a discontinuity sometimes. Sometimes we know how we learn, but we don't do anything to optimize that. Sometimes we know how we don't learn and we don't do anything to prevent that. So, you know, that, that discontinuity between the knowing and doing uh, is, is what we need to sort of make more alignment between uh, just for, for um, better learning and teaching outcomes. Uh, SLR or self-regulated learning is another aspect very closely tied to metacognition. Uh, and it's again, it's about monitoring your own comprehension, understanding and assessment of your own abilities without external help. So that could be teacher, that could be a, a peer, that could be your parents in case of young learners, etc. But perhaps most importantly, metacognition and self-regulated learning uh, provides us with an opportunity for self-assessment. Now we are familiar with two types of assessment assessment of learning or the summative assessment, which is formal, which is institutional, uh, which is sort of, um, uh, it comes in the form of a grade. Uh, it's usually quantifiable. Uh, it's usually in the form of a report. Uh, it's usually at the end of a term. So all these formal assessment that we have, summative assessment. Assessment for learning is the more informal one, is the ongoing one, is the one where we try to, um, understand what our students are learning, what they're not learning, what their difficulties are. So this is the informal one. But there is a third type of assessment and that is assessment or self-assessment as learning where the learning and the assessment are inseparable and that's where metacognition comes in. So the argument I'm trying to make in this presentation is that Although we all have metacognitive knowledge, uh, perhaps when it comes to regulation of our behavior to optimize and calibrate our metacognitive abilities, we probably don't do as much as we could. Uh, and so I'm saying metacognition works best 
if it is deliberate, purposive and systematic, uh, rather than intuitive and unconscious or something that we don't really pay much attention to. Uh, and it, is, it can be represented uh, in a cycle uh, which starts with experiencing. Uh, and when I'm talking about experiences, I'm talking about experiencing what we learn, how we learn, how we don't learn, what helps us learn, what doesn't help us learn. So that's experiencing all of that uh, in formal spaces, in informal spaces, out of school, etc. And then reflection followed by formalizing. This is the tricky part. So this is where we actually do something about it and then deciding how to incorporate improvements. And then it goes on and on and on. So that's the cycle uh, that metacognition uh, involves. How do we do that? A, a process in which a person ac actively searches for relationships and patterns to resolve contradictions or to bring coherence out of, out of a set of experiences of teaching and learning. Um, so it's really looking at patterns of how you work best and what things work for you, what things don't work for you. So it's kind of part psychology, it's part pedagogy, self-assessment, it's part reflection, introspection, all of these things bound together. Um, as a result of this, we self-create a learning environment uh, that supports the development of metacognitive skills. So think about COVID-19, think about the closure of schools, think about learning at home, think about your yourself, um, perhaps your children if you have any. Think about what you've been doing the last six or seven months. You know, the, the physicality of your environment was different. The resources available to you were different. The logistics were different. Did we just try to fit with all that we had around us? Or did we actually make adjustments to our own ways to interact with, you know, the, uh, the affordances all around us? So we all do it already to different degrees, but do we really do? So I'll ask you a series of questions to think about. I'd like you to consider these statements and try to see whether some of these relate to you. So the first one, I learn or I study or I read or I write best when I have coffee, right? What do you think? Some of you would probably be able to relate with that. You need, you need your cup of coffee, just like I have mine here. Or I learn best when I'm not chatting on Facebook Messenger. That's probably obvious. I learn best when I'm listening to soft music or late at night or in comfortable weather or when it's quiet or when I have music in my background. Or I learn best when I read an article twice, highlight text using different colors, take notes, underline quotes to use in my writing, right? So if you think about it, we already have that metacognitive awareness or the knowledge uh, the next thing to do is to have metacognitive regulation. Uh, and that is what I'm saying needs to be deliberate and systematic rather than intuitive and habitual or subconscious. Why do we need metacognitive learning? Because it shapes active rather than passive learners. It gives learners a sense of control over learning. So, you know, it's really about empowerment. Uh, it's about uh, your own ability, your, your sense of what you're able to do. It promotes deep learning, and we'll look at that probably in the next slide. And it promotes uh, HOTS, and that's the, the first HOTS in the HOTS, four HOTS model that I'm, I'm going to talk about. So we are talking about higher order thinking skills as opposed to lower order thinking skills. Um, and some of you would be familiar, I'm sure most of you would be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, the original one and the revised one. So you have the lower order thinking skills all the way up to six, level six. We have creating, which is the highest level of, uh, of uh, cognitive ability. And I know there are critics of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, it is not precise science, but then again, you know, within the context of social sciences and cognitive behaviorism, this is one way of looking at the, the hierarchy of cognition. Uh, so HOTS or higher order thinking skills are the need for learners to go beyond the, <clears throat> the mere recall of factual information. So just remembering, which is the low level, to develop a deeper understanding of topics, to be more critical about evidence, you know, to solve problems, to think flexibly, to make reasoned judgments and decisions. 
etc. So from the lower order to the higher order. So this is the second hot, the higher order thinking students. So I'm talking about graduate students. Think about, generally speaking, a student at primary school and then at high school and then, you know, undergraduate and then doing a graduate degree like a master's degree and then following on to perhaps a PhD or an MPhil. Generally speaking, regardless of the topic, there are ways in which cognition develops. And I'm, I'm not talking about in a very psycholinguistic or psychological way, but in the, you know, even if you think about the tasks that we are meant to do, description is probably easier than comparison. And then comparison is easier than <clears throat> critical reflection. And then creating something is even more difficult. So that's the hierarchy. That's the Bloom's taxonomy of order. So when we talk about higher order thinking skills and we talk about higher order thinking students, perhaps there is an alignment. So if you look at what Perkins shows from the tacit learner to the aware learner, to the strategic learner, to the reflective learner, you can probably show a correspondence between learners from primary school to high school going on to university and graduate studies and all of that. <clears throat> at the graduate level, you're, you're expected to be critical and reflective uh, and creative to a degree perhaps that is much higher than what you would be expected to do at the undergraduate level or at the university level. So keeping with that hierarchy of cognitive development, uh, it is the cultivation of higher order thinking skills that the higher order thinking students need to develop and metacognition, uh, as opposed to reliance on technology, uh, is an approach that I'm, uh, I'm asking you to consider. So we look at two studies, and then I'll talk about my students, and I'll be done. Paroma, tell me when I have about 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> I have less than 10 minutes. You are left with five minutes. <laughs> oh, my God. I better, I better rush. Okay. It's your fault, Paroma. You didn't tell me. Or what you didn't tell you, but I send you a message. Chat box. I, I, who's looking at messages? I'm, I'm just reading from the slide. Anyway, thank you. I, I'll try to be quick. So uh, two studies. Um, the first one, <laughs> the first one is about use of metacognitive strategies, but by, by Chinese PhD students. A longitudinal study uh, involving six uh, Chinese PhD students in Australia. Uh, these are the findings. Sorry for rushing through the slides. Uh, but I'll probably just uh, go very quickly. If you look at that red font in the middle, it says metacognitive strategies are universal in nature. Um, so uh, it's not something that is, um, that is distinctive with Bangladeshis as opposed to Australians, this being an Australian study of Chinese, etc. cetera. It's, it's all the same. But the recommendation is that supervisors are an important source of strategies uh, by the simple fact that they are more sort of in a position where they are intellectually uh, at least expected to be more um, sort of advanced um, uh, than their students. The second study is a large uh, quantitative survey based, based study of more than 2000 PhD students uh, in Australia again. Uh, and uh, these are some of the findings. And if you look at that red font here, uh, just because we don't have enough time, intuitive metacognition is not always helpful. So if you think you are metacognitively aware, you might actually be deeply flawed <clears throat> or you can only be partly appropriate. And there are three dimensions that the study recommends every learner to look at. Some of the quotes from the second study are those of frustration and you know messages where PhD students are talking about giving up uh, and you know sort of uh, feeling depressed and isolated, lacking motivation, disappointment, depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, some of the students also said that the metacognition that they could develop through their PhD studies also enabled them to become more independent thinkers. And the last quote here is from a participant who said, I actually am enjoying it so much. I don't want to ever finish my PhD. I just want it to be going. I'm just enjoying it. So just mixed bag of feelings. 
Uh, views of supervisors, once again, uh, I'll skip this, but the role again is also um, for the supervisor to do something. Uh, so here is the last part of my presentation. Uh, and uh, for Omai, if you can give me three or four minutes, I promise I'll finish. Uh, at the moment, I'm supervising eight PhD uh, students and uh, it's a mix of local and international students, uh, but probably significantly for this presentation, two of them are actively collecting data uh, in this global pandemic. Uh, and they are both in Australia and they are both collecting data outside Australia. And in one case, they actually started collecting data right before the travel restrictions. So they were all stuck in Australia and they had to make adjustments for their data collection. These are stories from three, uh, three PhD students. Here's the first one. She also sent me a photo of the parsley growing in her backyard. And she's talking about all these social realities around her. That was once an annoyance, but she learned to use that uh, as positive sources of energy to draw on uh, and to change her ways of thinking and writing and go through that uh, period of isolation. I'm just going very quickly because um, you'll probably kick me out anyway. So. Here's the second one. Uh, my second PhD student was stuck in China when she even started, she couldn't come here. And, you know, just the fact that there was uh, an absence of the academic community around her uh, made her feel isolated and she was frustrated. She wanted to give her, if you look at some of these uh, quotes here, the one here, um, I found academic research is looking at one drop of water in an endless ocean. And then I recognized that the world is much bigger than I thought, et cetera, et cetera. So again, period of frustration. Third student uh, from Indonesia, she also sent me this image and she said that image says it all. Uh, she even gave a title to our reflection, the unknown unlocked. And they said there are literally millions of ways that a PhD project can go south in normal times whenever I lost my focus I turn to my left and there's a colleague busy with their report or to my right where a colleague was typing a manuscript. But at home, I did not feel this spirit, she says. So here is a fourth PhD student. Uh, this is a PhD student who hates his PhD. And in this case, I can reveal the student's name because I have permission. That is me. A year before I submitted my PhD thesis, and I'm saying I had PhD. And uh, this is just an image. It was staged, of course. I asked my um, office mate to capture this image. It is staged, but it represents exactly how I felt a year before I submitted my PhD, because it was an impossible task, and I was almost giving up. So now that I've finished, it's easy to tell you about all these theories and all of that, and even metacognition and all of that. But um, there is no pretending. There is no way of denying that we all go through such phases. And um, the best way of learning is not relying on technology, but actually looking inside. Uh, so where do you go? Just wrapping up here. Um, so being metacognitively aware uh, in a deliberate and systematic way, not in an intuitive way getting out of the comfort zone, because if you look at Mariani's quadrant, too much comfort, too much ease, whether it comes from technology or uh, you know, air conditioner is not a good thing. It's, it's actually good to push ourselves and that probably makes us do our best. Again, Vygotsky and zone of proximal development, try something new, et cetera. And you're better than you think, but if you don't do some of these, you will never know it. And just to wrap up the, the last two sentences from my article that I said I would share with Tasneem, I'll just read it out and that's it. Uh, perhaps then it is time for us to move away from an over-reliance on technology during these isolating times. Perhaps it is wiser to explore deeply into ways in which we learn best. Perhaps the best use we can make of these times is by resorting to what had worked best for us before technology took over, by looking into and questioning our own practices and ways of learning, perhaps the best way to learn is by unlearning what we've learned and by learning how to learn anew. Thank you and sorry for taking too much time. Thank you, Parama. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. Uh, now we should proceed to the question answer session. I think it, 
we have to make it a little short. So uh, questions, please. We are welcoming questions at this point. I'll just uh, one question to occupy on a very personal note. So you, you mentioned, was it in 2007 you wrote, I hated PhD? Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's a coincidence, uh, Saeed, but uh, it was on the exact uh, day 11th of September 2007, which was exactly a year before I submitted, which was 2008, 11 September. Now, yes. How is it, now, how, how is your experience supervising the PhDs now? You hate it as a student. Now you supervise. So do you hate uh, supervising or... Uh, not at all. In fact, um, I, I often tell my supervisees that uh, I learn from them almost as much as they say they learn from me. And I think any supervisor would be able to uh, agree with that, including yourself, um, Said, because there's so much to learn. And, and we're not just talking about theories, but about life and learning and, and cultures and histories and, of course, theories and studies and all of that. But um, I think one of the benefits that that supervisors have, you know, uh, in, in a way that is um, unavoidable is that we've already done one PhD and, you know, our students haven't. So, you know, it's an advantage, but also a privilege. Uh, but it's a privilege, not in a way because we know how they feel, because that saying that would be patronizing, uh, but rather saying that we can empathize with them and perhaps we can, we can, feel how they feel without them verbalizing, without them telling us, because we've been there as well. And as much as we might pretend everything went well, I don't feel ashamed to say I once thought I hate PhD and I'm fine with that. Okay, questions, please. Kuntala, Shabnam, anybody? Yeah, I, uh, I think I have a quick question for you, sir. Uh, since I'm also doing my graduate studies, uh, postgraduate studies, actually, uh, currently. So uh, initially, it was a good feeling uh, during the pandemic that uh, we are studying from home. It's, uh, it's better and we don't have to wake up early and uh, stuff like that. But uh, at a certain point, it I mean, the feeling came like, uh, okay, how long are we going to get stuck at home? I mean, this this feeling is kind of claustrophobic. And uh, we also uh, kind of um, missed the peer pressure that we used to get in our office working together. Yeah. So uh, how do you uh, evaluate the, that feeling? Yeah. Uh, Paroma, that's actually a very good question. And as I just said a little while ago, I, I do understand what you're saying. Uh, I've been through that. Uh, I'm not pretending everything was fine with me. Uh, I've, I've been through all of that and that is natural. I think I'll just say that once again, that um, being, and I see that as a life philosophy, Paroma, not just about studies. As a person, I, I believe, and I've tried to imbibe that kind of value to my children who are now adults that comfort isn't good, luxury isn't good, um, you know, being idle isn't good. If you, if you want to do better, and I'm not, you know, I mean, we are teachers here, we are academics. So when we say doing better, it means publishing more, teaching better, et cetera, doing a PhD, et cetera. But, you know, that applies to everyone, even outside academia. If you want to do well, if you want to be more productive, uh, it's good to get out of your comfort zone, uh, sort of um, almost deliberately choose to be less comfortable or feel a bit uh, dis feel a bit of a discomfort uh, and shun kind of luxury or whatever is easier and that would probably bring out uh, parts of you that otherwise wouldn't so parama going through that uh, that as you said claustrophobic and suffocating environment that forced us to stay inside and there's no peer pressure all of that is it possible, and I'm not offering a magic solution, but is it possible to actually see that as an incentive for you to reinvent yourself? I know I'm being vague because I'm not telling you exactly what to do, 
or to see it as a challenge and to say, all right, things that I can't do simply because I'm killing three hours of my day, commuting to the university and back, I now have three hours extra. So what I'll do is I'll wake up late. I, I don't have to wear my lipstick and makeup for others to see me. And I will use that extra time either to study or to do something that I can't do normally. So it is actually possible to see something good out of all the you know, impositions uh, that were sort of put on us um, by the pandemic. So it, it's about, um, I, I'm talking a bit philosophically rather than pragmatically, but again, it's really about metacognition. If I ask you, what have you learned about yourself during the, during the pandemic? I'm sure you'll be able to, we will all be able to say something. Uh, but the point is, are we doing something about further enhancing uh, what we discovered within us that, is, that can be powerful? So that's sort of how I would uh, respond to your question, Paroma. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Um, any other questions? Of course, Cheryl's appreciation is like after uh, working on metacognition for five years, it's really wonderful to listen on metacognition and from you. And especially, I haven't thought about uh, researchers' metacognition. It was mine. I mean, mine was uh, learners, listeners' metacognition. So it's really wonderful to listen about researchers' metacognition, even teachers, maybe. Thank you, Dasnima. I'm really glad to know that because I went through your uh, publication list, I think this morning, and I was oh, thank you. Pleased to see that I had actually chosen a topic that is actually, you're the expert in it. Uh, it's really not my area. It's, oh. uh, it's, I haven't written about it until this, this new. So, you know, maybe sometime we'll catch up and write something together, but thank you, Dasnima. Thank you so much for, yeah, for the offer, sir. I'm glad. Um, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, your wonderful presentation. I learned a lot of stuff. And uh, interestingly, exactly this time last year, I was in your city right now. So oh. this, it's very good to hear that you're from Melbourne. And thank you for having your coffee. And I think you didn't need to keep us awake. We were really enjoying it. Uh, just quickly, yeah. one uh, one observation that I had, or uh, one comment that I wanted to make was that, like you were talking about all your PhD students, and obviously all of us who are faculty, all of us who are here right now, we are actually being more than teachers. We are actually not only sharing our, about our own experiences, our own frustrations, like you talked about hating PhD, because of various reasons, because of the, you know, only when, when we have gone through that phase in our life, can we understand why our students, young men, young women, because you know, men have their own issues, women have their own issues, the kind of pressure, because everybody does not understand what goes into, you know, why is your PhD taking to, so much of time? Mm, so yeah. uh, one thing is that, one thing is that as faculty right now, during this entire pandemic, while our students were, wherever they were, they could not, maybe even if they were trying, they were not able to, you know, get access to the, uh, you know, uh, through their uh, informants of the participant, whoever they were ha having to interview. So one of the things that I made them do is I told them, uh, like, you know, looking at the 21st century life skills, think out of the box, be creative, exactly like how you were talking about. I told them, even if you can't do research in your main topic, look at something which is connected to your topic. Look at something, how you can help your environment, your people. You know, even if you're in Uttarakhand, you're in a remote area, maybe in your own language, you could teach them about how to, you know, get out of this, uh, how to take care of themselves during this entire COVID situation. Uh, so these Dr. small little things. Sandesha, yes. uh, I think... We need to uh, stop yeah, here. Sorry, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> we need to stop I'll, I'll here. I'd just like to uh, very quickly, uh, uh, Shadesha, I'd really like to thank you and um, uh, just like to say, I, I'm sure your students are privileged to have someone like you who's thinking, you know, encouraging them to think outside the box. But thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we'll catch up sometime. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Thank you, sir. And uh, we have a certificate for you on behalf of the Soul Society of Bangladesh. And while the certificate is being shown, I would like to make just one comment on your session. You were talking about using less technology. This is something, you know, the 
status of the english education in academia is always questioned that okay is it uh, i mean relevant enough we're always thinking that okay is english relevant enough i always feel that yes we get plethora of technology every day it's coming and coming and coming but how do we consume it that is something we need to learn through this kind of education which english can provide so thank you sir it was a wonderful thank opportunity you. Deepthi, thank you so much. And I just wanted to say, don't get me wrong, anyone. I'm not saying technology isn't good or whatever. I have my mobile phone right in front of me and all of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, over-reliance isn't a good thing, as Deepthi has pointed out. And it's good, but it makes us comfortable. You know, it's, for anything, we have Wikipedia and Google, so we don't have to remember anything. And that comfort actually blunts us. You know, it doesn't make us do as much as we could. That's all I'm saying. But technology is wonderful. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, Tasnima, thank you for the certificate. How do I get it? How do I actually get it? We'll send, send it to you, sir. Send me an email. All right. Okay. We'll yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay. Without any further ado, I'm going to invite Dr. Asifa Sultana, Associate Professor, Department of English and Humanities, Brack University, to uh, introduce the uh, next speaker and the session. Dr. Asifa Sultana, she will be the moderate of, moderator of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dipti. Um, okay, I welcome you all to the uh, second plenary session of the second second uh, session plenary uh, session of the second session of the first day of the international conference. Um, so um, I would like to just um, just to uh, just repeat what you are already probably familiar with. So we'll take all the questions towards the end. You can write them in the chat box, or you can uh, you know say them um, uh, to the speaker. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker of the session. Um, I would like to welcome. Um, professor Dr. Niladri Shekhar Dash. Uh, Dr. Niladri Shekhar Dash is a professor and head uh, linguistic, at the Re Linguistic Research Unit, uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. He works in the areas of corpus linguistics and language technology, language documentation and digitiz digitization, computational lexicography, computer assisted language learning, digital ethnography. He is a visiting fellow of the British Academy, UK. University of Reading, UK, and University of Oxford, UK. He has published 17 books and 260 research papers in international and national, con international, and national journals, anthologies, and conference proceedings. Um, I now welcome Dr. Niladri Shekhar Dash, and I request he, he, him to start the session. So can you hear me? Uh, yes. Am I audible? Okay, okay fine. Yes, so, yes. Uh, so first, the formalities. I'm really thankful to uh, Saidurji, Tasnima, and other people who are there in the organizing team for giving me an opportunity or asking me to share some of my ideas about ELT and English language teaching here. So <clears throat> in this uh, uh, challenging situation, uh, today's talk uh, is basically I'm sharing some of my ideas and the strategy we adopted uh, for an experimental survey or study here in West Bengal. And we call it a cell system given a new name. The project is not yet over. We work with the primary learners who are learning language, early stage of learning language, very at the early stage. And what are the outcomes we came across with from these experiments? I'll share those information here. Only since I have got only half an hour's time, so I won't elaborate into details, but I'll give, there are 32 sites altogether here, but the whole thing is something much bigger than this. So uh, I will share these slides, those who are interested who can share these slides. Also, I can skip because of the limitations of time given to me, I can skip this also. So I'll try to be a little logical and systematic and give some basic seed ideas about the whole situation and also put up some challenges for the new generation of scholars, the research component, who can, uh, the new scholars can take up. Because I assume that the situation here in Bangladesh as well as in West Bengal are more or less same. So here, so let me start. The reality, no fantasy please. So I'm not talking about anything fantastic. I'm talking about a reality that this is the state where English is reintroduced 
at the primary level after 25 years. This is the situation in West Bengal. Nearly three or four years back, English was reintroduced at the primary level after 25 years. Keep in mind. And there is no book available to be used as textbook for the learners. There is no ELT resources like war books, dictionaries, study materials, reference materials, which can be used as teaching aids. There is no trained ELT teacher to teach at the grassroots level. And there is no academic support of any kind from the earlier generation. Keep in mind, there is a long gap of 25 years. The entire two generations didn't get any opportunity to learn English. And I know two of my close relatives committed suicide just because they couldn't learn English, although they had a beautiful results at the secondary level. And they couldn't cope up with these English medium schools at the colleges, advanced colleges. So this is the situation that actually helped us or triggered us to look into the problem and study and make an experiment that is it possible that in this situation, how we can teach English to the learned primary level. So practically and research questions were like that. Learner's mother tongue is Bangla. This is a practical situation for us. English to be taught as a second language to them. What should be our strategy for teaching English in this context? I'm putting this question to all of you. Think seriously, what would be your strategy then? What should be the syllabus, test books, reference books, dictionaries, guidebooks, and other resources? So there are a lot of issues, a lot of questions, a lot of problems are actually uh, present before us. How these are to be utilized for developing learners as a competent users of English? Who will be teaching English to those learners? And how, what would be the methodology what is the strategy to teach so that the learners can learn English and somehow can develop certain level of competence to communicate with each other or in a higher level? How modern language technology techniques, tools or resources can be utilized? So these are the practicality and research questions. Our strategy, catching a wild cruise. So our strategy was something very, I'm just giving you the brief. We used a new strategy for developing the ELT interface in such a way that learners are able to learn English better than traditional method. This was a very clear goal that we should have a very useful strategy so the learners can learn better. At least at the initial stage, learners learn English in their own ways through direct utilization of assistance of their mother tongue. Since nobody, not even the teachers, tutors, parents or experts are available is there to help them in learning English. Learners have to do help themselves and nobody else. And we can help support them or we can give all possible assistance in the whole effort. It is a combination of corpus based, data driven, multimodal and blended learning methodology. So we have utilized many of the properties of corpus linguistics, data driven approaches to language learning, multimodal as well as blended learning. We have used those approaches. It is an experimental one, learner oriented, entirely the whole process is controlled by the learners by themselves. We are just helping hands, uh, uh, giving certain amount of support, learner oriented, highly customizable facilities and research group method. We named it self-help English language learning system. So we call it a cell system. Our traditional method was something like this. Look at the picture. And our goal is we should have a proposed system, something like this, where learners would be there, would be learning the whole schemes or systems of learning of the English of their own. And there would be a teacher, which is called the helper uh, person who will be assisting the learners. So the new journey for us is that it is based primarily on practical constraints. We used it for developing text materials for the new generations of learners. Learners are mostly first generation learners. There is another important question that most of the learners who are included in this experiment are the first generation learners. They learn English for the first time in life at the very early stage at the primary level. Learners have minimum linguistic efficiency in the first language. First language are Bangla and they have certain amount of skill or efficiency in their language. They now learn English as a second language. Learners do not receive any academic help or support from their parents in learning English. They got some passive help 
from the teaching teachers during school hours. Timing, taming these wild horses with the bridle of ELT is a challenge for us. Our cell system shows we can achieve it. Now, these are the basic features. Learners are the main protagonist. A teacher has a partial role. She just has to assist or monitor. Textbooks are made in the form of the graded syllabus for us with data and information from English language, language corpora we have taken. A lot of support from English language corpora, but particularly British English language corpora. And both audio and video text, sorry, audio text and written text are taken for our survey or our experiment. We designed the separate textbooks for grade one to grade four or grade five or six. So you can have multiple grades of text materials ready for the learners. Text samples included the graded textbooks are carefully selected based on their merits and relevance of particular grades. Original English texts from different domains of actual empirical use are selected, keeping in mind the standard of the uh, grades of the learners. So there are some other features. I won't go into details, so one can go through that. I'll just mention one experiment that had a, uh, excellent features. Of Achha, this is a case study, skeleton. Our goal, teaching English vowels. I'm for experiment of this. I'm talking about only how we have succeeded in teaching vowels to the learners without the help of the teachers. Target learners are primary students, mother tongue Bangla, mode of teaching through mother tongue. Media from instruction was also Bangla. Manner of teaching was highly interactive. Instrument we used is a desktop computer. Role of the student is an active. He was or she was actually operating the whole system or learning. Role of the teacher was pressing. Duration was for one hour. The curtain measure, we completed the pronunciation module for English vowels with inputs from speech corpora of the British English. First thing was that we used the speech corpora of the British English and developed the interface about the pronunciation variations of all the vowels used in British English. We devised a learning interface based on the CALT, that is Computer Assisted Language Technology Device. We used that system so that the learners utilize the device in a classroom situation with minimum assistance of the teachers. The resource and the device help learners to master the orthographic form and pronunciation of English vowels. The module works efficiently, effectively in an interactive interface based on the mother tongue of the learners. So the procedure here is the procedures, different stages of the procedure that we have followed to develop those materials. I won't go into the details. Now, English vowels. In English scripts, there are five vowels, as we all know. And whenever we start learn, is teaching the learners at the very early stage, we say that there are five vowels in English. But they have numerable, innumerable pronunciation variations. Unfortunately, I have experimented with the teachers here in West Bengal that most of the teachers who are teaching English at the primary level, they don't know that a single English vowel has more than seven or eight or 10 or 11 pronunciation variations. And based on a particular usage of a letter in a particular words or lexical frame, the pronunciation of the vowel changes. A sensitive ear can differentiate between the sounds which sometimes seem very similar to one another. Learners with sharp ears can acquire all the pronunciation variations of vowels with little trouble. Many learners need long training before they can learn to detect and pronounce foreign vowels with success. So here, look at the example. I can assure you with 200% uh, uh, security or rather uh, assurance that 100% of English teachers here in West Bengal failed to identify that English A has eight variations in pronunciation. Here are the pronunciations which have been collected from the British English corpus. You can find out that there are eight different pronunciations. Now, if I ask the teacher to teach all these pronunciation variations to the learner, I'm 200% sure that it will be a miserable situation, awful situation. The teacher himself or herself doesn't know. But in our system, we'll show you later on that there are options. See. Here are the examples I can take. The, there are text on that. See, you can notice here that there are the letters and test and IPA, the symbols and the Bengali words given in the Bengali orthography. 
and each example is also given in english and in standard birth orthography and also there is an audio version of it and also our interface where the learners will hear it and pronounce it and the moment he or she pronounces it rightly he gets some merits or some points that this is the pronunciation so here look at the interface here the pronunciation variations type eight types and how it should be understood by them and how it should be pronounced like car start and here a uh, 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 a uh, uh, uh. so everywhere you can find out that this english vowel a has eight distinct pronunciations and unfortunately from our study we have noted not a single teacher has been successful enough now look at the next one english e has 10 different pronunciations and we don't know there are 10 distinct useful unique pronunciations let's say next one here is the examples you can find out that each example in ipa as well as in bengali alphabets are given so the learners are learning the pronunciation variations of the sounds from their bengali the orthographic representations because from their known to unknown they are actually learning and also they are learning the pronunciations of these sounds from the examples along with the words so they are actually reciting or repeating those sounds time and again and learning those sounds see i i has a seven different vowels as per e a uh, a uh, half a uh, i i a i u uh, so uh, sometimes it is also silent so here is the examples that you can find out we have given seven types in ipa in bengali orthography and every word is given in bengali orthography so that the learners can produce them and can read them through their own known language o has 12 variations this is quite surprising you can notice that there are 12 different pronunciation variations of english o and i i i must concept confess here also that i had no idea that there are 12 variations of o and each one is a very prominent one in standard british pronunciation here is the list you can find out how this particular sound is pronounced in different contexts in different ways so learners are actually learning all those variations through this interface so here you can find out the u has 11 variations each one is unique and each one is also have a different types and the learner has to learn very carefully how those were pronunciation variations can be they can learn and in our experiments these learners who are exposed to this interface did exceedingly well far better than their teachers here is the 12 exa 11 examples of this particular vowel sound which has been produced and given to the learners now these are the five vowels now take up this that interface another important complex part here the, i'm just going giving you the one example the same thing has been done for all the uh, uh, all the single sound of all the kind of vowels see here's the vowel sound type 1 type 1 has an ipa representation in bangla orthography in a word in word 2 and word 3 as well as in <coughs> orthography pronunciation of the word in bangla and it has a audio output for every sound it has audio output and the meaning also given in bangla so for yet every speech pronunciation variety of each vowel sound we have a interface of this type the learners actually learn from this they i click on the audio click on the sounds click on the meaning they also they sometimes we also given the usage they learn the usage of those sounds so this is one of the examples one of the interfaces which has been given to the learners and they are using by themselves the teacher is not there in the class teacher or teacher is not interfering rather teacher is also sitting in another system and the student also learning how the pronunciations are actually uttered and all the examples are taken from the british national speech corpus now the self system advantage this is the whole interface we have given and we had a fantastic result we have noted that the learners did exceedingly well in fact they learned almost all the pronunciation variations of the words quite elegantly quite successfully and they could also pronounce them without any assistance from the learner teachers 
teach pronunciation of English vowels in a very lively interactive interface. We have taught them. Method adopted works through CAD system, that is computer learner student interface there. Limited interface for interference of the teacher. Teacher was not actually interfering, teacher is just at the sideline. Rather, teacher is basically a, uh, rather a student, one of the participants in the whole course. Parents interfere or parental interference was absolutely zero. British representative pronunciation has been taken, but that can be revised into Indian representative pronunciation or any other representative pronunciation for a particular community, think relevant for them. Audiovisual interface also given to them for their learning processes. What are the other advantages? Learner as researchers, since we don't interfere with the learners, learners can do this part in their own way. They can start at any point, at any point or any point or any particular vowel. They can do exhaustively and they are quite happy because it is quite interactive one. And sometimes some images, some comes, some, <clears throat> some pictures comes, some sentences come and they can also use their mother tongue to, uh, uh, to learn those sounds. This is also possible that group-based learning environment can be given, that two or three learners can also sit together and learn this. Customized and localized is possible. Spatial temporal constants are removed because <clears throat> we have taken for that. It is not that the learners has to come to the school and use interface. We are also developing into this frame into a mobile full interface so that from their home also, they can use a mic moda mobile and do this part. Can be part of the e-learning or online ELT or e-learning scheme. Those who are, are in in trying to introduce this scheme, they can also utilize that one. A part of educational technology, this has been considered as a part of the educational technology, keeping in view that uh, our this pandemic has already given us a very clear signal that by next two or three or four years or five years time, the entire teaching system interface would be systems uh, that is digitized on digital platform, student has to directly interact with individual level or collective level with the teachers and they are not going to come to the class in a school regularly to interact. <coughs> so on that digital platform, you can utilize that one. Now, future missions, the research goals that I'm keeping here. So I have already completed this part. I've shown you the vowel part. The consonant part is also done. And both are now being used as an experimental basis in some schools and we are getting very good results. The project is not yet complete, but the success or the, sub, the grade of success rate which we acquired is a very tremendous one. So the future problem, the research problems which I can put up here for the young generations, those who would be interested to look into it. Can you think of such strategies and resources systems for teaching English syllables that is still untouched for us? You can think of strategies, resources, systems for word formation processes or lexical decomposition processes or compound word decomposition, composition processes, because these are the very primary rudimentary things that we need to teach our learners or the learning English that so that they can have good competence, how to construct a word, how to analyze a word, how to form a new word, how to use inflection, how to use plural markers, how to use uh, case markers and all those things. Strategies for comprehension of contextualized word senses. This is a very complex task. How the exact meaning of a particular word is understood or can be understood by a learner when it is put in a particular sentence. So that contextualized knowledge or contextualized word sense can be captured, can be explored or can be decided. Sentence structure analysis and comprehension that is a more advanced one. If we give some English sentences to the learners, how they are going to analyze them, how they are understand their meaning, their structure, their form, their clause structure, and all these properties. And develop the apps for smartphones so that these are accessible to the mobile phones and macros users, should be available for pre-learning resources for Indian rural schools, and can be extended to all corners that cater the needs for English learners across the country. So these are the future missions for us still untouched or rather unexplored and we need very good interfaces developed there are a lot of research questions and development questions components involved into it now importance this elc we have used this english language corpus 
you can ask this question very clearly that why you are using this English language corpus because there is there is no other alternative. Availability of English language corpus in digital form gives us a good opportunity to us to cater needs of learners with multimedia and other facilities. Until and unless there was available, it was not possible for us. It is more beneficial than traditional methods of ELT. Recent experiments show that exposure to ELC works wonders for the ELT learners. Learners can directly use data, information, and examples to enhance their linguistic skills. If we follow the whole uh, model of uh, data-driven learning or lexical syllabus, where the learners are actually researchers, they get far better equipped than they have been taught by in a traditional method. So we should now direct our attention towards this method if we want to new generation of to exhibit excellent linguistic skills in English in their life and growth. So our stand now, last but one slide, I've tried to highlight some of the basic traits and features of the cell system. Only one experimental study that we have shared now here. I propose to adopt this ELT for the Indian and other learners. In a given situation, Cell is appropriate as far as the question of linguistic competence of learners in English is concerned. It has certain advantages in developing the listening and speaking skills of learners and enhancing efficiency in reading, writing, and communication. We can apply it in a wholesome method in the sense that it can enhance the quality and skill of learners with many linguistic deficiencies implanted in them. So here I finish. And if there is any questions, I'm ready to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Niladri Shekhar Dash. Um, thank you for introducing us to the shell system. Um, I think we'll have uh, time for just one question. Um, do we have any question in the chat box? Um, we have one question in the chat, chat box. Um, I can just yes. read it out to you. Uh, sir, why did you choose the British variety of English as your pronunciation model? Yes, I have already answered in my talk. So I don't think that I should, because the other types of pronunciation, so we normally take the BRP or IRP, but for IRP, we don't have sufficient audio and data or text data. So for experimental basis, we have taken BRP. If you think that you can be comfortable with any other variety, please go for it. I don't have any problem at all. As long as the mm -hmm. interface is has served, served the learners, there is no problem at all which variety you adopt. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, please. Okay, sir. No, I, uh, I, this I, has to be the last question, I think. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you. I, 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 yeah, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, it just happens that I also work in the same area. Uh, yes, sir, uh, exactly. And I have developed, I have mm. developed a Bengali phonetic alphabet, okay, BPA, and huh. have got a dictionary. I've got, I've also developed a Hindi phonetic alphabet, okay, Hindi phonetic alphabet, and I've just published a book, English mm. Pronunciation Dictionary for Hindi Speakers, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is currently available on Amazon. Now, mm. I have some, I mean, disagreements with some of your th uh, slides, particularly yeah. the slides on vowels. The Your upside down, uh, the upside down V, mm -hmm. that is uh, not used for uh, pronouncing words like car and part and things like that. Mm -hmm. it, it is used for cut but shut. It is very short. It is not a mm -hmm. long one. It's a mm -hmm. cut but shut. Hut. Ah, so mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would like to see your that corpora where mm -hmm. uh, the students are picking up that sound. Mm -hmm. So other than that, I'm, I'm, I applaud your efforts and uh, mm -hmm. I wish you all the best. I'm also working in similar area in my country and currently uh, India is also taking up my dictionary. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good observation. Let me e explore a little bit with the database which you have got because this is a slide which has been made uh, based on the audio data taken from the British audio speech corpus. So I'll recheck it once again. And yeah. uh, if it is that you, you're based on size and it, if it is, uh, needs to be rectified, then definitely I'll do the rectification. Yes. Thank you yes. for your advice. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Niladri Shekhar Dash, for your talk, and thank you, uh, everyone, for participating. I think we'll uh, end. We'll have to end this session here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Niladri Shekhar Dash, for enlightening us with Share System, a very innovative approach to teaching in these challenging times. Now it's time for uh, handing over the certificate. It is on behalf thank of the Social Society of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to thank the moderator, Dr. Asifa Sultana, for conducting the session. Now it's time for the last speech of the second plenary session. At this point, I would like to invite Rabira Anjuman Huda, American Univers International University, Bangladesh, for introducing the speaker and moderating the session. Um, thank you so much. Rabira Anjuman Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shazara. Um, I welcome you all to the uh, last plenary session of plenary session two. And uh, in this session, we have Dr. Professor Dr. Shaila Sultana Madam with us for her um, talk. Dr. Shaila Sultana is a professor at the Department of English Language, Institute of Modern Language, University of Dhaka. She has been educated at Jahanginagar University, Dhaka, Monash University, Melbourne, King's College, London, and the University of Technology, Sydney. Her research interests include trans approaches to language and identity, sociology, critical geography, and post-colonial contexts. She has authored articles in renowned international applied linguistics journals, such as Linguistics and Education, International Multilingual Research Journal, International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, Journal of Asia-Pacific um, Communication, Asian Englishes, Translanguaging and Translation in Multilingual Contexts, International Journal of Multilingualism, and Journal of Social Linguistics. Her co-authored book titled Popular Culture, Voice and Linguistic Diversity, Young Adults On and Offline has recently been published from Macmillan Palgrave. A chapter titled Gender Performativity in Virtual Space and Linguistic and Multimodal Resources Within the Local Global Interface of the Virtual Space, Critically Aware Youths in Bangladesh have also been published in Language and Culture on the margins of from Routledge Critical Studies in Multilingualism UK and Multilingual Matters USA, respectively. She is the lead editor of Routledge Handbook of English Language Education in Bangladesh. Today, Madam will be presenting on the topic titled Digital Ethnography, Ethnographic Sensibility and Social Transformation. I would like to welcome Ma'am and to uh, start her talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. At first, I must thank Tisol Bidi for inviting me and giving this platform uh, for sharing my ideas. Um, the title of my presentation, as uh, um, you have just heard, Dravida has mentioned, Digital Ethnography, Ethnographic Sensibility and Social Transformation. Uh, in this presentation, specifically with reference to my own research studies and findings in the context of Bangladesh, I'll explain the theoretical underpinnings of ethnographic research, the processes involved in the research design, and the steps required uh, for participant observation, interviews, and other data collection methods that you know, that develop ethnography sensibility. I'll also explain the necess necessity of maintaining the ethical boundaries. At the end, I'll briefly discuss uh, the role of digital ethnography in social transformation. You will hear lots of I in it. Um, I don't think that it is a presentation of self-glorification. It is not, because ethnographic study is something like that. You know, the researcher puts um, herself within the research and the research story is uh, constructed uh, both by the research participants and the researcher. And I also believe that, you know, rather than um, giving example from other situations, other contexts, since I'm addressing um, students and teachers from Bangladesh, it is better to give examples from Bangladesh. And that is the reason, you know, um, I am not using any uh, slide that such. I will be talking my experiences of um, uh, digital ethnography in the context of Bangladesh. So uh, first question is, you know, why am I interested in uh, digital spaces? So we have become more techno-friendly. Computers, internet, mobile, networking play significant roles in our life. And inclusion of the digital site into the ethnographic research capture the complexity of life in a global world and the openness and versatility in experiences we are exposed to because of the internet. There is no way as a social linguist, I may delimit the research to traditional physical space only. 
digital spaces seem to provide a unique platform for socially, culturally, and politically marginalized segment of the society for engaging in alternative discourses. Their research studies that show how digital spaces are used for raising new voices and negotiations of identities. With reference to a research study done on young women internet users in Mumbai, India, Bhattacharjo and Ganesh in 2011 showed that Indian women tend to use internet for their own pleasure, challenging the structured and ambiguous notions of Indian culture and Indian femininity. In the context of Bangladesh, uh, similar to countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, Lebanon, USA, digital spaces provide Bangladeshis, specifically those who do not conform to the heteronormative sexuality of critical space, where they have the freedom of going beyond the socially and culturally accepted so sexual orientation. And uh, I can refer to research studies done by Shuti Kori. I, I have also uh, one or two uh, research publications which prove that. However, these research studies mentioned above do not look into the micro dimension of people uh, in Bangladesh, missing out the opportunities of exploring how social dynamics such as gender, religion, nationalism, or age discursively negotiated and become emergent in spatial realities of individual life. We also see that you know, nowadays, even if you look at uh, you know, Bangladeshi digital spaces, that digital spaces are used for spreading violence, prejudices, misogyny, fanaticism, intolerance, and based on political, religious, ethnic, racial, and nationalistic values and ideologies. So these are the reasons uh, why I have chosen digital space as a research site. And I have published few articles and book chapters on research done uh, through virtual ethnography until 2019. And since 2018, it, because this is a very relevant topic for um, human existence nowadays. In fact, since 2018, Rutledge has been asking me to write a book about this. And recently I could manage some time. Uh, and address the demand and sign a book contract with them. So many of the issues that I'm going to um, talk today will be extensively covered um, in this book. So what is the difference uh, between ethnography and digital ethnography? So digital ethnography has emerged from ethnography. In fact, um, there is not much difference between digital ethnography and uh, ethnography as such in terms of ethos. Uh, the ontology, the epistemology, the data collection method, the interpretation, all these things, in fact, similar. That is why, you know, Dhiraj Murthy in 2008 stated that as ethnography goes digital, its epistemological remit remains much the same. Ethnography is about telling stories. When ethnographers come back from the field, they become the storytellers. They have something to tell about. Good ethnography effectively communicates a social story, drawing the audience into the daily lives of the respondents. While the introduction of new technologies, the stories have remained vivid, but the ways they were told have changed. So the only major difference between ethnography and digital ethnography is what is being studied, the nature and types of data and how the stories are told. For example, in the context of Bangladesh, in my research, in order to conduct digital ethnography, I need to explore participants' use of English, Bangla, Hindi, or any other languages that they use the manipulation of signs, symbols, multimodal materials on the digital spaces. The digital spaces, because of their flexibility and fluidity, give more opportunities to understand how people use different resources in the digital spaces. Um, you know, uh, and uh, what sorts of gendered, classed, or nationalistic subjectivities they negotiate in these spaces. In other words, um, multimodal analysis of the images, photos, uh, diverse materials used by the participants in digital spaces is an important dynamic of digital ethnography. In digital ethnography, we need to develop ethnographic sensibility and understand how they use multimodal resources to build up their digitally mediated space, engaged in interaction and negotiate position. So why did I opt for ethnography? Uh, my next question. The ethos of ethnography tally uh, with the way I consider language and culture, the way I believe language and culture should be explored. In other words, my perspectives about the nature, what is being studied, what is being studied, that is ontology, and how to best understand this object to study, that is epistemology, are in tune with the ethnography. 
the perspectives about language, culture, society promoted in ethnography are ontologically mine too. Language is contextual, social, cultural, historical, and processual. Ethnographic notion of language is situated because of its emergence from human interaction in social situation. Language is never a product. It is, it is never static. It is always emerging in anew. So when ethnography appreciates the humanness of language, culture, or identity, it creates the opportunity to bring it out. I see that ethnographic perspective is ontological to my research. As a post-structuralist, I also see that language is not a mere combination of fixed structures. It doesn't float in a vacuum. It is given meaning by us. It goes through the constant process of semiotic reconstruction. And because of these views, I see it mandatory to the construction of knowledge on language practice to look at not only the linguistic features of language or the contextual or physical properties of space, but also the social and historical construction and organization of space. For example, you know, how spaces are organized and why. You know, what role they play in our language practices. What thoughts and ideologies are brought into the space? By whom, with whom? how we relate themselves uh, you know, uh, with the space and consequently what contradictions we experience because of our socioeconomic characteristics and so on. So ethnographic studies have you know, uh, special significance in observing social phenomena, be it language, society, or identity. The observation, collection of data, analysis of data from ethnographic sensibility are very much you know, epistemologically idiosyncratic to it. So ethnography allows us to look into the language practices beyond synchronic events and consider all the unseen processes that go before and after the language practice as they evolve, as they emerge within the digital spaces. Both researchers and research participants, for example, the research participants and I, the researcher, have an active role in the process of knowledge construction the dialogic and interpretive nature of the ethnographic study itself, the dialogues between the participants, space, and me, as a researcher, make the research inevitably interpretive. These stands, in fact, reflect an important notion of interpretivism, which is you know, called Verstehen, a German word that means understanding or interpreting of meaning of human activity. Both participants and I try to understand them as socially constructed beings, both you know, constituted and mediated by their own selves in constant negotiation between language, space, and subject positions. So ethnography allows us to critical, allows us to be critical about language, culture, and social dynamics. In fact, criticality is ontological uh, to um, ethnographic research, to my research, and very much welcomed in ethnography. I have interest in broader power relationship between participants in society, as well as among participants based on their language, education, and socioeconomic background. I do not intend to only look into the superficial mixing of English, Bangla, or Hindi. I want to know what subjective or social dynamic forces impact on speakers' mix of English, Bangla, and Hindi. And that is why it is also important that I opt for ethnographic research. In a, in a socially stratified society like Bangladesh, in fact, it is even more important because ethnography allows us to question the social values and ideologies and critically evaluate the systems of meaning in different practices and eventually identify exploitation and marginalization. Uh, in addition, my interest in broader power relationship between participants in society as well as among participants themselves based on the language, gender, socioeconomic background, make the uh, research, this ethnographic research also critical. So when we move beyond the test, text, because I'm not looking to the text only, uh, uh, you know, we can bring in participants interpretation into it. We manage to strike a balance between emic and ethic point of view. So striking a balance between emic like the culture specific insight or perspective and ethic, the interpretive standpoints, you know, I can come up with a realistic multi-layered interpretation of the participants language practices. Does the research ensure an intensive engagement with an holistic understanding of the context? 
And ethics is very important because we are immersed into the research context in the digital space. It is important that we maintain the ethics. Um, the principle of ethic that, um, that repeatedly has been mentioned uh, is the principle of care. Care is core value to the internalized and acted on through the watchfulness and assurance of the researcher. We have to have an informed consent, constant, you know, from the, you know, from the research participants, the consent from the research participants are important. Uh, we have to make sure that there is, um, you, know, um, you know, no institutional and legal risk. We have to ensure anonymity because um, within the quotation mark, anonymizing does not require, we have to understand that we are not um, uh, robbing off the possibility of uh, listening to the stories of the participants when we are anonymizing them, it is not. So the changes need not sacrifice the ethnographic richness and research vitality and validity. So in most of the cases, research participants, physical world identities need to be you know, uh, anonymized, very important. Huh? And we need to be very cautious so that names are not visible uh, in any chat windows or elsewhere. And we have to make sure that they're blurred and moved out uh, in some digital worlds, we must anonymize not just the faces or screen names, but places too. Very important. And we should not be, um, since we'll be, uh, you know, looking to the digital spaces, um, there is every possibility we can, you know, hide ourselves as well and lark. Uh, that, that shouldn't be the case. Deception is totally against the spirit of ethnography because ethnographic research is based on uh, the relationship of goodness, uh, directness, uh, consideration. So deception should not be any way of looking into the digital life of the research participants. Again, this is a space, ethnographic space is both researchers and participants, and there is every possibility of becoming very intimate with the research participants. But uh, as a researcher, we have to make sure that we maintain that um, space between our participants and us, so we do not become too intimate with them. Uh, and there should be a certain goodness in our heart. Um, yeah. So there should be, a, you know, always a way of compensation um, uh, to support them rather than, you know, always thinking that uh, I will have to use the data. So whatever way we want to get from the data, we should do that. It shouldn't be the way. And um, when we take the leave, we also have to make sure that we, uh, you know, say proper goodbye to them because uh, ethnographies, uh, ethnographic research usually, you know, run for three, four months or years after years. So if we suddenly leave that participants may feel confused, betrayed or abandoned. So we also have to inform them when we start, as we inform them. When we leave, we also have to inform them. And when we write about them, the participants, their stories, their, um, you know, their life trajectories, we also have to make sure that we have an accurate portrayal of their life. Um, we have, I have to mention a very beautiful quotation from uh, Malinowski uh, uh, from 1922. Uh, and he says that, um, uh, that the goal of an ethnographic study is quotation, quote, uh, to grasp the native's point of view, his relation to life and to realize his vision of his world. So we should be sympathetically, you know, depict participants' life, specifically when they have experiences, different sites of you know, uh, discrimination and violences. So how do I collect data in digital ethnography? Uh, I surf on the walls of the participants on a regular basis uh, uh, from three simultaneous perspectives, incorporating both micro and macro dimension of the language. The commonly accepted typical norms that I observe in the digital discourses, which is called NetSpeak by Crystal in 2001. I look into the idiosyncratic particular forms of language and discourse style emerging from the creative amalgamation of English, Bangla, or any other languages, which Blomert called super vernacular. And I also look into the voices that are influenced by a variety of contextual parameters. I also look into the images, memes, music clips, uh, used by participants. So keeping in consideration the variety of linguistic and non-linguistic resources, I try to understand how participants discursively construct their identity. Uh, here, Twitter, Instagram, FP pages, blogs, blogs, YouTube comments. These are the things I have explored uh, so far. So what are the methods I, I usually do for you know, ethnographic research? It involves a family of methods that ensure direct and sustained contact with participants. The purpose of ethnography is not to ensure the viability or reliability or false viability of the research. 
Nevertheless, the very kind of data collection method, for example, interview, observation, focus group discussion, all these uh, methods, in fact, allow me an interpretation, you know, um, which, is which are more comprehensive, comprehensive. And hence the findings in this ethnography research are very much, um, you know, ideographic, to use the Kentinian term, idiosyncratic to the participants and to me. So multiple methods, observation, interviews, focus group discussion, ensure both thick participation, which is um, uh, the very specific term used by Sarangi in 2007, and thick description. It, it, this is again another term used by Geertz in 1973. So on the one hand, thick description requires me to observe the participants closely in their interaction, which become potentially significant for building up a detailed picture of the language practices and space. In classical ethnography, these aspects ensured a detailed description of culture of exotic people. Eventually, what happens is that I develop um, ethnographic sensibility. Um, and then I feel of the relationship amongst the participants and language practices and their locatedness in space. Um, another important is you now, how do we work with images, videos, and textual data? In, in my research, for example, I gather audio, visual, graphic, audio, photographic, textual data, and I give equal attention to textual and visual representation of data. Hence, I don't overwhelm myself with multimodal analysis. Nevertheless, I do pay attention to visual and graphic data, background, color, font styles, colors, emoticons, and photographs. I capture the screen so that I may record the original font without any correction or spelling. So if, um, if, but if your research is more concerned with video and imagery, uh, you will have to identify a multimodal framework uh, for fine-grained analysis. All the data need to be saved in files, classified and sorted out in folders and subfolders um, as data. Another important uh, point is writing ethnographic research. See that as this experience of conducting the ethnographic research is subjective, so is the writing, you know. Whatever I write in relation to it is very much a subjective representation. Uh, I take a post structuralist stance when I look into data in time and space and, 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 and the sociocultural stance. So all ethnographic work is represented in writing, which is different from the raw data collected from the field. And ethnographers, to some extent, need to follow a genre of reporting. Uh, after all, by the, the name itself, like the ethnography, suggests the centrality of writing uh, to its accomplishment. Uh, and Ramanathan and Atkinson has mentioned, have mentioned about it. So I do not try to keep all the complexities of social life in distance by simplification. And that is why I have always trouble in writing within 6,000 words when different um, uh, journals ask or the editors ask me to write in 6,000 words. Because ethnographic research is quite difficult to uh, frame within you know, limited words because there's so much to talk about. Uh, in a one single word, for example, uh, for the book, um, you know, the, our, our, our book that just came out, um, the handbook, the Rutledge Handbook of um, English Education in Bangladesh, I analyzed two words, cat and fast, and I have spent almost 8,000 words only to describe these two words. So ethnographic research is like that. Uh, I'm almost at the end of my presentation, uh, and that is you know, uh, how we can use ethnographic research for transformation of the society. Very important. Uh, digital space can sustain and reproduce the vicious circle of value and ideologies associated with nation, you know, national language, national symbol, exaggerated pronunciation, exemplified in orthographic patterns, slang, swear words, images, quotations on memes are used to represent hyper-nationalistic identity ad attributes. These are the also resources that instigate verbal abuse, violence against people from different nations and nationalities. Bangladesh is also conflicted by this liberal interpretation of religion and local interpretation of Islam based on local preachers. Religious identity is biased based on partial and inadequate understanding of religion of many occasions. And that is why it is important that, you know, specifically in the context of Bangladesh, that we bring these digital discourses to the front. We can also use digital discourses in classroom for developing critical awareness in students. Thus, digital ethnography may minimize the urgency, struggle, disparity, and inequalities 
based on language, nation, religion, and gender in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful, wonderful talk. I personally learned a lot, I can say that. So um, now it's time for the question answer session. I would invite anyone who has a question. Is there any question that you want to ask them about the topic and the presentation? I think somebody already raised some questions on the box. I think there is some comments congratulating ma'am and uh, thanking her for the session and presentation, but the questions I cannot, um, let's see. So, um, Shamsi Arabuda ma'am said a very timely and insightful talk by Professor Dr. Shaila Sultana and Rakib Chodhari. I have a Sarsi. question, just a quick question, sorry. Yes, yes, and please. Okay, please. Ahead, yeah, please. it's about, uh, I'm just thinking how uh, um, ethnography is different from autoethnography. Or auto -ethnography. Auto the word auto itself tells it. Um, one person, just like, you know, uh, the person talks about her own self in terms of, you know, whatever social phenomena or individual phenomena that person wants to explore. So the autoethnography, in fact, um, looks into the person who is writing it, mm -hmm. um, looks, explores her own experiences. So um, the researcher himself or herself is telling the story, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So she um, talks about her own social experiences, uh, personal experiences or individual experiences in day-to-day -day life in relation to certain topic that uh, she wants to explore. So that mm -hmm. is autoethnography. Yeah, it's wonderful to know about digital uh, auto, auto ethnography or digital. That is, uh, yeah, the, the, the ethnography yeah. that we conduct on yeah. digital spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ro Robida, I have a you. comment if that's all right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, do you have a question, sir? Yes, uh, more like a comment. Shaila, first of all, very interesting uh, presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. I don't know much about digital ethnography, but um, yeah, uh, a lot from your presentation. Uh, I think the way we classify ethnography is not very straightforward. So we have digital and non-digital ethnography. That is one kind of uh, taxonomy. It's or an it's an, You can say that, you know, all the books that we, and from my own experiences, because I have done ethnography, on yeah. real space as well as on digital spaces. And I have seen that, you know, the in ethos, in spirit, in principle, both of them the same. The only differences that I observe from my own experiences and as all the research studies have mentioned that, you know, the elements that we are dealing with um, are different. For example, in digital spaces, we have, you know, different way of meaning making processes. For example, we have memes, we have audios, we have news link. So these are the elements and the, the way we analyze these elements are different. Other than that, in principle, in ethos, they are same. Yeah, I was about to say that a different type of classification is, uh, for example, critical ethnography, institutional yes. ethnography, and then yes. you have classical descriptive ethnography. Um, yes. So my comment was digital ethnography is a different type of classification because uh, institutional or critical ethnography. So those, for example, who uh, that would follow Foucault, for example. Critical, Foucault. yes, yes. Yeah, that's yes. right. So mm -hmm. that can also be digital ethnography. So there might actually be something called digital institutional or digital critical ethnography. And so that's when we, things get so, complicated. Uh, we will have to, you know, we are good at coming up with terms. You know that, right? Look at all the, I think I, we're so good at, serving the old wine in new bottles. So perhaps in few years, we may come up with this term. You don't know, Rakhi. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, I think you, you I would be a right that connection between digital and the other traditional forms of ethnography. <laughs> so thank you, Shaila, a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rakhi, for being here. One, one uh, last uh, observation and question to Shaila Appa. Uh, when Beth was talking about uh, during her presentation about the mm -hmm. ethnographic study that we did, uh, just a question that in a physical ethnography, 
we stayed in the site for a long period of time. I just want to know when you're talking about digital one, is there a time frame that you've been observed in a digital space? Yes, there is also, you know, it depends, you know, what sorts of uh, digital ethnography you're doing. But on many occasions, you know, there are groups of people who are engaged in certain games uh, for certain spirit. So you have to be in that group for hours and engage in different activities, observe them in their, uh, you know, in their activities, as well as we also have to identify time in order to um, engage in interview conversation with them. So as we do in a, uh, in a physical uh, ethnography, we have to do the same thing um, in, the, in the digital ethnography. So as we spend hours from dawn to dusk, for example, for my PhD thesis, I did it from dawn to dusk. I spend um, days after days with my research participants. So for digital ethnography as well, I have to spend a certain hours a day where, you know, um, with those participants and observing them in, in different activities within the digital space. Another, so another, another uh, interesting could be <clears throat> when we were, Observing one particular site, it is a we were studying a shared values of culture of a particular community. Yes. So in a, a digital ethnography, how do you select that kind of community or the site where have a similar shared values and the culture that we are going to observe? So it, it again depends on you know, what sorts of research you want to do. For example, if you want to do research on um, you know heteronormative practices. Uh, uh, whatever idea you have in your mind, you have to explore at first, you know, uh, uh, in a physical space with whom you want to work. So you have to do that homework and identify the samples and then explore, you know, whether uh, they, these groups are very active. And if there are certain groups which are only active on digital group, you know, different gamers, for example, if you want to do different research studies on those gamers, you, you, we have to look into that. And then there are websites and blogs which work for certain political, uh, um, you know, ethos in their mind. And if you want to see that how they are, uh, you know, discursively constructing those political ethos or religious ethos, you immediately, you know, know who to go. So it depends again, side, you know, what kind of research you are doing. Uh, uh, you know, that research question will tell you, you know, where you will find out the research participants. And according to that, you contact them. Thank you. Dravida, please. Close Thank the you session. so much, ma'am and sir, everyone, for the wonderful discussion. And with that, with this, we will be ending the last plenary uh, talk of uh, session two. And I will be handing over to the hosts. Thank you so much. So much, Dr. Dravi Ranjuman Huda, for wonderfully conducting the session, and thank you so much, Shaila Ma'am, for a wonderful session. I learned a lot, and now we are going to give you a certificate on behalf of the Soul Society of Bangladesh. Part of digital ethnography. <laughs> Part of digital ethnography. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome, Ma'am. And we are going to move on to our next session. We have a workshop. So without uh, any delay, I'm going to invite Dr. Surada Farzana Sultana, Assistant Professor, Department of English, University of Liberal Arts, uh, Arts Bangladesh, to moderate the session, introduce the session, and also introduce the speaker. Dr. Surada Farzana Sultana, I'm handing it over to you. Hello, uh, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you're audible. You're okay. Audible. You're visible and we could find you finally. <laughs> <laughs> I've been crazy busy. I'm sorry. I wish I could uh, spend more time um, for this conference. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really sorry, but I'm here now. <laughs> okay. A very good evening to you all. Um, I'm Dr. Seda Farzana Sultana and uh, I will be moderating this session titled Systematic Reviewing from Selection to Publication, Do's and Don'ts. And I am delighted to introduce today's presenter, my friend, Dr. Manzurul Abidin. Manzur and I went to the Department of English um, at Dhaka University together. Um, Dr. Manzurul Abidin is a senior lecturer in education and society at University of West London, UK, and Camster, University of Cambridge. Um, he has a strong background in supporting teacher professional development and research informed practice. He has mentored and supervised several teacher practitioner research projects, facilitated pedagogic innovation workshops, managed teacher leadership networks and pedagogic resources. 
Manzoor has a ATA teaching fellowship and PG cert in higher education, Cambridge, and has worked across universities, British and abroad to develop institutional research infrastructure, self-evaluation framework, and feedback models on teaching and lectures uh, and learner-centric curricula. Since his doctoral work at University of Cambridge 2014, Mansoor has worked in several national and international funded projects and his main research interests are in sociological variables in education, classroom dialogue, epistemic uh, insight, quality education and knowledge mobilization. Manzoor has published a book recently from Routledge and his key research papers are published in high impact journals such as British Educational Research Journal, Language and Education and Cambridge Journal of Education. Um, so yes, um, uh, I can't see Manzoor here yet. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, now I can see you, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can hear you. So, yeah. Over to you. and. Before you start, just a quick question. So uh, uh, are you going to accept questions um, throughout the session or at the end of the session only? Uh, throughout the session would be fine uh, with me. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, so you they, guys can, uh, can write your questions in the chat box and uh, also, yes, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. I'm very yeah, happy maybe. to see you all, to see Manzoor, to see my teachers, um, uh, Dr. Rakit Choudhury here. Um, and Hamidul Haq, uh, my uh, ex-colleague, is here. Said Bhai is here. I'm really delighted to see you all. Okay. Over to Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just would like to uh, emphasize the point once, uh, once again. I'm happy to uh, have uh, your questions throughout the session. Happy to be interrupted by you. I mean, once you have a question in your head, fire it off. Uh, so I'm... But I'd just like to add a few more points with the, with the rather academic biography that you have just heard from a good friend. Uh, just to speak a, a bit of Bangla to start with. And I would just say that I mean, Meghna Pare Chele. Meghna no di dhewer buke tale no kabe, ami berai heshe khele. Just to just to emphasize the point that um i mean uh, take a borrow how manus shibong uh cho shooting mode the tetal listy jela ghora rubiko da chamar bivino karoni unisho pocha no buit at hakashi tarpo pre chodo bachur uh dhaka chilam irpore dhujarat noe chuleshi came bridge tarpo take okani as you can see if just over my shoulder that it's dark maybe semi-dark already in england but it is actually still lunch time so just quarter past one i know that it is quarter past seven in bangladesh so uh, following my lunch i have this coffee mug uh, i hope that you have the famous mouth-watering bangladeshi snacks around you you can also grab a glass of coffee so that I can't bore you to sleep. But let's come back to the point that why we are just to keep, we used to call this time in Bangladesh the Adda time. And just to keep alive the Adda spirit. Um, I have already said that you can fire off your questions, your comments at any point of this workshop. This is not meant to be a, a speech or anything like that. So a workshop and talking about um, TESOL Bidi and, and the fact that they, they've invited me for today. Thank you very much. But, but connecting Adda to you, maybe you can also recommend this word to Oxford next year, because I don't think there is a good one word um, synonym representing one English word that can represent the true dimensions of Adda. So like that's, a, that's a recommendation to you. And um, in fact, the like Tissol Bidi is, Bidi is pioneer in promoting this word in Bangladesh at this moment. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. The next thing is the, the next challenge for you is to cross the border and send the word to Oxford dictionary. Um, 
you can write your questions on the chat. Our wonderful moderator can feed me back. Now let's go from Meghna Nodi to London Underground. I'm going to share my screen. So just bear with me for a few seconds. So I hope you can now see my uh, cover page. Uh, systematic reviewing. Now, this is something all of us are familiar with to some extent. Um, my journey of understanding and undertaking systematic reviewing started in 2012. And it was a point when I was recruited as a research assistant I was doing a PhD at Cambridge at that point. I was recruited as a teaching uh, research assistant for a systematic review project. And uh, that project later, I mean, once it is finished, that project came up with a publication in Cambridge Journal of Education. That particular paper will be our key uh, for today's systematic reviewing. I mean, we'll be, I'll be going through every step, you know, how I have learned, what are the things to criticize and stuff like that. But as an exemplar, as an example at every step, uh, I would be bringing that particular paper. It was published in the late 2013, 2014. Some of you have seen it. I think I've uploaded that particular paper on T. Sol Bidi's page and uh, maybe the, you know, the administrators of T. Sol Bidi have liked it. That's why I'm here. So I'll start from the scratch, from selection to the very end, or maybe not the very end, to the publication, do's and don'ts. Mind the gap so can you between hear the train anything? and the platform. Mind the gap. Yes, yes we can hear. I can, no, uh, can you hear any sound? Yes, we can. Yes, I'll, I'll do it again. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Mind the gap. Those of you who have been to London, it is very familiar to you. Those of you who haven't yet, familiarize yourself with it. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Mind the gap. Yeah, I think you have now got it. The announcement is about mind the gap. One of the things that why a systematic review is conceived by researchers is because of this, mind the gap. Uh, I'm not in a classroom, otherwise I would have asked this question and would have asked to raise your hand that how many of you have used a variant of these sentences? I'm sure most of you. Um, I have used all of this at some point and many other you know, variations of this. There is a gap in the current knowledge. Often we use that keyword gap in our abstract, in our introduction, right before we introduce that why this particular project, why this PhD work, why this MPhil work or undergrad dissertation is needed. The clear rationale that we tend to provide is there is a gap somewhere and here I am to fill in the gap. Existing literature isn't good, is, is thin on this, so I'm here to, 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 to make the, to fulfill the thinness. There hasn't been a systematic study on previous research have not shown significant knowledge gaps exist in the way we understand. So you can see that is the rationale why a systematic review is needed. All of us who are familiar with literature review, literature review is actually the father of systematic review. Systematic review is one kind of literature review, but it is separate from literature review in the sense that it is 
as you already know, much more systematic, much more structured, and and systematic review, being the son of literature review, is now claiming that he or she, you know, is much better than or much higher, much more systematic, much more rigorous than literature review. How? We're going to check that today, that whether all these claims that systematic review makes to be much better than a than yet another literature review, whether they're valid or not. I'll give you 10 seconds to check this particular table. You can see that a good literature review is in many ways systematic. You know, synthesis of available research, critical evaluation, breadth and uh, depth, clarity and conciseness, rigorous. Some of these words, sometimes we don't want to go to the very detail of this. For instance, we tend to say rigorous, you know, rather loosely, without necessarily demonstrating that how it is claimed to be rigorous and how it is claimed to be consistent. In many ways, some of the definition that we can see here within good literature, which is the left-hand side column, are actually the definition of systematic review. Systematic review will take all of these keywords very, very seriously, synthesizing, uh, critically evaluating, and, uh, and signposting the right breadth and depth and, and making it rigorous and consistent. I have already introduced the paper to you. Now, this is the paper that I have, we have published. Uh, my co-author, she was a very senior professor at that point. She retired six, six seven years ago, uh, almost immediately after we have published this very last paper that she published while she was working at the faculty. Uh, since then, the paper has been received very well by the community. And actually, those of you who know me, you know that I do not work with um, TESOL or English language teaching anymore directly. One of the main reasons for that is this particular project and, and this paper. I got so interested into classroom dialogue, what happens within the classroom, that I never bothered to make a comeback. Uh, this is the paper that I'm going to refer to at various points of today's session. Um, I hope by now we have read a few lines of the abstract, but let's move on. I've already made it clear. By the end of today's workshop, I hope that I will have enough time to actually do a test. Well, this is not to this is not to not to put you off because we all know that how tests the word is used particularly in our part of the world to scare us so you know even if i have time enough to have a test that is going to be fun but these are some of the some of the learning objectives if you like uh, some of the questions i hope that you will be able to have an answer later on uh, by the end of today's workshop, narrative and systematic answerable questions, selection criteria, stages, peer reviewed protocol, and then writing up. So let's start with the first question. Maybe you can think about a very broad question to begin with and how we, you can narrow it. I remember. Um, back in 2013, it must be. Uh, one of the presenters of this conference, uh, her name is Elizabeth Erling. She visited Cambridge, you know, for potentially start a new project. And I was working in the dialogue project at that point as a PhD student, research assistant. And, and we, we thought about one of the most, perhaps one of the most high frequency words that we have used in Bangladeshi research literature, CLT. And 
And we talked about that CLT in itself is about dialogue. So why can't we design a, some kind of an evaluative project to, 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 to use some of the dialogic models that we have created? Why can't we migrate those models to the TESOL or ELT sector? However, I got really busy after that, you know, the final two years of PhD. So it never materialized, but I think the, the possibility is still open. And uh, those of you who are listening to me, you can think about a very broad question, thinking about some of the, some of the key evaluation that is yet to be done in the context of Bangladesh. For instance, communicative language teaching, how far it has improved classroom dialogue. And by classroom dialogue, we can think about all kinds of dialogue. It could be teacher-student, student-teacher, student-student. So how far it has actually improved the dialogue that happens within a classroom. So keep your broad question in your head. Think about how you can narrow it down. You know, one way of narrowing it down in terms of, you know, designing a systematic review would be to actually think about the time gap. If you remember the title, if I just quickly go back, if you remember the title, four decades of research. So we were looking at four decades, 40 years, huge undertaking. However, in case of Bangladesh, I think you can just go back to last maybe 25 years. I think it's around mid nineties when all of this, you know, hear and cry about new things to bring in the context of Bangladesh started. So think about a broad question also think about potentially how you can narrow it down. These are some of the questions that we have started with. I mean, these are good questions. You can rephrase these questions in the broad question that you now have in mind. I've already given you a clue. If I were one of you listening to you know, this workshop, I would have thought about communicative language teaching and there is a way to systematically bring together every single thing that is published by teachers from remote areas to you know the, the dhaka based researchers to everybody to by the you know the with the experts from from england by the projects we could bring all of them together and then see what we have got how many of them are evaluative? How many of them have talked about successes and failures? And synthesizing or putting them all together, what are the future guidelines? What are the future, the future pathways that we have? If I were you, I would have thought about in that line, but you can take any other you know, topic that interests you. And uh, any other topic that you feel, a lot of work has been done but hasn't been a very good synthesis on that. So you can take a cue or cues from these four questions that we started with for the dialogue project. I think at this point, I can go to the paper just to read out a few lines from the paper. I mean, you should be able to also see it. So I hope you can see it. I can make it full screen, but my escape button doesn't always work. So it's a, it's a bit naughty. So I will start with where these questions are. These questions are as they should be. Right after the introduction. So you can see, I'll just uh, try to zoom in a little bit more. It is difficult to pinpoint precisely when theorizing about classroom dialogue began to be translated into empirical research. I skipped the following line. Thus, it seems reasonable to contemplate about four decades of empirical investigation so what have these four decades produced? What is known about how classroom dialogue is organized in the context of Bangladesh? I'd probably rephrase it as what is known about how 
CLT is organized in the context of classroom dialogue. And are some modes of organization more beneficial than others? Were these questions answered early in the 40 year period? If so, has research fizzled out? I think this is a very valid question because although I do not read uh, as much as I used to about uh, English language teaching situation in Bangladesh, but my, my, but my interest hasn't died out yet. And I think research has kind of moved on from some of those issues that we used to read a lot about in the early 2000s um, when I was in Bangladesh. So I'm not sure whether it is actually the right time to ask this question that, that so has research around CLT has fizzled out or not? Have we moved on to something better? If not, why has it taken so long to resolve the issues? The answers are far from clear from for hitherto there has been no comprehensive synthesis of empirical research into classroom dialogue. Think about some of those common five sentences that we talk about, the mind the gap thing. We've just rewritten, you know, that particular sentence, perhaps in a slightly better way. Then we have talked about the, the overview of what we have done. The present article summarizes the results. It starts by describing the systematic procedures that we used to identify relevant research and outlining the studies that emerged as the sample for detailed analysis. Thereafter, methods of data collection and analysis used in the studies are described and discussed, highlighting changes and continuities over time. Finally, the studies result are summarized and integrated to present a succinct picture of what is currently known and where future research might uh, profitably be directed. So I have used all my composition skills to write these lines. Uh, so that's exactly it. That's what systematic review is all about. And you have, you have, you have to follow a step-by-step -step procedure to make your process look as much systematic as possible. I know that some of you are thinking about a particular question that the way you are presenting systematic review in a bid to make it very objective, you're taking away the benefit of expert knowledge, the benefit of reflection. I know, I know. And I am going to share you a particular pyramid a bit later, I mean, which might frustrate some of you. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a particularly quantitative oriented person but I'm very comfortable with it. But I'm also comfortable with qualitative data too. So systematic review is not necessarily very quantitative. I think I may have one slide on this. Some of you, I mean, students and everyone alike who are listening to me, you must have also heard a similar term called meta-analysis. Now meta-analysis is much more around the quantitative studies and it will, it will use a systematic procedure to bring together the quantitative data in order to summarize. In other words, they're siblings, but they're not the same because systematic review is, can incorporate the so-called expert literature review, expert reflection, the, the, the reflective literature review. So we're going to have a little bit more discussion on how they're different and how they're similar. But as I said, similarities are more. Uh, they're siblings. I'm going back to my PowerPoint slide. So you can see these are the questions that we have started with. All good systematic reviews need to ask questions like this. Uh, you know, my tip or my tips for you to have what questions you can ask. I would say that you use the chronological approach. In other words, you can ask a question that is about the past. You ask another question that is about present. 
what to do, what we should do now. And, and then you ask another question about the future directions. When I'll be reading the conclusion of that paper, you will see that that's exactly what we have done. We have made some critical comments about what has been done before, a comment about what we should do right now, looking at what has happened in the last 40 years, and then a comment about what should future research be like around classroom dialogue. You must have noticed that I haven't given you a good definition. Sorry, for some reason it went away. Just a second. Yeah. So I'll give you one minute to read it. I'm sorry that this is not my writing. So it is a bit complicated kind of definition, something that I do not normally do. But please take 30 seconds to read it. That is a good definition. That has covered everything. Search, screen, select, appraise, and summarize. And I would probably add reflect. As a reviewer, <clears throat> As a journal reviewer, one of our key point of attack for any papers that we review is methodology. And there is actually nothing called the foolproof or future proof methodology. So you will always have a gap. You will always have a space, a room to fire a question and give the give the writer a minor correction or a or a major correction so Mansoor, uh, i think there is a question uh, if you would sure. like to take it sure in the chat box yeah is it like meta analysis uh, um, a kind of systematic review but mostly around quantitative methods used for data collection and analysis yes the answer is yes thank you so moving on to the next slide. Don't reinvent the wheel. In other words, there are so many PhD projects. I mean, now that um, many universities have opened their thesis, thesis bunker or thesis you know, vault. So you can actually find a lot of PhD thesis by the by one click on your internet. Uh, Cambridge University, for instance, hasn't joined the bandwagon. So they have, they have, you know, still stuck to the traditional philosophy of keeping their thesis intact in the vault. So uh, my thesis is still not available, but I'm I'm sure that in a few years' time it will be, because the, the pressure is immense. But coming to my point, now that we can actually see that there is a lot of PhD thesis, there is a lot of research, is actually revolving around issues that have been already uh, worked on or in many ways done and dusted. But still, there is a new, new work. There will be always a possibility to make it new in some way. But now that we have, we can have a look at particularly what happened in the last 20 years, you can actually find quite similar research questions asked in two, three, four, five thesis. Now, it's a valid question to ask for you who are thinking about doing a new project or doing your undergrad dissertation or master's or PhD, it is important for you to ask that you should not reinvent the wheel. Even for a systematic reviewer, the first big question that he or she needs to ask is that whether there is already a systematic review available. 
you can still say that, well, that systematic review is not valid. And we will check a case study about the ugliness of systematic review um, uh, later on. Like systematic reviews, the way I'm presenting it, you can, you can probably have an idea that, well, systematic review is the top of the heap. Not necessarily. You can also criticize the systematic review. You can also criticize most of the literature review written for dissertation or for thesis. You know, for some student who has written the literature review, by the time the thesis is ready to submit, he or she may need to have a complete overhaul, which some of them do, some of them don't. But research means research. So newness, something new has to be found. Therefore, these are the questions, these are the things that you need to ensure before you start. Whether there is any similar systematic review already done by somebody, you know, maybe in a remotest part of the globe. And that is a question that we need to ask now. Um, now that we work in a global platform, we have, in our paper, talked about it in a very defensive way that our um, our articles, our papers included in, in, in that classroom dialogue systematic review are all Anglophone articles because, because we've reached a point where we thought that let's not hide it because we won't be able to find by using Google or by using any other you know, similar search engines, we wouldn't be able to find an article from South America written in Spanish. We now have partners in the Classroom Dialogue Project who are from South America, from Chile and, and Brazil, and we know that there are good empirical work published, but in Spanish or in Portuguese. But that is a limitation that we should, we should talk about, you know, uh, not to hide. And same can be true if you have a, already a question for a systematic review from the context of Bangladesh. There may be a good paper written in, in, in Bangla, who knows? And we have this historical tradition of writing good newspaper articles. So there are many, many of us, we're so subjective that we feel much more comfortable in terms of churning out you know, something for many more readers to read on a newspaper. However, in terms of research rigor, newspaper articles are at the very bottom, the bottom of the barrel, really. But there is a tradition. If you have nothing, for instance, I didn't have much when I was doing my uh, doctoral work. So I had to actually bank on quite a few newspaper articles because I didn't have much. Importance of writing a protocol or a plan that what are the things that you are going to look at, whether you actually need to get a permission. I remember that, uh, that I tried for it, a permission to actually read the, the Dhaka University studies, you know, in a bid to find more relevant papers during my field work back in 2012. And I was also given the permission, but I found that it is because things are not so systematic, it's extremely difficult to actually you know, go through uh, issue one by one and then check the content page. So, so I couldn't do it. And I, I said- There is another question, Manzur, yeah. at the, uh, the, you know, from um, uh, Nus Nusrat Ara. Great. I have yeah. seen several papers on science conducting systematic review and meta-analysis altogether. Is it yeah. possible to conduct meta-analysis in social science studies? It is, it is. To be more specific, the meta-analysis will be specifically based on your uh, papers. In other words, the papers that you're going to select for the final big screening, scanning analysis, it, it has to be empirical work. And it has to talk about the methodology that they have conducted in a very detailed way. Unless you have that particular section written in a very clear cut, detailed way, including the variables, the statistical variables used, and how they have run uh, the, the analysis procedure, 
there has to be very clear detail about it. Unless you have it, you will be able to calculate the effect size. So that's how, even in our paper's case, you, you could actually see that how we have, we have started with so many, more than 10,000 papers, how we've gone down to only 100. So because of that, there were so many very promising papers, but the criteria that we have set, the protocol that we have set, you know, the promising papers just could not pass the methodological protocol. So um, I imagine that uh, if you would like to do a meta-analysis in the education sector or in the English education sector, uh, you probably won't find much. But even if you, you find five, that's good to start with. You said that you have already checked that science and health studies have absolutely right. I mean, particularly health studies. I mean, they have a much more specific uh, data collection procedure installed, often helped by uh, powerful government agencies, so they can use those databases much more readily. Uh, now that we are thinking about this coronavirus, and you could actually see that how how quickly there are quantitative studies published because of the existence of those databases, particularly in the Western world. But it will be slightly more difficult in the case of us in the subcontinent because we do not collect uh, official data in, you know, in a systematic way, in that way, meaning that our meta-analysis will be limited by some, you know, could be could be struck, could be, could have a, you know, a death blow at the very beginning because we wouldn't be able to find papers qualifying from the criteria that we should set. Check the criteria that we have set. So I'm coming to that in a, in a second. Um, importance of a critical colleague panel or, or, or supervisor. Well, in order to, in order to kind of emphasize the point, I'll ask you a question. I have said that my or our paper was in classroom dialogue. What are the keywords that we should use or we should have used to search, uh, you know, thousands of papers for 40 years? Of course, dialogue, but now you, now you begin to understand that there are tons of papers that are dialogue related, but haven't used the word dialogue for once. So we need to have a whole bank of reliable keywords. So you can add interaction, you can add talk, you can add the, uh, the IRF, you can add communication. So there are so many connotations. You can add discussion, you can, you know, there are so many of uh, uh, variables or connotations or associated words that you actually need to take into account before you do the searching on Google. I wouldn't recommend Google, but but obviously there are benefits and advantages of Google as well. Would like to talk about that in my next slide. But the importance of a critical colleague is that that you or your main authors or your uh, team's thinking may be slightly different from, from another colleague. So you can ask or approach that colleague to check or double check the list of keywords that you have decided on. Your colleague may be able to come up with a new word. So that's why it is important to have a critical colleague panel. TISOL BD is one of them. Search strategy. I've already talked about the specific, the need of specific keywords, the databases, the, the so-called gray literature, the importance of gray literature in, in, in places like the South Asia, in places like Africa, in places like Latin America. We can say that the gray literature isn't good. We wouldn't consider gray literature, but what about the context? I've been to Morocco for a field work for a project last year. 
And, you know, to write the literature review, I struggled to find one. Then I talked to some of the Moroccan people who said that we all have so many things to write, but there is political pressure not to write and criticize anything. So not that people can people are in a position to write anything and everything they want. I remember that in one of the conference presentations, I think this is a European uh, research conference, where I said uh, that it is very difficult to, to actually find a paper in English language education from Bangladesh, which has talked about the political perspectives. You know, it has talked about uh, the the pedagogic perspectives, the projects, but it it hasn't talked much about the the political pressures and everything. Even it hasn't talked much about the ministries. I would I would say. So, anyway, Bangladesh is not the only context which is like that. I think I think there are many contexts. I mean, even in England. Even in the U.S., you are not as free as you think that you will be. So it is a part of life, but it has to be talked about uh, one way or the other. Anyway, I'd like to give you a breather to, to, to think about what should be... Remember that I've asked you to think about a broad question. What should be the keywords? for that or if you'd like to if you want to have a ready-made question think about the classroom dialogue I've already said some of the keywords that we have used but what about anything else can you think of anything else other than the words that I have mentioned uh, that can also be a valid keyword to locate research on classroom dialogue and this is a good time to go back to uh, I hope you might be able to hear beautiful noise in my background. That's my son. Okay. So I'm just going back uh, Mansur, to... Mansur, just to interrupt you for a second, we have about eight minutes left for this session. Okay. And then That's we right. will have the question answers. Yeah, sure. So I'd just like to go to the place where we have talked about how we have selected the keywords. You can see here this highlighted part. And there will be one particular line where we have talked about how colleagues have helped us to refine our bank of keywords. But I don't have much time left now. So, um, you can check this particular paper. Uh, you can take my email address and then ask for the full paper if you can download it. Or it is it should be available in the TSOL BD's Facebook page. But let's go very quickly to the next few steps. So we have identified, let's say, 10 keywords, and we have started searching or using these keywords to search and locate papers. Uh, going back to the going back to the paper once more, you can see that we have written here that these are the search engines that we have used: Google Scholar, EBSCO, Eric, my favorite, and then others. But you already understand that you will only get some specific um, articles or journals using these databases. So if you want to locate your study in Bangladesh, you'll have to use some, some other uh, ways of locating the right literature. One of them would be, one of them could be just simply handpicking uh, the, the, you know, the right papers. You can go back, you can go back of the reference list and then handpick and go to the library, uh, meet the author in person, maybe, 
and get the article. So that's stage one. These are the criteria that we used. Peer reviewed, employed in an educational context, behavioral, uh, and then th the last one, the article was published in the period specified in the search. Going back to the article once again. Here are the six, seven um, criteria that we have used. You can see here studies that met all seven become the review sample. First, peer reviewed. Second, obtainable in full text. Um, third, report of empirical research. Fourth, conducted in a primary, elementary, secondary, high school classrooms. Fifth, had to make dialogue as defined in its primary focus then publication had to be in English. So these are the uh, six. And then the last one uh, is, is here. Seventh, if more than one publication address the same study and the reported results are identical, only one is included. So that, is a, that could be a key, a key criteria in your context because we do not have many prolific writers. So, so we have got the, the, the articles. Here you can see that how we have moved from a huge number using the selection criteria, the number is coming down. So those are the criteria that we will use for screening. This is the pyramid that I have talked about. You can see that expert opinion, background information, bottom of the barrel, bottom of the pyramid. Systematic review, because it has given some space for subjective reflection to consider. Second, in the hierarchy. Here is the case study, which might be important for you to, interesting for you to have a quick check. I don't have maybe two, three minutes left, but let's go to this case study. Uh, quickly. This is how they have, these people, this is how they have criticized a particular systematic study. Check the name, poor systematic reviews and meta-analysis may be misleading. How they've done it, one is the authors indicate a large number of studies may have been controlled. A subsidiary analysis of the studies would have yielded a more convincing result. So about sampling. Then second, the method used to pool the studies appears to have been taken no account of the size of the studies. Thus, the study group with three and 2,800 subjects contribute equally to the analysis. That's a, that's a big criteria that you can also use to criticize any systematic study. That, you know, a study with 10 people, a study done only in Dhaka and its surrounding areas, can't be universally or globally used to, 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 to create conclusions about the whole of Bangladesh. Anyway, so let's move to the data extraction part. So you'll have to write down the findings in terms of some of the common themes. The themes will be generated from the research questions. And you need to write each and every of those 100 or 50 or 20 finally selected papers, similar data like that. So I must go back to the paper at this point, maybe for a few seconds. You can see this is how we have done it. Table one, geographic location of sample research. Then here is the data collection, participant characteristics. Table three, I'd like to talk about table three a little bit. You can, you can see here on, your, on the left, curriculum context. There is this, you know, talked about the, the class, mathematics, you have the L1, L2. There's some, some papers that haven't talked about which class they are from, which class the data is taken from. So it is unclear. We have the procedures, haven't talked about the methodology in a great way, in clear way. Therefore, we, we have to have one unclear part. However, the data is analyzed in, in a good way. Therefore, it is included, but these are the kind of weaknesses that you will be able to tap. These are the themes, dialogue focus, teacher-student, student-student, both. 
analytic approach, you can see we have the qualitative analysis included. That's why this is a systematic review. But we also have this unclear category. Then if you go, you can see that we now have themes in research. And finally, all of these themes, specific procedures of variability. So you can check all of these tables and you can actually use these tables, you know, rephrasing it or slightly changing it to suit your context. So you have two types of evaluative, you know, criteria that we have used model based and target based. That is one of the key weakness of maybe you can say is the same weakness for CLT as well. Uh, the classroom dialogue research, one of the key weaknesses, it is very difficult to, uh, to correlate the exam success that we have. Let's say we have a, an extremely dialogic classroom, but how that have contributed to the exam success of the student, it is very difficult to, to, to model and it is very difficult to get exact data correlating how much of the exam success is connected to the classroom dialogue that the student uh, was engaged. So that is a problem that we have talked about in the conclusions, but you can, I guess I don't have much time, but you can see the conclusion that we have talked about some of the key gaps. Remember the three main areas that we will be talking about in the conclusion, past, present, and future. So I'm going back to uh, my slides, as you can see that I don't have much left. This is actually a website where you can be a member of some of the raw data we have put in this particular website. So if you're interested, uh, you, can, you can write to me um, or you can also uh, find me in the TSOL BD page saying that you're interested to get you know, to know more about it and be a part of this particular website. I mean, this, this website has a subscriber option. Everything that I'm talking about, you'll find all of those things, you know, um, detailed and incorporated in this website in some way or the other. So that's the discussion, writing and publishing. We've published it in Cambridge Journal of Education. You can say, you can ask why. That's because Cambridge Journal of Education has actually provided us the funding. They approached the professor that they have this funding for this. They have this quite a large number of, you know, pub, um, publication on dialogue. So they have this funding to undertake a systematic review. They talk, talked about this to the professor who then advertised for a research assistant and then yours truly came to the project. So coming back to the key, here is the final product. And if you're interested in the overview, here is the overview. But in the meantime, remember that I did, did talk about something slightly more interesting than listening to one boring voice for one hour, a test. I mean, quite a few, you know, Quite a few have thought about meta-analysis and systematic review and what are the differences, good thinking. Um, two way I can take this very quick uh, MCQ test. One is, it's on Kahoot, so some of you are familiar with it. So you can either use your computer screen, you can open a new browser and go to kahoot.eat and I'm going to give you a pin number and then we can start, start it. I think that would be interesting. I mean, we can, we can also do that while we take the questions. So um, dear moderator, I mean, you can uh, invite you anybody to now? come up with comments. Yes, so, okay. So, um, Thank you very much for uh, this session, uh, Mansoor. I think our teachers uh, benefited it. Um, the participants benefited it, uh, benefited from it immensely. Um, yeah. So, if you guys have any questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask, or if you want, you or can the same, also. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Write your question at the chat box and uh, take this. At, um, at the same quiz time, the I same can time. ask you all a question, mm -hmm. which is okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just to just to make the microphone busy, really. Um, all a question that have you thought about systematic reviewing and doing it seriously as part of your literature review or as part of a new project? That's the, you know, that's the question, my question to you. I was actually uh, thinking about it and I okay. was hoping there will be some uh, activities maybe so I can learn how to do systematic review. Yeah. yeah I think that the, you know, the best way to learn would be to actually read some, you know, some papers that are written on systematic review. So, um, no, uh, in the meantime, I mean, if you're able to open a new browser, I don't know whether you're using the computer or not. It is obviously better if you use the computer, but if you're able to go to this particular website, www.kahoot.eat, and then you can. Would you like to copy the link here? Probably that would be easier. Probably for um, people to yeah. just click on at the chat box. You can copy yeah, the link at yeah. the chat box. Yeah, I can. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think there were a few share. comments. Yeah. I have to stop in, the, in that case. Um, maybe you can just write it. The, uh, okay. The, um, yeah. And those of you who haven't used it in your classroom, now that you're all doing you know, online, this is a, you know, a good way. Yeah, to... I did. It's, it, it's a good thing actually for a quiz. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and very interesting. You all know that the great Christmas tradition is to have a quiz. So this is the last week in my university. Yeah, on Kahoot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we all had this, you know, some kind of a quiz in the class to wrap things up before Christmas. So I've got just one person um, as a player. So would be good if maybe two, three, five of you can log in at least to begin with. It will take three, four minutes to finish. I mean, like I said, it's a fun <coughs> quiz. It's not, it's not really to test you. Excellent. So I'll just wait for another 20 seconds. In the meantime, keep uh, keep thinking about questions. I know that you said you might be thinking that that hey, you lucky man, you you have got some funding for systematic yes. review. That's why we've done it. Yeah, true, true. I mean, uh, that's so there is a question from yeah. uh, Sharmin Sultana uh, in the chat box. Uh, Great, Sharmin, would you like to uh, ask the question yourself? You can unmute yourself and sure. Uh... Sir, I was wondering if uh, all the literature that I'll be selecting uh, for my uh, systematic review need to have all the keywords that I'll be using for the systematic uh, review keyword that you talked about. For uh, example, not all, just okay. one. Like for instance, from my example, uh, you know, classroom dialogue is the is the term that we have used. But if a particular paper has talked about classroom talk, we've decided that we will also accept the keyword talk. So if a particular paper has just used talk, that is accepted for reviewing. Thank you, sir. Yes. So it's not all the keywords, any one of them. And the problem complicates if you have two, you know, two keywords, like for instance, you can see that we have classroom dialogue. So you can have then almost a healthy number of you know permutations uh, and and combination of different words like classroom talk classroom dialogue classroom interaction classroom irf so, classroom communication so you know uh, so it is complicated and i mean that that keyword part is quite important and uh, and um, you know it can just simply make or break the validity of your study so if you have missed out a, an important keyword and if you work on your own like i understand that most of you are thinking about literature review how you can make your literature review stand out from the rest 
it is doubly difficult because you can't think of all the keywords in one head that's why more heads are necessary that's why you can have a tutor you can have a supervisor but you would probably need more heads so colleagues critical friends and all of us who have done phd's in the west we know that there is a you know there is a critical friend circle in every big uh, you know um education in every big department i mean there is this critical critical friend circle so who would criticize every other's work and help them improve so we've got quite a few now so let's start um i hope you can also hear the music should pump you up a little bit which we need at this very late hour you know this is the last session there is some benefit of the last session that people don't concentrate much so you know you can take advantage of that but at the same time you know the disadvantage is like people you know they often feel too lazy to ask questions and 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 stuff like that so a mixed picture about being the last man in the list let's start Yeah, I mean, those of you who have played it, you know that Kahoot is very clever. So it has 1,000 points for every question, but whoever puts the question first will get most. So it is important to be quick. But if, in the name of quickness, if you give the wrong answer, you'll get a zero. Okay. good competition at the top okay yeah i'll take the blame the question is phrased in a slightly complicated way so yeah so i'll use the you know the age old excuse for that i was in a hurry oh excellent so we might have a photo finish in the end but if you're lying behind don't worry there there could be bonus points available so you can come back at the very last moment let's see farzana is becoming champion recently is this our smart moderator yeah yeah smartest no who knows <laughs> who knows it's me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean in our generation <laughs> this particular first name is obviously you know is very difficult to look you know no. common yeah <laughs> see how you defeated me i didn't even take part in this question i couldn't answer this question while talking to you guys yeah i mean you know there will be distractions that's the you know <laughs> part of the game like i remember so bad i didn't even um Oh my Reply. god. Okay. So the race is getting really <laughs> really interesting. So okay. Yeah, I mean I was saying that when I was uh sitting for my secondary school exam, you know, ages ago. I remember during my mathematics exam, there was uh you know, um some kind of music going on outside the school compound on mic. and it was distracting me so much that for once in the final exam i got numbers in the 80s not in the 90s in mathematics 
Okay, so yeah, I mean, we know from our from our experience of MCQs that always the you know the option with all of them would would, would have this strong magnetic field, you know, for us to take that. Yeah, it is true. I mean, it has multiple right answers. So those of you who have only put one answer, you will get you know one quarter points. That's good, that's good. So th now the last dash to the finish line. Oh, is the question running one by one? I was thinking all of them together maybe. I mean, the result will show together. And... No, no, there are different questions. Hmm. Yeah, this is my feedback question. This so... is the last one, right? Yeah, this is the last one, and this <laughs> yeah. is my feedback question. Yes, yeah. And depending on the answer, I would know how things are going. Okay, that's not too bad. Excellent. Congratulations to you. And the winner is yes. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Sifat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, Congratulations to Sifat. Yeah. Do, do you we all, know Sifat? Thank, Thank you so much. Oh, Sifat. <laughs> okay. Hey, this is a long day. Okay, okay Hafsa. <laughs> Yes, um, so thank you very much, Dr. Mansur Labidin, for this uh, session. Um, and um, I think um, there are, um, someone's microphone is on. Can you please uh, mute yourself? Um, do we have any more questions? Um, um, I think there was one co comment um, by, I, okay. So, yes, by uh, Hamidur Rahman, Mr. Hamidur Rahman. Sure. Um, uh, replication of research may reveal current status of a uh, situation or show contextual variation, but uh, linking up is necessary. So that was the comment. And um, mostly comments, I can see. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and but also the, as if. No, how yeah, the situation ahead, like like Saiva, Maybe you can s say a minute about it. How's the situation about doing good evaluative? papers like you know from Bangladesh I mean there was a time I mean when I was a I was doing PhD things were not going great but I hope that we now have a quite a you know lot of people with PhDs with research yes. knowledge coming back to Bangladesh okay uh, I think the if you're looking at our field, the solar applied linguistics, uh, over the period of the last 10 years, we have got many scholars and experienced uh, reviewers. Uh, for example, I know many of my colleagues are doing systematic review with the international journals. A few years back, it was almost uh, you know unknown. So we have a lot of uh, people who are doing their on the review board of international journals. And then even in our local journals, it has been very systematic, at least uh, even the Dhaka University, uh, the journal mm -hmm. that we get published, it follows a very systematic procedure and the reviewers. So I think the situation has improved a lot. That's good to know. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. There was one more question uh, from uh, Anam Ahmed. Sorry, any good book for systematic review? Uh, if, you, if you have any recommendations. Um, I think there must be. I think I can't can't uh, say anything on the top of my head, but uh, but I've just put my email address. So um, if you could write to me later, I can send you some names of. Manjurul Bhaiya, you send to me privately your email address. Can you please put again for everyone? Okay. Yes. So I think I've made it wrong. Yeah, just, you know, choose everyone, choose everyone in the chat box when you okay. send, send it. Yes. Um, yeah, there was another person uh, asking for um, the name of a book. And um, 
there may be any article so yeah yeah so there is i think i think uh, you can just start with some direct google search to begin with mm-hmm. because you get yes. a lot of information like from that and as a good example i'm not just bragging about myself here as a good example you can actually check the the paper that i have talked about like in today's session i mean there is a very good sample i mean it is now used as a as a uh, recommended reading for um, undergraduate education at cambridge and it is it has attracted over 700 citations already so it's been so quite, would you like to yeah. uh, write that down here to amansur at the chat box um, the the name of the article yes yeah um, it is also there in the in the tesol bd uh, facebook page okay so um, is it accessible like you know, is it open access yes yes okay that's great so i'll just uh, copy paste the the title link yeah, yeah. Okay do we have any more questions um, or any more comments um Yeah so here is the name of the uh, article uh, the title of the article classroom dialogue a systematic review across four decades of uh, research yeah. um so you can uh, search for it and um, uh, Dr Mansur Labidin has shared his email address as well if you would like to reach out to him and um, you know ask for suggestions on books or articles Um, or if you would like to interact with him, I'm sure he will be just, I'd welcoming like to, you all. Just, I'd like to quickly apologize to everybody for making a big rush in the end, because this workshop is actually for a two-hour workshop. So you understand that I was going really slow, and so because of that. Right. Uh, but it's okay. I think I managed to kind of talk about the main steps. I think. Okay if we don't have any more questions i think uh, we'll wrap up the session uh, Okay thank you very much again yes over to Nusrat Thanks to Dr Manzurul Abedin for sharing every nook and corner of systematic review study and special thanks to the moderator of this session Soyada Farzana Sultana Now it's time for handing over the certificate. I would like to request Sam Adikul Rahman to show the certificate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam Adikul Rahman. Uh, we are close to the end of the first day of uh, International Virtual Research Conference 2020 organized by Tiso Society of Bangladesh. So uh, now it's time to wrap up. Uh, I hope each and every segment has been very thoughtful uh, very helpful for us because all of these were very thoughtfully arranged to address the issues we are facing at this moment of time thank you everyone for participating in the research conference and staying with us all day long you energized and inspired us with your enthusiasm wish to see you all in tomorrow's session and un- until then stay safe and sound allah hafiz